It's the 14th Sunday of the year, and as tradition dictates, it's time for Flanders' finest. The most special of days, with the focus of the sporting world as a whole, falling upon a small area of old farm roads where riders will come ready to battle against the parkour, each other and the elements. The winner will need their top four, their best condition, and perhaps a little luck along the way. At the end of it all, there's a chance to remain tied to this beautiful land, the passionate places that we'll see, and the winners earning a space for their name etched in the long history of a race that celebrates an entire people. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 108th running of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. It's the Tour of Flanders. We're back in Antwerp this year. After we're in Bruges a year ago, the beautiful old and modern port house building, one of the biggest ports in the world, welcomes us on a nice sunny morning for now to Flanders. The wind is forecast to get up a little later on. There's a possibility of rain and wet cobbles this afternoon, but it's a glorious start in Flanders' biggest city, Antwerp this morning, looking a picture on your televisions. Well, wherever you're watching around the world, whatever time you're tuning in, thanks for joining us. This is one worth following from start to finish, and we will be following every single pedal stroke of it. The flags of Belgium and Flanders fly from that building, and it's in Flanders that we see who will succeed Tadej Pogacar. It's for the first time since 2015 that we will not have the defending champion at the start line today. Pogacar is off preparing for the Giro, but Van der Poel, the winner of two of the last four events here, is here. I'm afraid for these Belgian fans, there is no Wout van Aert, however. That was a great atmosphere at the start, a superb atmosphere. Stefan Kung, Marc Madio turning up even for the proceedings today. Matteo Trentin we saw before, this is Michael Matthews. He carries Australian hopes and, of course, the former world champion Mars Pearson signing in despite carrying a nasty injury. There's the Spanish champion, Oyer Lascano, hoping to become the first man from his nation to win the race. There's a former winner in Alberto Betiol. In fact, there are four former winners among the 174 riders at the start today. Mate Mohoric is looking to join the club. Mateusz Govikar and Mate Mohoric. Look at that for a sign-in podium in the Grote Mart in the Grand Place, the big square in Antwerp, Antwerp, as it is in the local language. We're not playing baseball, but we had an American winner for the first time on Wednesday. Visma Lisa Bike signing in with Matteo Jorgensen, and the world champion is here. Today it could be a very special day for Mathieu Van der Poel. So here we go. After that year back in Bruges, the peloton once again returns to the Flanders' biggest city for the start of the trip to the heart of the Flemish Ardennes. 17 climbs, seven further cobbled sectors along the route of the Ronde van Vlaanderen are wearing down the legs this year. Three local loops, as accustomed now, make up the hardest part of the parkour. We'll have the Tienberg, Koppenberg, Kreuzberg as well, with the Alde Quarmont being the focal point of the route. That's climbed on three occasions. The final launch pad will be the steep Paterberg, and that comes 13 kilometers from the finish in Aldenarde. The 108th Ronde van Vlaanderen is 270 kilometers long as we celebrate the high mass of the Flemish Holy Week with the host nation hoping to end its longest ever drought of winners. Will Belgian cycling be risen again on Easter Sunday? There's a Dutchman in rainbow bands in the way. If Mathieu van der Poel is to win today, he'll become the joint most winning rider ever here. Barre de Wever, Jan Jan Bon are among the dignitaries counting down. And with me in the commentary box as we wait to go to the neutral start, just in time. It's his very own countdown. The gun goes and introduces Matt Stevens. Goedemorgen, Matt. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. It's so... I'm just so excited. I mean, um, 
It's been building, isn't it? I mean, the hype for this race is always big, but year on year, it just seems to get greater and greater, isn't it? And we were discussing before we came on air the fact that this is the biggest single-day bike race in the world, outside of the World Championships, of course. Um, Matthew van der Poel in black shorts, um, given the weather, I think. But no, this is its going to be a magnificent race, an interesting one, which we'll get into that a little bit later. The sun is shining on in the start here in Antwerp as we see the Cathedral of Our Lady. But, Rob, I am, yeah, I'm absolutely pumped, looking forward to this one. Arguably, I think, one of the most open races for years. We touched on that already with the absence of Wout van Aert. We do wish him all the best in a speedy recovery. I think it's going to be a long road back for Wout. But the race carries on nonetheless. That is the nature of cycling. But now I'm expecting a spectacular race. Multiple protagonists but all eyes will be on Mathieu van der Poel in those rainbow bands. Can he make history today? Already, everybody's deserted Antwerp and it's town hall. They're all heading up here. <laughs> well, Matt and I sit at the finish line in Aldenada, right in the heart of the Flemish Arden, talking to you. You've got two Flemings on the right of the picture there. Dries de Bont and Jordi Meurs. On the left-hand side, a man who was born in Flanders, who lives in Flanders, but of course, who is of Dutch nationality. He's the world champion, Mathieu van der Poel. There are a few riders making their monument debuts today, a few riders making their Ronde van Vlaanderen debuts. 50 riders riding this for the first time, including Albert Torres, who we saw in the second line there for Movistar. Big percentage, that, isn't it, of 175 riders? There's a lot of, yeah, a lot of new blood in this race. Ten riders, Matt, out of the 175, making their monument debuts as well today. This is one of the five monument classics. We had the first of the season over at Milano San Remo. There was victory for Alpes in de Koenig, but Jasper Philipser, who won the race, is not racing today. I think he's being saved for Paris-Roubaix next weekend. For his team, it's all about Mathieu Fodderpool. And there's a smile on the face here of Mars Pearson, despite the fact he is carrying quite a few injuries. All the focus on Van der Poel naturally because he's the world champion, but more focus than there would have been because on Wednesday, for anybody who wasn't watching, Mars Pearson was involved in a mass crash at Duarsdorf Lander, the final dress rehearsal for this biggest of cobbled classics. It took out Wart van Aert, as you mentioned, from the Peloton for at least the next month or two. He has broken ribs, broken sternum, broken collarbone. It took out Jasper Sterver, a former Monument winner and one of the favourites for this race for Lidl Trek. Alex Kirsch, also out the game with a broken hand. There are broken ribs for other riders, such as Gatsuli as well. Here, we have 175 riders. Not all of them are fully fit, but it's sort of looking like Mathieu von der Poel versus the world here, which means, Matt Stevens, we're going to have to have Maybe a slightly different race because there's going to be a lot of pressure on Van der Poel, but maybe a lot of opportunity for everybody else with nothing to lose to put pressure on early. Yeah, and one of those riders could be um, Michael Matthews at the back. You know, so narrow or narrowly missed out to the aforementioned Jasper Phillips in, in the Milan San Remo just a few weeks ago now. Second place, uh, sharing the podium with two of his best friends. Of course, uh, defending champion Tadej Pogacar not here. Um, for this race, but no, you're quite right. I think it does open things up and I also think strangely When you look at it's very difficult to see any benefits from a big wipeout like that at all There, there aren't many at all, but uh, Mads Pedersen maybe some pre There's a little bit of pressure has been taken off him the fact that he is carrying that injury um, We don't know the full extent we clearly we can't read his mind We don't know what's going on inside his body what one thing we do know is that he is a real fighter But maybe the fact that he's had that crash takes a bit of the pressure off him as well. We'll see how he copes um, And perhaps for Matthew van der Poel it looks very relaxed, but um, you know he copes with pressure immensely well Doesn't he the bigger the occasion the more this uh, this man can rise to it. He really does um, He's a uh, he's a proud world champion only his fourth race, that's the amazing thing for me. Here we are at Easter, it's only his fourth race, but clearly he's in great, great form. And this is the race he wanted to hit great form on. We, he actually admitted he wasn't going to be 100% for Milan San Remo, but for this, he wants to be on good form. But yes, to finally get to the point that you're asking, Rob, I think we could see an open race. I think we see a very attacking race, but 
he is the, he is the five star favorite and i actually don't think there are any four star favorites now with i think everybody else is like a three star favorite below um but i think that his team and himself are going to come under a lot of attack but maybe he'll want that you know rather than look to him to create the racing maybe if the other teams do start throwing a lot there'll be this enormous amount of momentum that he can just uh, embed himself within but i think for the first time in, in a few editions of this race, we have a very, very open Flanders. Um, let's see what happens. It's full steam ahead for the peloton of the Ronde van Flanders as they go past the Red Star Line Museum through glorious Antwerp on this beautiful sunny morning. The crowds are up, the Flemish flag flies, and we've got former winners here, pretenders, protagonists, and I think We've got this three-kilometer neutral zone right now. You could just see from the front row, though, an idea of what might develop. Right, just like Dries de Bont, they might be wanting to attack things. Oh, definitely. You've got Marvi Star, who are increasingly good in these races, but not yet the big favorites. They could maybe be either controlling or sending someone like Torres up the road. Lotto Destiny, who don't really have any favorites now. They've got their main men ill and injured, and Three or four jerseys from Alpacine de Koenig, whose job I would imagine, Matt, is to control early doors. Yeah, definitely. And what we have to look, look at Soren Cora Anderson, just tucked in behind, slightly obscured now by our Spanish national champion, Oya Lescano. Um, and do you remember what happened last year? You know, um, we saw that, that split earlier on, and Mathieu van der Poel, uh, with Saron Cora Anderson and several of his teammates, were actually caught behind. And, they, and we couldn't believe what we were seeing, could we? That the crosswinds, we had those crosswinds early on, that early split, his team were, were chasing later on. And, and maybe that actually took a little bit off the edge of Mathieu van der Poel towards the back end of the race. But um, they're right at the front now. They know that there's potential for attacks. So I don't think we'll see Mathieu van der Poel missing any splits today, any significant ones today. That was a, a steep learning curve. And it nearly, yeah, the wheel nearly came off at the beginning of the race last year, didn't it? But no, they're going to have to do a lot of work. And I think they're ready for that and the likes of Sylvain Dillier who we saw doing a lot of riding in Milan San Remo he's super super reliable he's got a great team around him but I don't think it I think it's fair to say there's no real options in terms of winning the race aside from van der Poel himself and that's not taking anything away from his teammates they know that um, so he's going to have to win it in an interesting way and, and there's a few people out there saying that actually van der Poel might revel in this, this slightly new situation and actually the best form of defense he might actually go on the attack even earlier who knows i mean we, we shall see it's certainly a mouth-watering proposition six k's to go until we get to kilometer zero you can tell i'm not awake yet i just <laughs> said three kilometers didn't i I was looking down at the wrong section of the road but what a great start of the day that is that's all right we're allowed a couple of full starts in the neutral <laughs> zone mate i mean uh, i'm sure if we'd have fell behind the uh, race commissaires would have waited for us to get back on um which is the rules of course yeah 9.8 kilometers in total so we've had three of them now that's the figure i was looking at it gives us a great chance to look around the city of antwerp which is absolutely beautiful by the way we saw one of the most gloriously decorated train stations in the world, actually, from the air there. It's got the old Antwerp Zoo next to it. This man will have visited a few times, and actually over the winter, Lascano, who comes from the capital of Basque Country, by the way, Vitoria Gasteis. This is just a day before the tour of the Basque Country begins. He said he'd like to come here and spend more time knowing, getting to know the route. He thinks that it's so, so important. And of course, he's spent a few weeks riding around here now. And he is there for Movi Star, a team that used to have cobble phobia, really. But they're now very much playing their part. And with Lascano and Cortina, they've got two outsiders, but riders who certainly have to be taken into consideration. The likes of Carlos Canals, very, very strong young rider. Jacobs, we've seen him breakaways, haven't we? And Remy Cavagno wants to ride the cobble classics for the first time. Of course, he comes with a bit of quick-step DNA. Let's see if he can apply that to the Movistar team. Yeah, it's an interesting an interesting signing, in fact, wasn't it, for Movistar? Um, but you think, if you look at the uh, attributes of, of the Frenchman, um, you think he would be suited to the pave and to this, to this sort of race. We know he can get over the climbs pretty effectively. We know his, his power on the flat, and um, we shall see. Haven't seen him, haven't really seen him in terms of great form so mm. far this year, but ordinarily one would think that he'd be suited to this sort of race, especially as a foil for Lascano anyway. I think there might have been a doubt about him riding bunches and things like that. You know, he's, he, the things he's won, haven't they, have come from breakaways. Also, pretty much fast. all solo, yeah, yeah. But we will see.
There's a new jersey, by the way, being worn by EF Education Easy Post, and this is Julien Alaphilippe in conversation with his compatriot, the current French champion, Valentin Madouas, who, by the way, as we see, obviously we're reaching the outskirts of Antwerp now. Certain things have to be done in the morning, don't they? But, uh, yes, the French national champion, Madouas, has been on the podium at this race before, a couple of years ago now. Alaphilippe hasn't, but again, he has the profile of a top rider at this race. And, well, a lot of top riders at this race, potential top riders across the front row here, led by none other than Mathieu Fonderpool. And, well, Fonderpool, lots to talk about, and there are always lots to talk about with him whenever he races. But, of course, he today could equal the record for the most victories in this race. It's just his sixth appearance in the race, by the way. He's got two wins from five appearances. He has never, ever finished worse off than fourth in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And I, I remember calling that race with you, Rob, and when he was riding in the Dutch National Champions jersey with those amazing white shorts on. And do you remember he crashed? Mm. He had a crash with about 25 k's to go, and we thought he was out of the picture. And then the, the, the amount of ground that he made up off camera, yeah. and then suddenly we, he was there, just showed, so, OK, well, we knew, obviously, he was a hitter on the ascendancy, but this is a race that suits his attributes down to the ground. You've got the distance, you know, he's got that ridiculous endurance and he's got a punch like no other. He's got such sharpness uh, and, he, and, and these climbs are almost designed for van der Poel. So really, it's no surprise that these, this is the terrain he revels in. It's the terrain he loves. And if you look at the imagery from when he first won this race, the look of joy, the, the, the catharsis on, on his face when he'd firmly written himself into history. But yeah, he could do it today. He's certainly got the form. Um, has he got the temperament today? Mm. Well, Achiel Beuys, Fiorenzo Magni, Eric Lehmann, Johan Museo, Tom Bona, Fabian Cancellara. It's not a bad list of names, and Fonopo would not look out of place on it. Uh, there are other sequences and records to be matched, joined, broken. We'll talk about those as they may well become possibilities later. What is a possibility not yet turning into probability at all is that the camera disappears. But it looks like we've got full coverage under the sea here, under the Wasland Tunnel. Full coverage is great. Normally we have to talk about other things, don't we, as we get the aerial shots. Um, but um, that's an interesting sound. It sounds like running water, just the sound of, of the tyres on the tarmac echoing around the tiled walls of this tunnel. Quite an interesting sound. It's almost like a fountain, isn't it? I hope there's no running water in here. I'd be a bit worried if there was. That would be slightly concerning, wouldn't it? It'd be snorkel time, wouldn't it? Scott Sonnenden's checking things out at the uh, sunroof there, race director. Just making sure we haven't got any leaks. And well, I tell you what, this, this should count as the 18th say, Helling, shouldn't it? I think rather than the Quadramont uh, being the first climb, it looks like this one should be, you know, maybe 300 metres at 5%, or maybe slightly steeper, Rob. Well, what gradient are we talking here? I reckon wow. 6 7% there, mate. A few rides might have to knock it onto the small one. It's a third cat, isn't it? It's definitely a third cat climb. No, it's, it's uh, good spirits from the peloton, great to see. No colour blocking at all here, just riders from multiple teams having a bit of a conversation. Dries de Bont there, the former Belgian champion, now with uh, Decathlon AG2 up, was chatting a few moments ago with his former teammate, of course, Mathieu van der Poel. Um, he's had a good form, he was in the breakaway the other week, wasn't he? Uh, Dries de Bont, and um, by the way that he's still holding position just behind the lead car, suggests to me that he's going to want to get in the early move. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think he's uh, written that. That, that, that large, he is a rider that likes to do that, but uh, no, good spirits at the moment in the early stages of the neutral zone. Keep your eye on Grignard there at the front as well, he's a man who likes to break away. 196, De Bont is up there too. A couple of riders from Bingo. Torres could be a man to do an important job for Movistar. It's his debut in the Ronde of Vlaanderen, but he is the oldest of the 50 debutants, by the way. 33, he'll turn 34 next month. His main aims this year lie on the track at the Olympic Games. Well, that is just working themselves in. It will have been an early start this morning. A night of tension, a few nerves, maybe even lots of excitement. And that was just the commentators, Matt. <laughs> Some of us had a disco under the hotel this morning. Yeah, well, we'll, 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 I'll nurse you through, mate. Just sit on my wheel for a bit. <laughs> yeah, as long as you can do some big turns when it counts, you will absolutely, absolutely fine. But in all seriousness, today's a day like no other during the year. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tour of Flanders, and we are almost ready now to reach for the start.
up we come, out the sunlight. And Flanders finest is not far off beginning now. Early snack there for Dries de Bont, making sure he's fully fueled up. Fran Milosevic just to the right hand side for Bahrain, one of the riders making his debut in this race, as you were saying. Gorgeous sunshine here, isn't it? It was a, a miserable morning when we woke up in darkness this mm. morning. It was pouring down with rain just outside our hotel in Ghent. A lovely spring day at the moment. Out they come. Again, looking ahead. Official start just before we leave the confines of uh, Antwerp. There you can see 2.4 kilometres to go. You can also see the riders who are dressed up for the longer day, the likes of Tish Benot and Matteo Jorgensen at the back with the longer jerseys on. They'll be talking tactics, and their tactics have changed ever so slightly. We'll go more into that as we do approach the racing. Of course, we've got those two Ks to kilometre zero, but will everybody be present and correct? I'm already hearing on race radio that Riders here, there and everywhere. There's a Kofidis rider somewhere out the back. And here's another of our former winners. Alexander Kristoff had to miss the racing last weekend with a fever. He was back on Wednesday. Of course, there he is, the winner of the Tour of Flanders in 2016. Hasn't won a monument since then. He's at his new team now and in the twilight of his career, he would say. But he's still capable of performing on the day, the man from Uno X Mobility. Looking at the um, the wind today, about 14 k's an hour at the moment as we head out of uh, Antwerp. It should be a crosswind pretty much all day. So coming from the southeast across the riders all the way into the finish by well, the area of Oudenaarde. Of course, the fascinating thing about the Tour of Flanders, we've got this trip from Antwerp down into the Oudenaarde area into the hills. Um, Mo the vast majority of the 150 k's back end of the race is within a 10 by 20 kilometer square area. That's the fascinating thing about this race. It just weaves in and out. And I'm looking at the map at the moment, and we use this analogy a lot as commentators, but it's like a piece of spaghetti. A piece of ribbon has been dropped on the map. Um, it is yeah, just highly concentrated in one area. Great for spectators, of course, as we look at one of the big favorites here. It's cracking the flags today in Belgium. It is. Glorious spring weather, and Mars Pearson has already dispensed with the leg warmers. That's an early call being made. Not everybody's made it. 187 there just in front of him, Tom van Aasbroek, a local rider from Flanders. He's not even he's decided to get rid of the extra layers. As there is Torres from the island of Menorca in the Mediterranean. He's looking focused, isn't he? Early break for me. You can just see his face, look at that, no motion on it at all. It won't be the early break for this man. But they're going to have to do a fair bit of riding today. They've been there, one of the teams of the season so far. And, and the thing for me about Little Trek is the fact, although they've had a couple of additions, you know, the main nucleus of the squad has remained the same, yet they've stepped up. They really have, obviously, Jonathan Milan has come across and, and made a difference. But when you look at the riders that get in the results, it's the riders that have been there for a while. We talk about the changes uh, that Little Trek have have had and of course they have had those but they've actually I just think they've they've just they've become better um, they're just doing things differently they are dominant they're thinking about the racing and the way they've raced over the last few weeks has been mightily impressive shame that Jasper Stoven isn't here but they've still got a very decent squad flying the ointments perhaps for Alberson de Koenig we shall soon see Rod is heading up to Linkerhoeven just on the outskirts of Antwerp, and we're almost ready to go. Eyes on the prize, approaching kilometre zero. Scott Sullivan's ready. The riders almost at their moment, too. This was a race that was first run in 1913. Paul Diermann won after 330 kilometres and from a field of just 27. It's an event that has evolved and where history and geography have become entwined. 
epic battles playing out between cycling's biggest names. The 108th edition is about to take place here in 2024. And it's the final few moments. Everybody making sure that everybody's present and correct. Von der Poel checking everything as well. Nobody wants to start here on the back foot because they all know that this could be a very big start. Von der Poel's lieutenant starting to move up. We see the arch four kilometers here, a little further ahead. And from all those years since the start, the stories that have been written, this race linked to its land and its people. And in the very first years, and at the very first start, there were two words uttered. The Easter Bonnie's along for this one. <laughs> They weren't the two words that were uttered, by the way. The two words uttered back in the day for the very first Ronde van Vlaanderen will now be repeated here in 2024. Everybody's ready. The flag's up. Riders look present and correct. They fight for space at the front. And with 270 kilometers from Antwerp all the way to the Flemish Ardennes, finally it's time for Heeren Vertrekt. Gentlemen, be on your way. And they are. And we wait, we watch. It's a cagey start, Matt Stevens. Who hasn't taken long. It was about a 10 second cagey start. I thought we we're going to be in for a quiet one, but no. The first attacker is from Astana, closely flanked by Jaco Alula. Dmitry Grudziev has made his move. He is the second oldest of the riders. Look who's following him, though. Luke Durbridge is already there for Jaco Alula. You can see the DSM Firmenich Postenel would like to follow the moves. And Kofidis, yet to win a race in 2024, with one day of March remaining, want to chase this. Yep. Yeah, Kofidis will be hard pushed to, uh, to do that today as we look at the aforementioned uh, Easter bunny. It's like a super bunny. And, uh, and there we go. Uh, we're quite lucky. We've been very well looked after today with our Easter eggs in the in the booth here. You certainly have. With 25 years racing around this part of the world, there, the Red Cross helping out. Oh, Easter Bunny, they looking pretty aero. Maybe he's dispensed with all the eggs already. Exactly. I think that's managed to. Has it? It's nearly come back together. This little split. It's not poor, but as you say, uh, good to see this man. A few years ago, was touted as a real classic specialist, uh, Luke Durbo, Turbo Durbo, former TT champion of Australia, very strong ruler. Well, we saw full steam ahead for the big peloton, and now the little motorboats are off the front, aren't they? Three of them so far, led by Grusjev and Durbridge. We saw Torres, the Spanish rider we were talking about from Movistar, he was on the radio, so it looks as though Movistar for now without having made any moves, are on monitoring duty for now. Does look like it. This is where it starts to get more complicated, though, Matt. We've had that first section of open road, and on the way to the Flemish Ardennes, we pass town after town after town, don't we? Lots a little bit to road furniture. Where the first town is going to be Burt, and look how it changes. Suddenly around the corner, you're out of sight. Then you've got a crossroads around about. There's lots that's going to be very stressful now. Exactly. And in about 10 k's, we, as we said, we go through Birch, and then we head, we're mostly into a head, a head crosswind. But when, once we get through to Temps and head towards St. Nicholas, we'll pick up a cross tailwind. And that's where things could get a little bit tasty. And that's, I think it was uh, last year, where things actually started to split. So far start here. This break certainly hasn't gone yet. Decathlon are trying to get interested here. Yep. This also, is Edvard Bossenhagen. Oh, Hello. Yep. Also, uh, uh, the team that's well, been heavily criticised, and uh, not quite the team that we're used to in the classic. Sudar Quickstep looks like Bert van Lerberger also trying to get across the gap. But uh, good to see Edvard Bossenhagen. New contract with the Cathon AG Tour again. Another uh, rider that never really potentially fulfilled his his potential in the classics. One could argue, but still very strong. He's got across to that move. Edvard Borsenhagen, 
very nearly didn't have a contract. Now, Elia Viviani is back at the Ronde de Vlaanderen for the first time in a while. He's on chasing duty as well. You could just see the Sudar quick step riders you were talking about, Matt. And slowly, in the space of three to four kilometers now, we're starting to see teams awaking from their early slumber. And it looks as though there's plenty of teams keen here. Yeah, definitely. That break just didn't just roll up the road at all. They're moving along pretty quickly, sheltered from that breeze as they pass through the town here. As you can see, pretty lined out. Mads Pedersen looks like he's riding last man at the moment. Wrapped up against the chilly morning. Not super cold here, it's actually relatively mild. I remember this time last year, Rob, there's almost frost on the ground. Do you remember? It was absolutely freezing cold. And there you go, the shape of the peloton showing you how quick they're going. And that has all come back together, but still they're riding hard at the front. No split as yet. I actually saw that in the opening classic of the Milan San Remo. It took about 25, 30 k's for that initial break to go clear. That's a surprise in San Remo, isn't it? Yeah. Durbridge has gone again. Second attempt for Jaco Alula. Team from Australia who have a, a very strong lineup here, actually. Michael Matthews is their leader, but some strong riders who would always be good outsiders and support riders in Flanders. It's seven strong men, really. Max Waldscheid is a new signing for them. Kellen O'Brien, who's not really been as good this spring as he was last year, but remember, top ten finish already in Duarte of Vlaanderen. And now we're getting a reaction, firstly from Kofidis and, of course, from Bingo Walloni Bruxel. Then that's Viviani, who's chasing again. Yeah, pretty active, the former European champion, constantly looking around. I think he's just making sure he's got a rider on his wheel. That's been shut down immediately by Decathlon AG2R. Those are the... Bingo goal rider gets nice and low. Gaps a bit bigger than we thought there. We wondered whether Lidl Trek would control the breakaway today. A lot of speculators, watchers, experts were suggesting they shouldn't do and put the pressure on Alpacine de Koenig. They themselves are in the chase here. We keep an eye on what they do. In the meantime, we look back and now see UAE trying to fire a rider up the road. This is getting very interesting. It looked like that was a bit, I'm not too sure if it was Vegard St. Langard or not. Very strong ruler trying to get across the gap. And it uh, looks like it's either one of the Movistar riders. Very similar kit from the air as the decathlon kit, to be perfectly honest with you. Can't quite tell from here. I think it is Movistar. And this is Burban Lerberger on the front, driving hard. They're a team that needs to be on the front foot in these races. Lorenzo Milesi from Movistar was the rider chasing down. The under-23 world time trial champion as Bet von Leibergen, as you mentioned, for Sudal. Quick step gets here. Now, keep your eyes on this. There's a little bit of a slowing, a little bit of hesitation for the first time. Lotto Destiny decide to go. Yep. Ineos Grenadiers are going to follow. Bora Hansker in this one. And keep your eyes, too, on track to Tim de Klerk. He's monitoring, he's following, as DSM want to be up the road. That looks like it's uh, Connor Swift, the tall figure of Connor Swift. Of course, his cousin riding, Ben Swift, too, here as well. Ben Turner. So, uh, yeah. Bahrain. Yeah, so, very active still. And it's five riders at the front for now. Two, three, four, five, and six in the chase. We get our first sighting of a, a Flanders Balois jersey. They've really struggled this spring to get up the road. Alpacine, now then, they follow this. So, what happens here? They're marking for now. Yeah, Lidl Trek are the team that have missed this one, so they're now chasing just off camera. I think when we uh, pull away, we'll see there you go, Lidl Trek bringing that back together straight over the top. One of the riders from Arkea. Tamino is the rider there for Lotto Destiny. In the end, it's one of his teammates that's gone. As we look at Jules Esters here at the back, the track rider. Rather like Elia Viviani, his objectives this year like the Olympic Games, and he's not happy, he's got a flat back tyre there, but yeah. with the new systems they're using, they ride for a little longer, don't they? On the yeah, I mean, it no. depends. I mean, if, if they're riding tubeless, you can ride them for a lot longer, and that looks like it's slowly softening. So it's fine at the moment, no real panic at all. But we want to get that change as quickly as possible. Better to change it now within the town to get sheltered from the wind, but when you're exposed and, the, and you've got the breeze blowing, it's a little bit harder to chase. A second rider now for Jaco Alula as their plans start to come together. We saw Biniam Germay there on the left-hand side coming into Krebeke. He's one of the riders who crashed quite badly on Wednesday afternoon. It's nice to see him at the start. He's been riding exceptionally well again this spring. Let's see how he goes. A rider on the bike path there attacking. Keep your eye on those moves today. Yeah, to be very careful. 
We were talking about that yesterday, weren't we? Or this morning, shall I say, a few riders being disqualified. Rightly so, in fact. But here's that uh, wheel change for the track specialist. Pretty efficient by the looks of things. Mechanic, well, a uh, analog technique. That's Kenny de Kettel, I think, doing the change there. National coach for Belgium. It looked to be like him. This move looks like it might have legs, you know. Although it looks like there's one of the riders just accelerated from Team Vla Flanders, Balois, who's tried to go clear. Two riders in there from Jekyll Lula as well. Would Good. you be happy about that if you're the other teams, or are they not enough of a threat to you, Matt? I think they'll always um, have a lot of respect for Michael Matthews, but I don't think they'll be overly bothered. Um, always watch out for Matthews, but it just means Matthews can sit back and just float around the move, doesn't have to do too much, having riders at the front of the quality that they have here. So an interesting combination of riders. Just want to work out which rider that is for the moment at the back. Issues for Dilla Fabala. Oh, he's had issues all week as well. Medical issues. He's not been feeling well. He's got a front puncture here. Front wheel puncture for Dilla Fabala. And well for Visma Lisa bike. It's been a nightmare, ten days. Yeah, it's been it's been awful. Such a shame. Uh, they've still had some decent results. Uh, you know, they've won three of the three of the Cobble Classics this year already. But we we do, uh, but they set the bar so so high. But yeah, they've had a torrid time of it. They, they really have. But um, we'll see how Dylan Van Baal is today. I mean, ordinarily he'd be a force to be reckoned with and would be one of the favourites to win this one, given uh, the sorts of races, his capacity in the past. But uh, right now, I think he'll be used as one would imagine a utility rider. Keep your eye on this because the gap's growing 13 seconds. Important stage in this Ronde van Vlaanderen. Eight riders up the road, including Stanislaw, Aniolkowski, Sudal Quickstep have Bert von Leeberger. They're happy with that. They are blocking the front. Alpacine seem to be happy. They bring a couple of riders up. Here come Bahrain, and they're going to try and throw the cat among the pigeons yet again. Yeah, Bahrain not happy at all. Koffert is straight on the wheel, as are Alpacine de Koenig. So clearly the instruction from the team car has come, or they said, look, we definitely want somebody in the early move. And while the gaps are only 15 seconds, uh, you want to try and bring things back as soon as possible. This move is going away quite nicely. 15 seconds equates to several hundred metres at this sort of speed as they rattle over some unclassified cobbles. We don't hit the first formal set of cobbles until 166 k's to go as Q36.5 now want a piece of the action too. Cyrus Monk on his monument debut. Jovic not too far behind. Fifth wheel. 20 seconds. At eight riders up the road. Alasic hasn't quite snapped yet, but we're getting to a situation where it could easily be pulled apart. Yeah, Team DSM at Firmenich post NL also won a piece of the action there. So several of the big teams have still missed this one. So one or two riders still eager to chip across, but that break is going still. Bahrain victorious won a piece of this. Coffert is trying to neutralise these moves because they have representation out in front. Sylvain Dillier there as well for Alperson de Koenig. And this is Dusan Brajovic, national champion of Serbia, riding for Bahrain victorious, as Matt mentioned. Flanders Balwais are just trying to hit your ride if they can. And this is Damian Tuzeus along with uh, David Deck, who's a good rider in here. Grendal Janssen is the other rider from uh, Jayco. In fact, no, that's... Uh, keep your eye on that one. Tamino is definitely in there. And there's a little error in that caption because the other rider, of course, in that group, as we've been mentioning, is Luke Durbridge. So Indeed. We wait to find out who the second rider is from Jayco Lula. 2-1-7 there is certainly Jelle Vermote, and he is on his monument debut as well for the minute he's got himself into the breakaway. But it's not quite the done deal yet. The gap's gone down to 17 seconds. Yeah, there's a couple of teams that are happy to ride this. Well, there's no real coordination. It's just one or two riders from teams sitting on the front. Of course, Coffers aren't going to help. I think Alpes and De Kerning aren't overly bothered about this one. As another move goes. Get my follows and waits. Be hoping to feel better as the day goes on. Sat in the wheels right now, isn't he? Letting these kilometres tick by. There's Michael Matthews. Two teammates up in front to a good start for the Australian team. A very good start, in fact. Such a small number of riders out in front to get two there means that they're absolutely on it today. Focused, alert, and that's what you need to be at this point of the race. This is Kispa Asko who's slowing things down as much as he can. Just 
trying to ride a pace and take the sting out of things, but Dersim, Firmenich, Posten and aren't happy. Yeah, this looks like a Frank van den Broek. He actually rode yesterday um, over in uh, over in the uh, the Walter Limburg or the Walter Next Classic. So he's already got, got a 180k race in his legs. Another of those ten riders making their monument debuts today, van den Broek from Netherlands. 23 years of age. Swift again following here for Ineos Grenadiers. 194 there on your screen is Lionel Tamigno. And it's been corrected. It's Elmar Renders who's the second of the two riders there for Jaco Alula. Decker Touze. Touze for. Uh, he now, of course, renamed Decathlon Azure as our team. It's quite interesting. It, it doesn't look right now as if Van Lerberg is riding. Yeah. This is quite interesting. He's not. He's uh, been tapping riders on. Maybe he's just. He's probably been told just. You only ride once we, this gets like half a minute or 45 seconds, but right now it doesn't look like this has gone. So well, it's very, very experienced rider in, anyway. It's a great lead out rider as well as a, a utility rider, super domestique. But right now, although he's got in this move, he's not assisting with its momentum. Perhaps he thinks that uh, doesn't want to waste his energy just yet. Um, maybe just, uh, well, there's still a lot of riders and a lot of teams who want representation in this move. They're in Steendorp. Flanders Balwaza, DSM, Ineos, still keen. And yes, get better soon, Wout. Everybody thinking of Wout van Aert today. Successfully operated on, and we'll go through his absence and the others. Wout van Aert, Jasper Sterva in particular, and, and Alex Kirsch after all the preparation having to. He's been to miss flying, hasn't he? Today. Yeah, I mean, it's such a shame. Still not gone. Now, the road. Just we start heading, the road just bends ever so gently to the right as we exit this town. We head towards Temps and then towards St Nicholas. The uh, rather uh, cheerleader at the side of the road there, but this is where we pick up the tail crosswind. So this is where it could become a little bit interesting. You see, this, you see the shape, shape of the peloton shot uh, start to shift, if I can get my words out, uh, and the pace increase ever so slightly from a cross headwind to a cross tailwind. Just look immediately, look at where the chain is down the block. He's on the 13 or the 12 sprocket here. The pace has gone up to about 55 k's an hour, just looking at that. And this is where things could split. This is big. This looks like Jonas Hutch, who's having a real go now for EF Education Easy Post. One of the teams up until this moment who have not been interested, who've been biding their time, but have seen the situation. And with 11 seconds of a gap firing up the road, one of their young guns, the German 26-year-old strongman. Yep, I do like that black kick celebrating uh, 20 years of, uh, of Rafa, basically. Of uh, not being involved in the sport, has been involved as a brand. I do like that uh, nod to the past. He was being chased down by Fran Miholjevic of Croatia and Bahrain victorious. Nine seconds, though, it is coming back, and you are right above uh, Leerberger there. Yeah, he's just wait. He just he just knows that this hasn't gelled. He'd be getting information from the team card to say, just no, wait, wait, wait. This hasn't gone just yet. One or two more riders might actually get across and swell this. Rajovic again. He's the man or one of the men from Bahrain Victorious trying to get up the road. Opposite and want to chase this down. They're pretty happy for what the was up the road to go up the road. I think they'll be keen enough to chase those eight men there. Nothing else. Exactly. They don't want this group to end up. For, for the group to swell so much that they're pretty much, you know, you've got half of the World Tour teams there and they have to use riders early on. So they just sit on the wheels, just let the natural momentum of the racing tick by these kilometres. This is a perfect situation for Van der Poel's team at the moment. They don't need to directly chase things, but just sit in, follow the little moves, um, because this race hasn't settled yet. It hasn't settled into that pattern. And if you think about last year again, it was, it was similar, super fast start. We saw the before the we saw the race split and the actual final, the actual break of the day, for want of a better word, didn't go to about 70 Ks. And they only got about two minutes before the actual big part of the racing kicked off. So it was a very unusual, um, very unusual race uh, story last year. Keep your eyes on this because UAE Emirates. Covey, isn't it? With Corvey, I had to double check that because he's not wearing his odd shoes. I wonder if like he's got he covers been. on, yeah. He's, it looks like he's had a bit of a shave as well. So um, he normally wears black and white shoes, as you're right, and he's normally uh, got a little bit of stubble on board. Defending champions UAE Emirates, but without Tare Pogaccia today. A much more low key team, but certainly a very talented one still. 
Talking of Wellens as the leader, Biel Corvi there. Here's she, the Swiss champion, young Mogado at 20 years of age. Already shown aptitude and talent for the cobbles. Of course, monument distance at 20 years of age will make it very, very difficult. And Niels Pollitt, who's been getting better and better. He was, remember, on the podium in the Omlop at Newsblad. Yeah, Pollitt's looking good. You know, he, get, he gets over the climbs reasonably effectively as well, Pollitt. Watch out for him in the green, the lime green of a border hands grow. One rider's managed to get away here. Is that going to be the end of the proceedings? Let's have a look. DSM Fiuminic Pustenel have missed the move. A wider road here. Narrows a little further up. Maybe a chance to block the road. It's hard to get across as a single rider. Still think that is actually Frank Vandenbroek again. Just trying to get in the slipstream of that motorbike. Again, it, that's the gap there is only about five or six seconds, but as an, a rider on your own, even in a tailwind, it's so, so hard. Ten seconds now. Maybe right in the red zone here, trying to get across as quickly as possible. Full gas effort. Let's have a look at what's happening behind. Still no. a lot of activity at the front, Rob. Not going at all. This is Alpacine now coming to the front and trying to just slow things down a little bit. Jaco are happy. They've got two riders up the road. This Melissa bike. Well, they'll be nonplussed at the minute. They'll feel it's not on them to chase today, given the fact that there's no Wild Fanat. Yeah, they've been notable by their absence. I mean, uh, they've, nobody even in the top 10, 15. They'll just be keeping an eye, though. They'll be watching. They'll be listening. It looks like that might be Afini just in the centre. They're starting to block the road. There's somebody trying to come up from Tudor Pro Cycling, and that could start the game again. Remember, it did look a little earlier on that things were starting to calm down, but we know that it only takes one to fall, and the dominoes, and that effect continues, and everything has to start again. It's a difficult it's chase smart. here for the rider from DSM Filmenik Postenel. It's Nicholas Merkel in the end who is trying to get across. The rider from Germany, 25 years of age. He team looks, that's directed by Pim Ligtart on the road. He looks gassed. I mean, again... Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, this, it, it's due to pro cycling, isn't it? Trying to bring this back together. So, so hard against a group of six riders who are absolutely going flat out for one rider to get across. Uh, and he's sat up now. Sometimes you've got to know when your time is up. Another attack is at Q36.5 now firing somebody else up the road. Team from Switzerland. They're going to be followed as well by somebody from Tudor Pro Cycling. And tell the riders wearing 222 is Fabio Christen, brother of Jan Christen on UAE. Being followed as well by Dries de Bont. Hello. That's interesting. Yep, Dries de Bont latching on to the back of the Swiss rider. Little flick of the elbow there. So still a lot of activity. It's gone out to 20 seconds though, but still a lot of teams remember. I've missed this. So DSM active, Tudor active. Keep your eyes on this. Latest rider trying for DSM is Nils Ekhoff. He's being let go at the minute. Nobody can chase. Nils Ekhoff trying to get across. It's a 20 second gap to get across though, if he can. Yeah, it's, it's hard. Thing is, isn't it? when you've got a tail crosswind, you feel like you can do it, you, 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 you know, it's, it's a different feeling of resistance. You know you're moving quicker, uh, but then it becomes quite clear <laughs> that it's actually very, very hard to bridge across. Uh, if this was a group of maybe three or four, you'd have a chance. Ekoff is a very classy bike rider, but to cross a gap of 22 seconds to eight riders that are still going to be going pretty much full gas. This is about establishing this move. They haven't settled into the rhythm that they can sustain for the rest of the day yet. This is about building that lead. So they're going to be riding very hard now. Big well, short turns on the front, high speed. It's all about building that lead as quick as, as quick as possible. And it's looking like, we're well, saying that, 24 seconds, but still, now Bora Hansgrohe in the mix too. Bora Hansgrohe. Having a real go here. Looks like it could be young here to solve that. If so, the only teenager in the race. Yeah, it's one of the Van Dykes just there as well. Taking the gel early on. Happy just to shut this one down. First time they've ridden this race together, actually. They've both made their monument debuts in this race, but in different years, in the last two years. But they're in the team together. There's Yves Lompard, a two-time winner of Duars de Vlaanderen. 
has really found form recently. Komponarts is at the front as well. Mihojevic is just behind. UAE are here, and they're keen on chasing this. Yeah, very interesting, isn't it? Vegas State Langer. This is where I think this looks like it might be more positioning because of the potential for crosswinds here as well. And we're about to enter into another of our towns, into San Nicolás, yep. uh, which is one of the, the biggest of the towns that will pass through. It's an historic town that the Ronde of Vlaanderen has passed through before. And it means that the road will narrow, we'll go through the town centre, and everybody will have to be on their best behaviour and best positioning. Yeah, that's what uh, I think that's why we've got this positioning plate. Vega State Lang in a big, big engine. Nils Pollitt, again, probably an even bigger engine. Pollitt just uh, moving into the centre, looks across. This is, as you say, quite right. It's about controlling things now. 23 seconds is the gap. As you say, yeah, they head right into the heart of St Nicholas and then do a 180-degree turn and come back out again. And then there'll be quite a long stretch where they're... The peloton, the riders, as they head towards Dendermonde, they'll be riding for the next 25, 30 k's, primarily into a headwind again. And then it'll be crosswind all the way into Udenale before we commence the climbs and the second part of the race. Narrowing on the left-hand side here. Keep your eyes on this. Breathe in, everybody. Especially wet roads, paint as well. Always makes me nervous, Rob. Always a sharp intake of breath. But they've done that on so many occasions. But from the air, it uh, makes for nervous viewing. A Snell edge control there. That's a, a speed control. 50 k's an hour, the limit. There might be a few fines dropping on the mat next week. A few fines. Morgado moving up left hand side. Gianni Vermeers is there left for the double denim clad Alpacine de Koenig as we look at it. And again, oh, wow. One of those. Make sure everybody's through safely as we're into sunny class. It's balloons. Add all of its history with the Ronde van Vlaanderen. This is one of the official Dorp van der Rondes, which is a, a Ronde village with all of its history. And then a bit further into town, actually, in the main square. And, of course, before Bruges and Antwerp, this was the start of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And you can tell that we are here. Beautiful, into sunny class. Town Square passed, and for many a year the start. A little bit careful over that crossing there. It was ever so slightly off camber. That was. That was still only 19 seconds up, so it hasn't fully gone yet, but. It, let, it's not so much that the peloton are chasing this group now, it's just they're positioning their leaders on, on a technical section. This is this little 180-degree turn that I was talking about, essentially a lap of the town square and then back out of the town again. For 20 years, it was a start town from 1977 to 1997. The route was Saint-Niclas de Meerbeke. Of course, then it was Bruges. And very recently, it's been Antwerp before the shared start. Now we have an alternating start for the next four years, at least between Antwerp and Bruges itself. Brugge. Nice to share it out, isn't it? And we see that in Lombardia as well, just moving between starts and finishes. A different race, of course, but the action kicks off again. Now, Visma Lisa bike for the first time managing to escape. It's one of the Van Dijk brothers. Jordi Meus is also there as well, not too far away, but this is Dens at the front. Left-hand side, you can see as well, DSM Firminik post NL. Yeah, then uh, has the look of Mayos, doesn't he, from the front before? But then, uh, as soon as we saw that grimace, it's uh, very recognisable as the, uh, the very strong German. Just look at that line out, the entire field. And nice. just 14 seconds now. Though. Yeah, still super active. I was saying that there's, there were just it was just a holding pattern there about positioning plate. Uh, the chase is back on again. Well, not so much a pursuit, just trying to get more representation in that front move. Still only eight up the front. But DSM Fermanick post NL, very eager to try and get involved. You have education easy post following. Matt, do you think that anybody will like to let this Melissa bike up the road today? All right, there's no Wout Fanart, but they still got Fumbala. 
They have Jorgensen, they have you Benoit. Wouldn't wanna, you wouldn't want to even let one of the, the, the Van Dijker brothers up there um, at all. This is Miles Scottson, um, clearly struggling, not too sure what's wrong for the former Australian road race champion there. A little bit of a shake of the head there. That was Rutsch again. This is Tractor Tim, Tim de Klerk, racing now as the Tractor instead for Lidl Trek, as Morgado makes his first move. Yeah, swear Connor Swift on straight on to his wheels. Janet Vermeer, remember, 12th in this race last year, one of the riders that came down midweek as well. Clearly looking all right. And still, Van Lerberger sandbagging at the back. Oh, just playing it, just playing it. Playing it calm, really, playing it sensible. Why start riding full gas when you know that the brake hasn't established itself yet? Only 12 seconds, went up to 25, down to 14, and now down to almost single digits as it settles again. Not for long, though. 15 seconds, we're hearing that. Oh, here we go. This one This one looks like it might have legs. Israel Primatech also trying to get involved there, jumping over that little central reservation. The Bont once again. Yeah. From Bala back on the back. And, you know, Mars Scottson, we saw before, it's, it's a scene that we've seen quite a bit this spring. He's not been great. And we know that his good mate Arnold Demar has been struggling with over riding, over fatigue. I'm just wondering if something hasn't been yeah. quite right in the preparation, the training this year. Yeah. Although they're moving quickly here, and we've only done like 25, 30 Ks of this race, and uh, something's definitely not, uh, not right, unless he's dropping back for another reason as we continue to focus on the very gracefully poised figure of Dylan van Baal. Sat last man, no worries for him. Interesting stat there. Most active rider with five top tens in this race without winning it, but he is a monument winner, remember? A big solo victory when he was running for Ineos in uh, Paris-Roubaix a few years back, but still only 13 seconds. This is going to really help with our average speed today, Rob, that's for sure. 47 k's an hour, the average speed. Alessandro Covey, oh, he's got shoe covers on, that's pretty... And he has had a little bit of a shave as well mm. as Covey. I tell you what, Morgado, I keep thinking it's Danny Martinez. It looks very, very <laughs> similar from the, from the front, doesn't he? Facially very similar looking rider. As Kaspar Asgren latches onto the wheel of the Italian. He's an older looking 20 year old as the Portuguese, isn't he? Yeah. From the same town, by the way, of João Almeida. Caldas Reina, north of Lisbon. Same team as well. Very different riders, however. Morgado, who is in such good form at Le Sama, on the line, second place, wasn't he? Yeah, it was a great ride. Dilia now moving up as well. Asgrin, as you said before, just placing this. Dilia there with a chance to maybe try and get the road blocked here. The Kledek on the right hand side, they've all got the same idea. Lidl doing the same. Visma coming to the front, though, and wanting to mind. Just keep things going and keep the pressure on. The idea, I imagine, behind this, with the Fandeka brothers just causing a bit of havoc here, and Turner there on the row, sorry, uh, Swift there on the row, on the radio behind. Connor Swift, that is. This... Um, are they are they just trying to keep the stress full for Alpacinda Koenig and make it difficult? I don't know, because, I mean, r right now, I mean, that's really interesting. It's like the gap's only 16 seconds, 243 k's to go. We're now moving into that headwind section, but uh, Van Dijk is just riding on the front. It's quite an interesting one. I, I don't really understand that one, unless they just want to keep this pace high. Um, but, but right now, I mean, Alpes and de Koenig have had a relatively easy ride. I mean, we're focusing on that team because Van der Poel's the favourite. And, and because of the absentees here today, it does change potentially the face of the race. And I think it will do when we get to the, uh, to the back end in particular. But it's these early phases in relation to what teams are doing. It gives an indication of what their tactics might be. But uh, Elie Viviani has been active from the start for Ineos Grenadiers. Dillier again, just policing here for Alberson de Koenig. Kasper Asgren as well. He's been very vigilant in the early, early stages. A little bit of a surprise, but he hasn't been in the wind too much. Okay. He's almost just been neutralising things. Let's not forget that Kasper Asgren is a former winner of the Round of Flanders. Keep your eye on this. Yep. A split here. These are little moves that could be, could be pretty dangerous. And yet again, more riders from Jake Lula. I think there's Otto Vergada there from Lidl Trek as well. Just moving up on the inside. Askren would be in this split, as would Dillier. Again, that would make it very complicated because there'd be a lot of teams represented there and you'd be wondering who would chase it. Yeah, that's come straight back. Nobody 
wanted to really even ride in that move. Groupama FD Jeu were also represented as the shape of the peloton changes yet again, fanning all the way across the road. Still a difficult one to call. And as I just say that, another team, unsurprisingly, on the offensive, Team Flanders Balois try again. Yep, Flanders Balois are really under starters' orders to make this breakaway. If they have one objective for the season, surely it's to be in the breakaway in the Ronde of Vlaanderen. Yeah. That's becoming more and more difficult with how contested these races are. Dillier wants to chase this from Dusan Rajovic, not let him go. Bahrain would be a dangerous team to get somebody up the road, certainly with Mate Mohoric among their number. Yeah, definitely, he's been very active, isn't he? Meanwhile, it's just all this early activity makes it even harder. And you might think, well, these breaks away anywhere. They're just, just going to ride at the same pace all day. Well, they're not. They can't actually settle yet because they need to keep applying the pressure. And, and they've been doing this now for the best part of half an hour. So they'll be, they're riding hard here. They, they haven't settled in yet. And, and of course, one rider is still sat on, um, which is going to be a little bit frustrating for a lot of these uh, riders. Now then, two riders anchoring any move that goes. 30 kilometers have been ridden, as you can see. 241 k's to go. 23 seconds for an eight-man breakaway that's been out there for more than 20 kilometers now. But is it going to be the break of the morning? I say that because, of course, in these Monument Classics, you often have a morning break and then a later move and then a final selection, if you like, before the race really is contested. But the breakaway for the morning is being contested still, as you see. Yep. Although we've got eight riders in front, there's only seven teams represented, and that means there's plenty of riders behind that want to try something, cool. including UAE. Yes, again, another one of several attacks by Alessandro Covi. Venus Grenadiers as well, just wanting to follow and chase. Alpacinda Koenig now have gone into direct marking mode, haven't they? That's changed in the last couple of kilometres, just observing that for me, Matt. Uh, yeah. Every time a move now goes, immediately have Dillier or another of the double denim brigade straight on the wheel. Yeah. They've had Dillier, Maurice and Rizabic um, floating around. Remember Axel Laurence, uh, the under-23 World Road Race champion, a late addition to this team. Um, but he might be a rider that I definitely think that Van der Poel would need later on. So we're not seeing him. He's keeping his power a little bit dry. He's such a talented rider. He really is. Two big wins this year already for the young Frenchman. Creeping up towards 30 seconds, and there's a little bit of hesitation here. Is this the moment? It could well be. You've got the right names and jerseys at the front to block things off. We've also got a couple of riders from Flanders Balois are trying to creep up on this left-hand side. We're on a perfect situation with the road here because it's a narrower road and it's an easy objective to try and block this, but there's moves up on the outside. Here we go again. Yep. And they want to keep that going. Flanders Balois, Bahrain victorious. Rizabek this time says no. Lompart is keen to shut this down as well. Yeah. He's a bit straight on the wheel there. Lampart head to canted just to one side there. Latching on to well, they're happy. They've got a rider in the move. 38 seconds now. Now, if this gets up to 45 seconds, nearly a minute, it's going to be hard. Each one of these little moves are going to be less effective, basically. Nobody seems to want to join in the mix. And there's probably only three or four teams that are still active. Bahrain, uh, Balois. We've seen a couple of little moves from UAE as well but none of these are sticking because of the vigilance of two teams in particular, or one team in particular, Absin de Koenig, more than happy with only seven teams being up the road, eight-man break, this is almost perfect for them. It's far easier to ride a smaller group. It, you wonder every time there's this sort of stop-start stuff, you wonder if it's going to stop again, but then Miholjevic carries it on. Exactly. Well, Bahrain clearly have been instructed to keep on going. Try and keep the pressure on. Again, in turn, this makes it harder for this group out in front. Another long turn on the front from Luke Durbridge. So smooth on a bike is Durbridge. Just behind him was David Decker. Now only missing out on a Grand Tour stage win last year in the Giro from second on one of the early stages. I think it was to Jonathan Milan. So a classy rider. As they emerge out of the tunnel, so the gap's come down now, 34 seconds. A few teams that are just being sort of mischievous at the front without fully committing, like UAE and Ineos. 
DSM are fully committed. They want to be in that break. Bahrain as well, Flanders, Balwaza. And then if a right move goes, you just get the feeling that some teams would join in if they could. Exactly. Well, we're, we're coming out now. We've been out of St. Nicholas for a while, on the outskirts of St. Nicholas, and we're now into a headwind. And just look at the shape of the pillars. Look how hard it is on the front, and look how relatively easy to sit on, a, on the wheel. So it's even harder now to slap the elastic. You really need to accelerate and punch hard out of the bunch to snap the elastic. But if, um, if you haven't managed to, it's so much easier to sit on the wheel, and that's why we're seeing the bunch the way it is. That's the Mirror Bridge just outside of Harmut. Of course, owes its name to its role as a backdrop in the film Mira. That was a Flemish blockbuster from the 1970s. Jan de Kler and uh, Willeke van Amelroy acting in that one. Bridge built in 1898 and here in 2024. It's the peloton of the Ronde van Vlaanderen and the 108th edition of it still trying to sort out the breakaway. It's a very good morning for the first time to Edward Turns as well for Lidl Trek. Yep. Ed Turns looking around, almost saying, look, anybody else got any ideas? And somebody has as we just head into this uh, hard right-hander. It looks like it is, again, one of the riders from Team DSM Fervnik post NL. They clearly want to try and reinvigorate things here, try and get another little bit of a chase on. All the while as well, the longer this is goes on, it takes time away from those big name riders who would like a quiet hour or so just to fuel, have a chat with their mates, maybe have a think about something else. We now see Jaco Lula marking things. Yep, they've done a, they've ridden so well. Durbridge and Landers in the front and also marking these other moves as well. There'll be one team that doesn't want anybody else to try and get across. They're more than happy with the situation. The more we go through these towns, though, the more difficult it is to block that road, isn't it? Yeah, and definitely. If we come into Hammer now. Another one of the Dorpe von der Ronde. The bells ring as we come into town. Yep, next on the list is uh, Moreke, and then uh, we go into Dendermonde as we continue to head in a directly southerly direction. A few riders now stripping off. Things are getting nice and warm. And the bells are ringing. Easter Sunday in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. You know the real religion in this region is cycling. It's the first time we've seen Jonathan Milan as well today on the left-hand side, looking across. It looked like there was another rider from DSM readying themselves for an attack there. Eight riders here. Are they going to be the eight who are away for most of the day? 26 seconds and rising while we saw that going on back there, but you can just see there's little splits, and as soon as we cut back to them, it's the same story. Matt, you had your eagle eyes at the ready there. You could spot that coming. Yeah, you could just see his body language out of the saddle. Jonas Rusch doesn't fancy being on the wheel of that one, so drops in to get a little bit more added shelter. Another glance around, no assistance at all, a flick of the elbow, and all he's going to get is blank looks from everybody else. What's Milesi doing up there? Movistar yeah. have had riders up towards the front watching, and they've not really committed. I've just been wondering what, what their aim for today was. Well, if you have riders up and near the front, you, it's just following moves. Rather than actually committing, it's just sometimes you can get a free ticket. A big move goes on the right or the left. You just attentive, drift onto the wheel, and the next thing you know, you've fluked yourself into a move just by being aware and not actually spending any more energy. So I think that's what they're doing. They're just not wanting to be the catalyst, but they'll happily follow something, because quite often, if you just float into a move, it's brilliant. Uh, and that's, what, that's what's good about just riding at or near the front. It's just being aware of what's going on, and quite often, um, you can have races where you're attacking and attacking and attacking, nothing sticks, and then one day you just float into the, into the biggest move of the day uh, with relative ease. Welcome in sport. Well, they're ready for battle. They certainly are. Great crowds here, unsurprisingly. Flemish flags lie in the road. It is the Tour of Flanders. Through Hammer. 
Martin heading towards Dendermonde. And we will see you soon in sport. Here's the message. Eight riders up there. 28 seconds, and there's no controlling things just yet whilst the road is like this. You can just see the, the Flemish flags, they're just indicating they've got that uh, headwind. Not super, super strong, but enough to make a little bit of a difference, enough to make it far easier sat in the wheels, far harder on the front. And that'll be the order of the day uh, for at least the next 15 k's. That's when we get to uh, the Bardigan that we actually start to hit the crossing wind again, and then it's pretty much crosswind all the way in uh, to the climbs. Kofidis being chased here by Sheffield of Ineos. Interesting, they've got a man in the move. I wonder why they're actually attacking here. That's slightly puzzling, to be perfectly honest with you. There's a lot about Kofidis that's puzzling sometimes, Matt. I mean, there's just you just sit on, you don't drive on the front into a headwind. Uh, just, yeah, strange one. Just that Visma's still there, still looking, yeah. still trying to be a little bit mischievous in keeping it going when they can. Now they come to the front. Again, on the right-hand side, again, just as we cut away, was uh, Team DSM not giving up. And today, the race is ours, say the Flemish people. The course is for nonce. The thing is, what we don't know is what's going on in these riders' ears. Team DSM Firming aren't just doing this for fun. They've been told, you keep going. There's only eight riders in front. We've still got 27 seconds. There's several other teams that have missed it. If you keep attacking, other teams might join in. And we often see these, these periods early in a race where it looks like it's all over and all it takes is something to go. There we go, another, another team. It just, it's just keeping igniting. It's like blowing on, the, on, a, on a fire that's kind of dying. And um, but you've got to keep on doing it, otherwise it will fizzle out. Cyrus Monk with a little bit of a gap. Now you wait for the DSM and... Flanders Balwaza riders to try and follow him. Look around from the DSM rider in the middle as if to wonder if they'd just be allowed to roll off. The answer would probably be no, because eight's enough to control, isn't it, in this day and age in cycling? Yeah, and uh, Monk's a classy rider, strong rider, but he would have liked to have one or two riders with him to try and get across this gap. That's going to be a hard one. 28 seconds, best part of half a minute. He's going to get uh, a mate now trying to come go. across. So if you're the peloton here, do you think, oh, do you know what? You could let those... Let, let's those two guys go and let's have a bit of a breather. Let's have, you know, a comfort break, a bit of food. But in the knowledge, we're probably going to have to work that little bit harder later on. Yeah, or do you carry on chasing it and just suck the life out of it? Yep. I mean, to be honest, it looks like they had a flat front to the bunch. If you look at uh, Van Lerberger, I would say just let, just let DSM Permanent get in the move. Um, and then they've, you've got 10 riders up in front, nine teams represented. A lot of the big teams expected to win this race aren't represented. So you would imagine there's been a lot of teams where they, this is uh, was it Kasper Asgren again. Better from Leeberger, the oh, back of Leeberger. his bike, actually. It was a slow motion, wasn't it, a few moments ago? But yeah, I, if you're the big teams and you want to, things to settle for 45 minutes, well, not even that. I mean, we've seen what, what, what we know about racing now, you can't. We don't see the old school gaps of years ago, 9, 10, th uh, 12 minutes. Um, Arkea also getting involved now. Same so with David just... Decker already up the road. Yep. So very interesting. It's a monk about to be brought back. Yeah, I think that was just to shut things down. Actually, it looks like it's uh, Dan McClay, actually, on the left-hand mm -hmm. side. Yep. British rider. Very good sprinter indeed. Sylvain Dillier on the wheel. A first real glimpse of anybody from Uno X. Maybe they're normally they're very active in the early stages, but when you look at the form of Jonas uh, um, Abramson from the other day, maybe they're thinking a little bit deeper into the race and not happy to get involved earlier on. They know they won't have to do any chasing, but use their resource for the second part of the race rather than early on. That's 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 quite interesting from them. Another slowdown. Another moment. You wonder, the gap hovering just above and below 30 seconds, and as soon as they do, this Melissa bike again come to the front. They don't quite stretch it out, but they keep it going enough. 
to encourage something to happen from behind and to stop everybody blocking the road at the front. I think this is just keep the pressure on, keep it nervous from them. Well, Flanders Balois have gone again. I'll be honest with you, those are those those big weird puppets are mightily disturbing. I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Well, that's Murzik, and that's the home of the Stefan Klug, Stefan Kung <laughs> Flemish fan club. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, flipping it. Love bike racing. Absolutely love it. Well, that's going to haunt my dreams for many years. He... Those puppets, by the way, are from carnival time. They are quite terrifying. They're like the things out of an old uh, Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, aren't they? You see them in Flanders, both here in Flanders and, of course, in uh, French Flanders. Well, then. Oh, hello. That's the equivalent. You see the arm going up there. That's the equivalent of in the football now, someone saying, hang on a minute, check the VAR, because riders are not supposed to move up on the, on the pavement. Yeah, exactly. We, we could see, we'll see. And that was quite clear. Mm, but that, that, was a, that was a signal there from the rider saying, hang on a minute, that's not allowed. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like giving an imaginary yellow card, isn't it, to, to the referee? You know, book him, ref. Exactly. Well, he's learned, hasn't he? He's drifted over, he's been shut down pretty quickly. By the way, the VAR truck, as is at all of the World Tour races and many of the other races now, is here, is in the car park, and they were spotted having a coffee earlier on this morning, ready for action. Indeed. Here we go. First sights of uh, Mathieu van der Poel. Derobing. Gilles off, quick change, quick chat, all is good. Looks pretty relaxed. He's with uh, Christoph Rodolf. Team manager. Oh, he's listening to the Sunday morning tune being played on the horn there. And everything at the minute uh, going fairly according to plan on the hymn sheet. A Pretty sure he'd like his team to be able to relax a little bit more here and for the break to go and, you know, Sylvain Dillier, whoever it is, tap the rhythm out on the front. Yep. But for him, as long as he sort of stays out the way of this and there's nothing too much happen and they're not going at a million miles an hour, he won't be too dissatisfied. We could get the moment here where the peloton is satisfied. I think we're nearly there because there is opportunity because of the width of the road. If anybody wants to sneak up on the inside, like that bingo rider, almost uh, you can almost sense. He's like, oh, if I go now, I go now. Could get across to this that chap who's gone clear from Flanders Balois, and somebody else has gone. It's Bahrain now on the offensive on and the you right. Could just see again at the bottom. Did you see the yellow jersey moving up, allowing the rider from behind yeah, yeah. to get through? They just keep one. Oh. They, they want to keep this race open. It's yep. fascinating. Yep. I mean, to be honest with you, there'll be a few teams that are more than happy. If, if you're not a team that's actually shutting stuff down, it just gets the job done quicker. Michael Volgren there just at the back. I tell you what, it's great to see Michael Volgren back after yeah. a couple of very difficult years with injury. It's a Fran Milosevic who brings back the rider, or try to get across from the rider from Flanders Balois. Soros Monk again on the front. Dan Haller moving up in the centre as well for Lidl Trek. I do wonder what Monk is, his idea is here. No, I mean, anybody can ride wherever they want to. Look at uh, Yannick Steimler amongst their number. Did a good win already this year. The man who came across from Sudal Quickstep. Now, will this man work now? It gaps up to 52 seconds as you see two of the favourites having a chat. A couple of the other riders stopping for a comfort break. At what gap does it have to be? for things to stop. I get the feeling, Matt, without seeing the front of the peloton, we're seeing a lot of riders having a comfort break now. I, th I think this, this could it. be it. Yeah, this is it. Now, although you can attack at any point you want, um, the unwritten rules, and they are unwritten. You won't um, be very popular yeah, you if you attack, won't be very popular. If you launch one up the inside now with lots of riders stopping, um, it's complete within the rules, but you'll be, uh, be ticked off by your, uh, your fellow riders. And I think that could be it. There we go. Knocked it off to 37 k's an hour. Still into that headwind, remember, but 57 seconds. And I think that is our break finally done, Rob. 45 kilometers of fighting 
it has taken for a breakaway to go in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. 226 kilometers remain. Eight riders are up the road, one is chasing. Whether he gets across or not, it remains to be seen. We cross the river Skelt, the Skelder. Of course, we'll be going and trekking around the Skelder on Wednesday at the Skelder Press. Today, though, it is the Ronde van Vlaanderen. And after a mighty fight, nervous moments, it's time for the leaders to relax. Not perhaps going back to ride one of those things. They'll be hoping to go a little bit more comfortable than that. It's looking good, isn't it? In all his Sunday finery. Uh, it's the high mass, isn't it, of Bethlehemish Holy Week? And then he's dressed in his Sunday best. Now, will Bert van Lerberger start riding here? Let's have a little bit of a look. Uh, no. That's very interesting. Really in, interesting. In this group, then, <laughs> what happens in terms of the cohesion? Uh, you know, how do they let him be there? Why aren't they all falling out? Um, I think they've come to terms with the fact that he's not riding. Or it's quite rare that you get a man in in a move like this so early in the race that doesn't actually contribute. Um, but I have a feeling, I mean, Wilfred Preet is, is the DS or the main DS for Sudal Quickstep. Um, let, let, let's be frank, let's get the cards on the table here. Uh, Patrick Lefebvre has been enormously critical of, of his team in the, in the press. Um, a lot of the riders haven't actually taken the bait and responded to it. It's just the way Patrick Lefebvre operates. But the fact remains if they are, they have massively underperformed. Um, you had a bit of an issue there, Rob. <laughs> I've just underperformed trying to drink a bit of water there. Never mind. Uh, I mean, it's OK. The race has slowed down. We'll now. dry out. Uh, yeah, well, you can just drop back in there. Go back to the team car, mate. You'll be fine. Um, but no, they've, they've, they've massively underperformed. And I have a feeling that rather than... what like, You've got Van, Van Lerberg now in the, in the break of the day. That's going to go probably right into the hills. Uh, they might get a lead, maybe three, four minutes uh, maximum before we see the peloton start riding behind. It looks as if it's going to be Sylvain Dillier doing something similar to what we saw him do in Milan San Remo, a rider more than capable of probably riding the next part of 100 Ks on the front, 90 Ks or so, um, as one of the Q36.5 riders nearly goes agricultural. Thankfully, he kept his bike upright. But, but I have a feeling that Sudal Quickstep have said, look, we get somebody in the, in, the, in, the, in the move, but they don't work because we want to try and get a result out of this race. And if we keep Van Lerberger fresh, he can actually do something functional in the latter stages of the race for the likes of Julien Alaphilippe, if Alaphilippe is in form, for the likes of, uh, of Kasper Asgren. Um, I don't think it's going to be there for Tim Muller. It's just a little bit too hilly. Same can be said for Kasper Pedersen. But the best chances today are the former winner um, who came seventh last year, Asgren and Alaphilippe, but why not have a resource up the road that's relatively fresh? So right now, Van Lerberg is in the move. He's not riding, so he's basically conserving a lot of energy. So it's just for him, it's just like riding in the main bunch now. Um, so they've got a fresh pair of legs up the road, and they're not wasting that resource, because what we have seen over the last few weeks and this year, and bits, bits of last year as well, that Sudal are lacking a little bit lacking in depth at the back end of a race. And I think they're, they're looking at this. Look, we're not, we're not just here to ride in the early break. We're not that sort of team. We need to be the team that we were in the past. We need to be on the front foot, and we want fresh resource deep into the race. So you're not riding. Mm. And I, I think that's the decision that's been made. I might be wrong, but reading in, into it right now, we've, we've been racing for just under an hour. Um, that break's been away for the best part of 40 minutes or so, and he hasn't done any turns, and I think that's the reason why. And relax. Relax. Well, Jacob have had a great start, haven't they? Really good. Two of their seven riders are up the road, and things are that calm in the Ronde of Vlander that the gentleman out for a Sunday morning run can keep pace with the peloton. Well, there might be any, a social media story being uploaded in a minute. Yeah. Hard, more than half the field now are um, dropping back, popping back to the car for a natter get some gels, get a little bit of food, but primarily it's uh, answering the call of nature before the second phase of this race presents itself. We wend our way gently towards Udenada. Still sat in the back, 2.32, the gap. 
gorgeous day though. Lots of blue sky, Rob. Still lovely here and just on the outskirts of Udamada, isn't it? Really beautiful frequency of light. The road's drying nicely. Yep. All things are relatively calm. But yeah, just on your point about how popular this will be, he won't be that popular. But there's a point that you you get to. There's no point in remonstrating, saying any more. The instruction's been given. He's doing his job, so he's keeping as fresh as possible. And they need they need something. Um, we've only got one. We've got two more races. Shell the priest, and then we've of course got Roubaix. And they've had one podium in all the Cobble Classics with Tim Merlier in the Brugge de Pano. Was was Brugge de Pano, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. Um, and, and, and that's been it. So um, they want to get something. So whatever chance they've got, they're going to take it. And they need to be really, really strict about how they use their, uh, how they deploy and use their resource when they're in a good position, not just frivolously waste it. They won the no Nokia Cursa. Yes, course, however, yeah. the Nokia Cursa for a, nice a team race, like Sudal Quickstep, it's it's you know it's, it's a Wednesday afternoon. Our mate Sean Kelly would call it efficient chipper. Yeah, I mean that's I mean Tim Malia. Actually, when you look at the the results of Tim Malia this year, he's, he's performed exceptionally well in the races he's expected to win. He's had numerous wins, um, but as a cobbled as a cobbled team, uh, they haven't. Um, and we know, I mean, it's, it's very easy to criticise because they set the bar so high. They've got a different look to the squad with Remco now, a different balance to the team. But I, sti I still think uh, there's a lot of pressure on them, especially in this race as well. This is a race that they're expected to do well in. It's a race they've dominated uh, in the past. Um, although Bert van Lerberg has now dropped into uh, the wheel of David Decker. We could see him rolling through. Or maybe it was just instruction, you don't ride for an hour. It's something like that, you know, it's just, uh, we shall see. Keep our eye on it. 220 kilometres remain as the Ronde van Vlaanderen settles into its rhythm now, riding towards the Flemish Arden. 50 kilometres have been ridden. Our first obstacles don't come for another 55 kilometres. It's Axel Laurence on the front. Out the saddle there. Took his world, first World Tour win the other day down in Spain, in Catalonia. Oldest team in the today's race, Jeko Halula. Oldest average age of 31. Rare in cycling nowadays yeah. for a team to have an average age over 30. Yeah, the youngest rider is 25, and that's Kellen O'Brien. It's a long, straight bit of road, isn't it? <laughs> Well, look at the people left and right. This is the race of the people. And of course, it sees the people come out in their numbers. Yeah, this, looking at the map, this is the straightest straight of the whole day. We go all the way to Utrecht, and then we turn right, and that's when we hit the first crosswind heading towards Alst. Yeah, we're in uh, Lebecke now, heading towards Opweg. Afterwards, Bardeken, Meldert, Alst. Haltert, then to Denderautum, and on to Herzela. It's when we get to uh, Zotekim that we get towards our first cobbles, and the main obstacles of the day begin. Yep, this will be that big uh, left turn that I was uh, talking about. There we go, we're right on it now. But yeah, the first section of cobbles, the Cassian, comes at 166.6 k's to go. That's the Lippenhofstraat. And then the first climb of the day, the iconic Old Aquadamont at 134.1 k's. Goes a long way until our first of the Hellingen. Oh, was that a little move there on the front? <laughs> Till Van Dillier's uh, had a word. Calma, I think calma. they're just going to maybe set a little bit of a tempo here. It'd be interesting if Groupama FD de, de, de Jure did put somewhere on the front uh, with Stefan Kuhn, Valentin Madouas, and uh, Lawrence Pithy. They've got a great team here. Groupama FTG have got a very good classics team. Let's look at Movie Star as well. They seem keen yeah. to, to, to contribute. And pff, yes, I know they're much improved in the classics. Wow. I, I'd be surprised if anybody today, whoever you were, would want to help help us in the Kerning. I, I, I don't understand why you would want to do that. Yeah, it's. I mean, <laughs> uh, we'll see. I mean. The gap's at four minutes, and you've just got Axel Laurence moving through to the front. Uh, I do think it's going to be Sylvain Dillier now who's going to ride this one. Um, but the thing is, that the other teams want to win this bike race. They, they can't just let Sylvain Dillier ride it all the way in. So I, d I do think they'll get a little bit of a hand, but I think 
the vast majority, the bulk of the heavy lifting for the next 100 kilometers or so, or for the next 70 k's or so, will be on the shoulders of the Swiss rider, by the looks of it. We might, eat, I'm wondering if they'll use, I mean, Tim de Klerk, we know what he's like. You can't, I mean, Tim de Klerk is, is a versatile rider, but he's also got one, generally one job, and that's pulling on the bunch. So wondering if he'll move up a little bit, or will he um, be used a little bit later, mm. just on the approach to those climbs. So he's got that, re he's got that big top end as well. It will be interesting to see when uh, the big teams use their big power riders, because there's certain riders that aren't as effective over the climbs. You know, it's um, a little bit deeper in, so you want to make sure you've used your resources at the right now time then. as well. Now then. As Van Leerberger has it's a, a bike change uh, for Van Leerberger. And what we saw quite a bit earlier on of slow-mo replays of the back at that bike, I just wonder if there was an issue for Van Leerberger uh, that he wasn't happy about. He wanted to get changed once things were established. Or whether I'm just trying to help him no. out there by saying Yeah, that. yeah, it could be. It certainly could be. He's back on pretty quickly. He'll drop back to the team car. He's got no bead-ons on. He's got his head unit on. I don't actually think they'll uh, ease up because he was sat on for a bit. They, <laughs> might, uh, it, but they might say, right, you're going to do a bit of hard work now getting on. But he'll um, make easy work of this. He'll be on in a minute or so. And this long straight section drops in behind the, the dirty air behind the team car. And I tell you what, if you've never ridden behind a car before, it makes so much difference. It's like the, the, all the pressure's been taken off. It's so much easier uh, to sit in that slipstream. Especially in a headwind like, section. Especially <laughs> in a headwind section. It's almost like you actually have to back off and brake. So when you've picked up pace and you're, you're on the, the back of a team car, you, you have to quite often feather the brakes because it is so, so efficient. You're essentially riding in a vacuum. That, that's what it's like. There's no pressure at all. Um, or zero, yeah, zero pressure. And once you move into the wind, it's a lot harder. So, yep, he's back on. Bike change done. We might actually see a further bike change. Quite often, riders like to stay on the bike number one. It could be that it's just an issue that can be repaired or changed. And then back onto bike number one with the, uh, the transponder and the number. You wonder as well whether Bertrand Leeberger has his own spare bike on the top of the car too, because he's not one of the leaders, is he? Exactly, exactly or they generally will have a, I mean, yeah, they won't, his bike might have actually been on the inside as well. Generally, the leaders, their, their bikes are on the outside of the vehicle. Um, it's taken a little bit longer. No, you're quite right. The, the, the layup of the team cars is determined by your leaders, especially in the change, a stage race, that can chop and change. Um, and what you'll see on, on the headrest at the, so the, the mechanic will sit behind the DS on the back seat and have his toolbox to his left and there'll be a, a front and a, and a rear wheel. And there'll also be a little map of where the bikes are, and that will determine. So as soon as he jumps out of the car, he's not thinking, oh, where's so-and-so's bike? He knows exactly where it is. Because as we know, it takes a little bit longer now to just change a wheel yes. because of the through axles. So you want to make it as efficient as possible. So every single car will have a little, quite often hand-drawn map of where the respective riders' bikes are. So as soon as they're out of the car, they're, they're bang on efficient and can get the bike off nice and quickly. You're watching the Ronde van Vlaanderen. 216 kilometers remain. The gap is growing to four minutes now, and eight riders are up the road. They are Bert van Leeberger of Sudal Quickstep, David Derke, who represents Arkea BMW Hotels, Stanisław Anjolkowski. He's there for Kofidis. Damien Touzé represents Decathlon AG de Zer La Mondiale. Two riders are there from Jaco Alula. They are Luke Durbridge and Elmar Reinders. Durbridge is the biggest name in the breakaway. We look back to the French champion Valentin Madouas. And of course, completing the breakaway, Lionel Tamignot and Jelle Vermota. Vermota, a Belgian, one of three Belgians in the break. He today makes his monument debut. And well, looking at Madouas, we wonder whether he has the same sort of form that saw him on the podium two years ago. Coming into Opwerk. And into the Flemish Bramont province.
Matej Mohoric. Settling in, getting going. All smiles for now. Fred Wright alongside him. A couple of jerseys on. And Bahrain victorious, not achieving their set aim to get somebody in the break, but they certainly made it a little harder for Alpacinda Koenig than it otherwise would have been. It looks as though with 215 kilometres to go into Opwek, we have a gap of four minutes. And I think, Matt Stevens, that is the gap that Alpacinda Koenig have decided on that is going to be given to the breakaway today. Yeah, you wouldn't really want to give them any more. It makes it a lot harder a little bit later on. Um, but right now, I think you are right. And as you can see, these riders now have settled into rhythm that they know they can sustain. So a real contrast to what we saw earlier on. For the first 45 minutes, all of our breakaway, save for Bert van Leerberger, we keep uh, singling him out, don't we? Um, had to ride really hard. Um, it would have been th uh, pretty much just over threshold, threshold efforts on the front. Uh, hard to get back onto the wheel as they built that lead. And because of the activity behind, it meant that that first 45 minutes of racing were very hard. There'd have been um, a big calorific expenditure, a lot of reserves dug into. So right now, uh, it's about fueling properly um, and settling into a rhythm they know that they can sustain. Because look at that, top left of your screen, there's the chequered flag, but 214 kilometers still to go. I've already had well over an hour of racing. So this is all about measurement of effort. Uh, they're going to try and stay out in front as long as they can. Um, they're all very, very capable riders. Uh, but now it is the job of the team of the pre-race favorite, the outstanding favorite, Mathieu van der Poel. But he's got some assistance there from the men in blue, Groupama FDG. And that's very, very interesting. I think we've seen that. Uh, when you think about the last few years, about all the classics, and, and because Stefan Kung has been a, um, a rider that we've admired over the last couple of years, so, so, so capable, but to see them move through to the front at such an early stage is an interesting one. Sixth in this race last year. And the team for Group Armour, while we're at it, as we look at Tim Mudlier, just moving through to the back, looks pretty comfortable. Probably going to uh, take off his jacket as the sun continues to shine here in Belgium. You've got Louis Aski, sven Eric Bistrom, Olivier Ligac, Valentin Madouas, Fabian Leinhardt, and uh, Lawrence Pitti. That's the Group Armour FD shirt lineup. And there we go. Hands in his uh, jacket. Doesn't have to go all the way back to the team car. And into one of the race officials. But uh, here we go. Group Armour FD shirt. And it says to me that they're, they're protagonists. They're, they're going to. <laughs> there we go. He's already said, you're right, you're going to do it on your own then, mate. Well, they're really setting out with yeah. one of the strongest teams they've lined up in the last few years. There's Madouas we talked about, there's Kung and Lawrence Pithy. Yeah, now, there he is. Kiwi rider there, right in the centre of your picture. He was up in the shake-up last Sunday for victory in Kent Wevelkem. Just ran out of gas to keep up with Van der Poel and company in the end. Of course, it's... Uh, just being worked out as to where everyone's going to sit. It's laughing and jokey at the minute still, but... Pithy, we know he's good. He showed it in Paris Nice. He led the race. He was in the points classification. He was up there on stages. Yep. Is he good enough at 21 years of age to be up there in a race like this at monument distance? I'd like him to prove me wrong, but I, based on what I've seen, I think he, I think he's got the. The, the real potential, and certainly what he has got, he's got that. Sh he's, he's, he's very, very punchy. But I think what he's got to work on, and it's quite clear from what we've seen so far, and I've no doubt he would probably admit this because it's been evident on the road. He's made those early selections, but then what he can't quite seem to do just yet, and hasn't quite got the endurance for sort of over 200 k's. That's where he starts to fade. But saying that, when you when you look at the the groups that he's been in, it's generally been the likes of Wout van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel that stuck the sword in. So it's not as if, if he's been in a break of normal riders. You know, he's always been, been in a break of riders that are far superior. So potentially we haven't seen him being able to bed in properly because he's been so active. And again, Mads Pedersen as well. It was Pedersen that rode him off the other day in Gent Vable, can remember, and almost rode van der Poel off his wheel. So maybe we're doing Pithy a little bit of a disservice. But I do think, for the first phase of the climbs, I do think we'll see him at or near the head of affairs. He can clearly 
handle his bike well, he can ride in stressful situations, he's got that punch for these climbs, but it'll be interesting to see how deep he can get into this race and whether he'll be used as more of a lieutenant for Stefan Kung, who is more than able to cope with the distances here. He's proven. And, that, and if, if Kung were to win this race, you'd be pleased for him, but you wouldn't be overly surprised. It wouldn't be a surprise win from Stefan Kung taking Flanders. You can almost see it being part of his dream Palmares in the future. So, but I think, yeah, I think Pitti's got great potential. More to come, by no means the finished article, but a rider of great capacity but has been in difficult situations this year, which quite possibly isn't a true reflection on how good he is, if you know what I mean. Two 10Ks to go, just through Baradekim, home of Gil Gelders of Sudal Quickstep. I'm reliably informed, got some very good ears to the ground, haven't we, that he would have loved to have ridden this race today. Every Belgian loves to ride the Ronde. But he's very busy supporting a certain Remco Evenepoel and a Mr. Mikel Lander over in what they call in these parts the Ronde van Baskenland, <laughs> which, of course, is the tour of the Basque Country, eh, Julia, or the Vuelta al País Basque. It's the race with more names, I think, than, than I've ever had hot dinners. There's a great bit of social media content, isn't there? No, you, you, you commented it on it on a, a Mika Lander and uh, Sudal Quickstep Instagram. It's really nice, actually. Um, some good shots of him in his, uh, on his home climbs. It's really worth checking it out and having a little bit of a look because he's had some great results this year, Mika Lander. I think it's fair to say it was a bit of a kind of a left field signing, really, wasn't mm. it? But it does actually make a lot of sense. And Lander has really fitted into the team really well. He's clearly in great form. Um, and will be very important as we head into the Tour de France for Remco Evenepoel. That's without a shadow of a doubt. It's great to see Mikel Lander happy, enjoying himself and getting some great results too. If you'd have mentioned Mikel Lander signing for Sudal Quickstep three or four seasons ago, you'd have been thinking, hang on yeah. a minute, is he going to be riding Le Saint-Main and uh, Noka de Cursa on a Wednesday afternoon? Is he going to be lining up at Skel de Presse or racing Paris-Roubaix? The cobble munching team from West Flanders? No, they're a grand tour chasing team now, as we see the monument chasing squad of Alpacin de Koenig at the front. And soon our quick step moving up one of their new signings into the second wheel. That is Gianni Moscon, the Italian rider formerly of several other teams recently. Yeah, interesting they put a rider up there. He certainly won't be riding, of course, with a teammate up in the move, but just sat on the wheel. It's rather like we saw at San Remo, this, isn't it? And you suggested this might be yeah. the case. Yeah. We're seeing Dillier and nobody else. Yeah, and Dillier's got a hard job to do, but he can, he's more than capable of doing this. Remember, his finish line is at a completely different place. Actually, far earlier in the race than actually the breakaway riders. So the breakaway riders have got the opportunity to recover as they roll through, but constantly thinking ahead. Um, chances of victory slim, but... They're at the sharp end of the Tour of Flanders, the Ronde. I mean, they're going to be carried on the crest of a wave up the Quaramonts. Like, I mean, just to be in the front in a race like this, you should never diminish that. You talk about the early break, and it's, they're easy to forget, but it's enormously significant to be a part, um, part and parcel of the, an important part of a race like this at the very sharp end. Clearly, there's a job to do strategically for the teams, meaning your leaders can actually sit back. But imagine the feeling of these riders. You know, they're in the red, but then they head onto those iconic climbs and they're, and they're carried along by the euphoria of the, of the, of the Flandrian crowd. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be a day that they will not forget. I might sound cliche, but we know that the Tour of Flanders is more than a bike race, don't we? Yeah, of course. What it means to people here. It's wonderful. You and I got in a taxi this morning, travelling from Ghent to where we were staying, just about half an hour up the road, and the first thing we heard as soon as the driver flicked on the radio, it's the Ronde van Vlaanderen today. Everybody's talking about it. Exactly. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, whatever job you do. Everybody loves the Ronde van Vlaanderen in this part of the world. The eight riders here, as Matt Stevens was just saying, can now say they've been in a Tour of Flanders breakaway. There's some quality names here. Luke Durbridge, once upon a time, was a name who'd be up there amongst the second and third tier favourites to win the Ronde van Vlaanderen. He settled into more of a helper's role in the last few years. 32 now, the man 
from Australia. He's a, an experienced cobbled racer. They'll be hoping to try and be up there for as long as possible. And depending on what happens, may be of some assistance to Michael Matthews. Oh, exactly. And they'll want to try and go as deep into this race as they can, keep this breakaway going. It, this, this, this ride now, although Reinders is doing a big turn on the front, they're keeping that pace nice and high. What they'll be thinking about, as you quite rightly said, is assistance for Matthews later on. Because Matthews actually looked good the other day in Dois d'Or. He was a little bit late, didn't quite get in that move. And the form that he's shown in Milan San Remo, um, coming back to the team that he's had a lot of his success in. It's been a couple of years with this team now, but um, it's great to see Matthews in, in good form. So never rule him out. He's, he's got a rider with a lot of punch and get over the climbs more than a lot of the sprinters. Um, and uh, they've clearly come onto this, come into this race with real focus. And I'll uh, repeat it again, it's so hard to get in these early moves, as we saw how active the peloton was. But to get two in that break of eight, that's significant. It just shows that that team are fully focused and all behind Michael Matthews. Into Alst, Belgium's premier carnival city. And as we saw from the big mannequins earlier on, carnival is a big thing in this part of the world. Known as a rebellious city as well, I'm told. They like to be creative around here. And well, Kofidis, they've not got a great rep uh, reputation, have they? Or particular history in this race. Nick Noy is the last man to finish on the podium for them in this particular race. And I was reading earlier, I'm just going to check it now. Kofidis, we talked about them not winning a race at all in 2024. Here's one for you, Matt. I was doing my own work this week. You'd be pleased to know. Good stuff. Kofidis have not won a monument for a quarter of a century. Was it 25 Van years. Oh, yes, the yeah. late Frank von Umbrucker won Liège in 1999. Oof. The squad hasn't won a top-level one-day World Tour race, just a World Tour race, not a monument, for almost two decades. Wow. The last of those came in Hamburg in 2004, through Stuart O'Grady. If you add into that, Nicole Matin's success in Pluie in 2001, there you have it. Just two World Tour one-day wins for the famous French squad since the turn of the millennium. I mean, I find that mind-blowing for a team that have had money and big-name riders I know it's been different in the last 10 years and cycling has changed and, and at times overtook them, but you've got about one of the legendary teams in French cycling. It is. I mean, it's... I mean, I mean they had a good tour, though, didn't they? <laughs> I mean, Last year, they had I a mean, tremendous I mean, tour. I mean, that was, I mean, that was an enormous dry spell, so um, credit where it's due, but you're quite right. In, in the single-day races, they just haven't figured at all. It was a basically a different era, a completely different generation that you're talking about. So there is a generational gulf... Um, in their, in their achievements in single-day races. Um, it's a strange one, isn't it? Because, I mean, they're, they're a sponsor, one of the longest-serving sponsors in, in, in world cycling, along along with FDG as well, and obviously the, the Movistar setup, although it's a different um, a different team, a different sponsor, although it's the same establishment, it's the same infrastructure. Uh, but Cofidis have been around for a very, very long time. Oh, take a look at that. That's the Belfry and Alst. A real eye-catching monument there in the Grote Markt, the main square. And the old alderman's house with the Belfry Tower. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Monument, that. Been protected since 1999, since the late Frank von der Brucke took that uh, particular monument in Liège for Kofidis. Amazing though it is, it's still functional, not just a pretty building to look at. The monthly council meeting is still held in that building, believe it or not. That's beautiful, isn't it? Also been a prison down the years. Jan de Licht awaited his sentence down there. And they plan on increasing visitors, actually. At the minute, it's, I think it's every third Sunday of the month you can go in and visit for free. But in just under two years' time, so January 2026, it's going to be open daily. Tourism will be booming in Alst. What a beautiful <laughs> building that is. It is lovely. Here's the man in the rainbow bands. Mathieu Fontepoul and his band of merry men from Alpacinda Koenig. 
led by Sylvain Dillier and the former Swiss champion Roubaix podium finisher out there at the front and making sure that the gap doesn't go too big. And well, from history, we go to Utopia in Alst. They call this the living room of the residents of Alst. The library's there. And, of course, the Academy of Performing Arts as well. Talked about Alts being a rebellious and creative city. I imagine that's the, the heart of the operation down there. Looks like it. And the heart of the operation here is this man on the front. Dillier looking good. He's pretty much riding at exactly the same speed. It's hardly fluctuated at all. A second here, a second there, plus or minus. But uh, this is what this man is capable of doing. He hasn't needed any assistance from any of his teammates. He might get it a little bit later, but right now they'll use this man for as long as he can. We talk about the depth, you know, that the fact that Alpes and Iconic don't have as many op race winning options. They don't. But what the, he's, well, they don't have race winning options. You could argue that riders that provide shelter, provide assistance, shut gaps down are equally as important. It is all about one man, but he cannot do it on his own, that's for sure. But right now, I think Alps and De Koenig would be pretty happy with this situation. And also, Rob, they have gone into this race knowing once the break has established itself, all eyes will be on them. And also, rather than sit back and, and look for other teams, like, yeah, we're happy to do that. So, but just to, to be expected to do something and then step up and duly do it is also, it's, it's almost a, it's a really interesting riposte. It's also a show of strength. So, uh, OK, they've got pressure on them, but they're actually used to doing it as well. Um, and now the race is, and they'd have been pretty happy that it took quite a while for the break to establish itself as well, because that's bought them a few free kilometers, mm. a little bit of extra time just to sit in the wheels, a bit extra, another 10, 15 Ks that Dillier can go deeper into the race as well. So all of those, so that's why they weren't really getting involved in the moves, shutting a few things down, saving energy. But right now they've got the entire team on the front. Van der Poel sat fifth or sixth wheel there, not sat back further. Again, just to show. Oh dear! Oh, we've got oh a dear! Crossing? Oh, they might see each other again. This looks like a level crossing, and there's an opportunity. Yeah, it looks like a level crossing for a comfort break. It's a shame this for the break in terms of what might happen now to their rhythm, because yeah. of course you know you, it's very different once you stop. And people might be glad of a little stop, but when you get going again, it takes its time. In terms of the time, you can expect really if they're stopped, the peloton to be held up for the same amount of time. It's going to be roughly four minutes, four fifteen. But we will see. We will see, because if they don't have to wait, now it's opening up here. So things will get going quickly, but what happens behind? Do they? St it's not that easy to stop the peloton behind it's here, and I have a feeling they might not do. You know? I don't think they will. Uh, I, I don't think they're going to slow the peloton down. I think if they, if they were stopped for a long time and the peloton caught them, they'd, or the race was neutralised, I think this might be counted as just a racing incident. Mm. Um, and also, if the if the bridge if it goes down again. <laughs> I think the break aren't stopped. They can actually build that lead as well. It's an interesting rule. Um, so I don't think there's going to be another train in the next couple of minutes, that's for sure. But they would have lost nearly a minute there. Well, they like the trains to run on time here. They do. I was hearing a story yesterday that there was a parliamentary question asked in the Belgian federal parliament because the average delay went over, wait for it, 1 minute 20. Flipping neck. It caused havoc. Can that can that can that person come and work in the <laughs> in the UK? <laughs> no, well, it was great. I, I got the Eurostar over yesterday, bang on time, uh, and I got a train from uh, Brussels Midi into Ghent, bang on time. And last year it was exactly the same. I do love the trains here as well, the double decker trains. Second class feels like it's posh, class. aren't they? Yeah, oh. really posh. Um, it's like we're on a space shuttle. <laughs> yeah. Big fan of the Belgian train system. Very efficient. And we'll probably be using that a little bit later on after a couple of beers in Aldenada. Oh, we will Bastion. be soaking up the atmosphere in the Zentrum oh, yeah. Ronde of Vlaanderen oh, this evening. Totally, totally. Go to Markt here in Aldenada, which is a beautiful city. By the way, if you've been thinking of coming to Belgium, riding your bike, do it because it is a wonderful country to visit. Everybody's very friendly, certainly towards people on bikes. 
There's great cycling infrastructure. And I know in racing sometimes we talk about it as a hindrance because you've got people moving on off the road, haven't you, and jumping in and out of bike lanes and things like that. But for the everyday rider, it is absolutely glorious. And it's, it is. So much to do as well, isn't there? Yeah, it's, um, there's so much history here. I mean, uh, if you're into your culture, if you're into um, your medieval history, I mean, there's a ridiculous amount of history here, the art, a uh, lot of interesting museums, um, places of interest. But, as you were saying, Rob, if you like riding your bike, um, and of course you want to go to the Dolomites, of course you want to go to the Alps, you want to go to Tuscany, you want to go into Spain, but, but you know, the real, the real heart of cycling is here in Flanders, and this is why it is the biggest one-day race in the world. This is why it is so celebrated. This is why it's so revered. This is why riders want this race on their Palmares, and this is why this race is the race it is. It is a race of the people. Um, and, yeah, I echo your sentiments, Rob. Get yourself over, especially if you're in the UK or nearby. And it's, not, it's a pretty easy place to get to. And actually, even if you're listening over in Australia or in the States, you've got to come over at some point in your life, save up, come over, you will not regret it. The Belgian people are wonderful, they're warm, and there's nothing quite like the farm roads. You can ride over exactly the same climbs as these riders, you can feel what it's like. You can uh, get a sense for what the cobbles is like as well, because you watch it on the TV, you can only imagine it, but until you ride it on your bike, then you'll really know what these riders are going through. Um, so yeah, come to Belgium. Here's the answer to the question we posed a moment ago. Whilst we can get through Alst Station, we will get through Alst Station, and the breakaway, well, they'll have to put up with having lost a little bit of time there. Across the tracks we go, and it's all aboard the Sylvain Dillier train. And it sounds as though it's 3.35. And we've passed a milestone just under 200 kilometers to go. Matt Stevens having a very deserved little bit of sustenance. He's gone back to the team car for his first sandwich of the day. They weren't stolen from breakfast, I promise. Hold my hand up to maybe doing that too. It tastes very nice though. 3.36 you can see. I hope nobody from the Norvotel Ghent Centrum is listening. Lovely breakfast, though, by the way, if you are. Wasn't really in the mood for it this morning. So I've done a Van Grand down there. Famous around the world already to a lot of you. He's been a world champion on the track. He's making his monument debut today. The man who was born in the Indian Ocean. He's French nationality, but he's from La Réunion. Looking down at the uh, Brule plan there in Haltert. That, of course, is the site of the Walput. Got a big natural pond that used to exist there until 100 years ago. It's the sort of meeting place for everybody living around the area. But after World War I, it was neglected and they had to close it. There used to be a little fairground race there that finished as well, so plenty of history in Altert. And here we are. They've come out to have a look as well. Two years ago, the race passed through here for the first time in a long time. Cycling is massive in this part of the world, and particularly in Haltert itself, a lot of local events around the route. And plenty going on today to watch the Ronde. There's going to be different activities on throughout the day. 12 different public celebration zones in the Ronde itself, in Haltert to watch the Ronde. And that, despite it being a coldish day. Sun's been out, 
just starting to cloud over a bit as we get our second Easter Bunny of the day. Not quite as well maintained this time. The last one had a cape on and everything on the bike. See any more, we'll have to start giving votes out of 10 for the best Easter Bunny. Up to this breakaway then. Let's run you through a few of the names who are up there, eh? And give them their dues as we see the flag demonstration. As, uh, this is one of the many activities as Haltert welcome back to the Ronde. But yeah, we saw Lionel Tamigno there. He races for a team that has been decimated, really, with injuries and problems and a lack of success in these races. For years, they've been coming here, trying to repeat the results of yesteryear, but Tamigno is there to do that, and at least he's representing them in the breakaway today. The last time a rider from Lotto Destiny won the round of Vlaanderen, it was 21 years ago, Peter van Peterkem winning for the team that was Lotto Domo at the time. They got the news this week that Arnold de Lee, their star, is out of the cobbled spring and he's been diagnosed with Lyme disease. So get well soon to Arnold de Lee. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's a big shame. So, uh, yeah, a speedy recovery. Such a talent, that lad. Some of his results last year, I mean, just kept getting better and better, didn't he? But uh, hope to see him back in the spring in 2025. Still be a young man, of course. His uh, brother's uh, running for the under-23 development team. Was racing yesterday over in, uh, in the Netherlands. And there's another one of those stats of Mathieu van der Poel's quite magnificent record, incredible record. Matched only by the line of Flanders himself, Johan Museo. Yeah, worst ever result, the fourth place. It was on his debut. Yep. It's been first or second since then for Mathieu van der Poel and just his sixth appearance in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. It's 29 now. Like I said, in recent years, he generally gets to the line to contest the race. Because last year he didn't get to the line because Pogaccio won solo, even though van der Poel did finish second. But from that position where he's two up to contest the race, he's one, two, lost one. Yes, yeah, Kaspar Asgrin, wasn't it? Started that long sprint <clears throat> a couple of years ago. Back in 20, 2021, wasn't it, when Asgrin won it? Asgrin had a tremendous year, didn't he? Doubled up, didn't he? Won he, he won a three that year as well, didn't he, Kaspar? Well, this is the Alderts of Bellamont. One of the most famous town cries around. He's been up there in the Belgian Championships, and his father, believe it or not, Matt, was the world, European and Belgian champion town crier. I love that. <laughs> I love stuff like that. Has he been the world champion town crier? Do you get a rainbow tunic? I know, I, I don't know. Or rainbow uh, belt ring, maybe? Yeah, maybe one of those rainbow... God, what do they wear on the ne big necklace thing? Oh, ah, the what sort of thing them? that the mayors wear back yeah, in... Yeah, I, I don't know what they actually call it, but sort of a necklace. Very posh, heavy attire, I imagine. Mm. There's that bunny on the left. I thought Lionel Tamigno a minute ago was going to go, go and ask for an Easter egg. <laughs> drifted onto the other side of the road, drifted back. Um, eggless, ultimately. He's probably burnt enough calories to deserve more oh, than the, the, the three or four of them that we've got in front of us that we might eat during the day. I know, I'm, I'm just wondering when to start tucking into my eggs. I think I think I might celebrate the Alder Quadamont with an egg. And then each ascent up the Quadamont, I'm going to bang another egg down. What do you reckon? You're still, still gonna have it, you're still going to have enough I'm left. Still, I still have a few and an left. Easter bunny. But then I'll have maybe, and then finally, maybe... Paterberg as well with 13.2 k to go. That will get me over the top of that. A quad, a, a quad on and then Paterberg egg. Who's going to commentate? I well, while you're I've eating. only got three k's, haven't I? So no, I think I'm definitely going to do one each time up the quad and then maybe one for the finish line, and then I'll have and maybe you know I'll have one tonight in the hotel. But, um... Well, there is a race on at least, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I promise. We're just betting ourselves in, aren't we? It is Easter. It is the Tour of Flanders. We've still got 198 k's to go. And the breaker holding steady, 335. Good job being done by Dillier. As you say, the Dillier Express. 
hasn't even looked round, hasn't even asked for any assistance at all. But he's a man that would have come into this knowing exactly what he was going to be going to be doing. So it's no stress at all. Ready to take on that responsibility. Oh, we talked about Tamino is at the front. And at the back here is Ani Olkowski. Rides for Kofidis. He's a Polish rider. Solid rider. He's quite a good sprinter, isn't he? Fast finisher, yeah. He's been national champion already. Of course, a new signing this year, 26 years of age. Arrived from Human Powered Health. That's the American outfit. Closed the doors of its men program last year. And looking here at Bert von Leerberger. This is his best result in cobbled races, that fourth position in uh, Nokurukusa a couple of years ago. Leading out the then winner, Tim Medlier. <laughs> Medlier's won that three years on the bounce now. His local race, by the way, Tim Medlier. And from West Flanders, I think he comes from around six k's away from Nokura. So a bonus for the chasers then, that level crossing incident. Yeah, definitely. I don't think it'll have a massive effect on the race itself. Quite interesting to see that. And then interesting rules around it as well. I, I'm not going to pretend that I can quote the rule book, um, but uh, generally speaking, if they'd all come back together again, they would have been given their the lead back. But I think that is a rule that is there's the, there's a dis that can be used discretionary as well. If the race is neutralised, then you have to give the break back, the gap that they had. But I think if it's a zebra, if it's a crossing of some sort, discretion can be used. And on that occasion, obviously it was the break that actually lost 30, 40 seconds, and the bunch that benefited. Well, talking coffee this, this is the home of Emmet de Kent into Denderoldum. Now welcoming everybody with their flags, caps, and the big VIP tent behind that they'll be tucking into some delights. This man might be able to enjoy a few delights and watch the end of the race because you get the feeling that Sylvain Dillier's finish line is going to be quite a little bit earlier today. Yeah, definitely. I don't think it will take it too far into the, the climbs, but definitely on the front for probably another hour or so I think there's no need for anybody else no other team needs to deploy a resource right now because he's doing a very good job he's not taking any time off the lead but they're not conceding any either he's doing it's exactly what he needs to do and that's just hold it because once we do head in even on the approach to the the Quadamont with 134 cases ago we've still got a couple of sections of pave before that the Padestrat just before that, the Lippenhofer Strat, very close together, in fact. There will be a little bit of, there'll be some shenanigans there, there'll be, the, there'll be some positioning, and that'll be then the pattern of the race because there's not a lot of gaps between the Pavi sections and the climbs, they come thick and fast. And as you were saying, Robert, the top 17 climbs, the first, of course, the Quadamont, the last climb with only 13.2 k to go, the Paterberg, but not a lot of opportunity to rest. Throw in the mix, the multiple change of directions, you know, it's such a technical, stressful race. And this really is the calm before the storm, it really is. This is where riders can just settle in, focus, have the conversations they need to, make sure they're fueling. Um, but already, the chase behind, or sorry, the pattern behind, you can see you've got Alperson de Koenig and just sat behind them, little trek. So the team of uh, the second fav favourite, I think, Mads Pedersen. It will be interesting to see how he has recovered, if at all, <clears throat> from um, the crash it was only on Wednesday, it's not that long ago at all. It can take a while for bruising to come out, but of course, if he wasn't right, he wouldn't be here. If there was any risk to his, to his health or, or injury, he wouldn't be here. But uh, only time will tell, we'll know in the next couple of hours. Yeah, we'll see. Pedersen was talking about having the bed sheets stuck to him with grazes wounds it's the sleep that he mm. won't have, have had as well it's the recovery tell me well. about it yeah oh yeah sorry, <laughs> sorry. it is it's it's oh, well, we do we, we do talk about it but it, the injuries are one thing but then if you can't recover and it's twofold it's you, you can't recover from the training you can't recover from the races before but also you 
you, you can't recover. The wounds take longer to heal because you're not sleeping deeply. So there's, there's a lot of uh, negative impact factors that come about as a result of laying it down at speed like that, taking a lot of skin off. But one thing we do know is that Maz Pedersen is in fantastic form. Even shaving off one or two percentage points from the form of Pedersen at the moment, he's still a very, very dangerous rider. And um, just looking back at Gent Webelgum the other day, not just the victory where he relatively easily beat Van der Poel in the sprint. Let, let, let's, let's, lay it, let's be clear about this. It was a, he won it emphatically, but it was before that. It was, um, it was on the climb of the Kemmel that he, he impressed. But actually, when you really strip apart that race, it was the way that Little Trek uh, forced Van der Poel to work early. And they did a very, very good job. Not really in exposing a chink in his armor. It's just the fact they made him work. And Van der Poel's human. <laughs> you know, he, he's kind of superhuman. He's part cyborg, perhaps. But he's, you know, he's got a beating heart. You know, he's, he's not perfect. He's vulnerable. And there's only so many matches he's got. He's just got more than anybody else. He's shown on several occasions he's beatable. Yeah. Kispar Askren showed that a couple of years ago in the two-up sprint, as we see mechanical changes. That's the spare bike he's still on, by the way, that's just getting a little bit of uh, lubricant there. Yes, yeah, nothing like a squeaky chain. It, it, it could have been one of the other riders in the group. It could have been Demian Tussidoy. You're annoying me with it's a squeaky annoying. chain. Every yes. time you roll through, you, it looks like you've got a, a mouse living in your bottom bracket. So uh, get that lubricated, please. Uh, yeah, uh, a, a non-lubricated chain isn't much fun. Uh, and also, you know, the, the, these sorts of things can be measured these days. A lot of the mm -hmm. chains on the bikes of the riders now, they don't actually lubricate them as much unless it's wet. They'll just be waxed. You know, they have, they have a silicon layer on them now. There's, uh, there's so much tech in and around all the moving parts on a bike now. It's kind of mind-boggling, but there's... Um, and they can measure, apparently, the amount of watts that you save just by having a waxed chain, uh, where the water just beads off it, basically. Um, so I've never waxed a chain in my life. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know you, where to start. I was going to ask if you waxed. <laughs> well, no, I've never, I've never waxed. Old-fashioned shaving my legs, mate. Old-fashioned. I was asking about the chain. Oh. <laughs> I've never used a wax. I've never used a wax chain. Apparently, because there's quite a process, isn't there? I mean, it's kind of mind-boggling. Um, you see people sort of preparing these races. Especially time trialists. Yeah, exactly. People like that who think about every detail. Mm. The Victor Campanats of this world. Oh, no, totally. I think I saw a, a, vi a social media video of him waxing his chain like four days before a race or something like that. Well, you basically, you take the chain off and you, you de-ionise it first so it takes everything off it. So you, you basically create a negative electrical field over the chain. Oh, something like that, but you de-ionise the chain Why? and then and then you dip it in another solution where the the lubricant or, or the wax actually ad adheres to the chain far more efficiently once you've de-ionised it. So, yeah, I mean, you're looking at me bamboozled. I'm bamboozled. I've probably got the science wrong, but there's some pseudoscience in there. Um, look at it online, but it looks like it's more of a cooking programme where you put your chain in and you boil it. Um, you deionize it and then you dip it in the wax. There's a proper process to it. I mean, the only thing those vats should be used for in Flanders is cooking fruits, isn't it? Or, st yeah, or stew. Also, yeah. big, big shout, a big shout out to our friends at Cycling in Flanders and Visit Flanders as well. They've got one of the best social media campaigns out there, haven't they? With that fruits and stew gel that, that's available. I don't know where you can get it, but head to their website, watch the video. But big shout out to Cycling in Flanders. That, is one incredible little promo. They had one of the most traditional figures in Flemish cycling trying it the other day. Um, José de Cauer, who's one of our commentary colleagues on the Flemish broadcaster, the national broadcaster, he was trying an energy gel that tasted of Belgian meat stew and <laughs> fries. I mean... Apparently our friend Dries has got one, one or two of them for us in Udenada after the finish. Has he? So, um, yeah, yeah. You can have Are two you... if you want. <laughs> I'm not a story fan. But that, that, you know, that's, not a, that's not a reflection on the dish, the, the dish itself. Oh, no. That, that's a reflection on my fussy, poor eating nature. But, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll have one of your chocolate eggs and you can have the... I can have a... a, a you can have an extra story gel if you a, like. A, a meaty gel. Yeah, so, it's great. That's sort of... 
the idea of it sort of makes me think about like pet food or something like that. Yeah, the the, the, the idea of it, I'll be honest, is revolting. <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm willing to give it a try because because I love Belgium. And who doesn't? Uh, who doesn't? But 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 maybe a frite and Belgian stew gel is a step too far. But I tell you what, it's a brilliant one. Absolutely brilliant. So, yeah, head over to the Cycling Flanders website. Actually, for more reasons than just the gel, because it, if you do ever fancy coming over to Belgium, there's so many routes you can ride, and they've got so much on that website to, to help in relation to your trip to Belgium and, and, to, and to, to get the most of your time here as well. So head over. You might want to visit the St. Martinuskerk that we just saw, that church that had to be partly rebuilt. 1990, morning of April the 25th, the residents awoke to find that the whole bell tower had collapsed. And it was a really, really emotional thing because obviously everybody was in the village very attached to their local church. It had to be completely rebuilt. And a new church and tower built as well. 1996 it was completed. As we see the heroes of yesteryear. Well, it might be the Rande of Vlaanderen this week, but of course that man that you just saw. Fleming. Yes, it was <laughs> Monsieur Rogers of Vlaanderen. It was Mr. Paris Roubaix. Yes, of course the uh, Rande of Vlaanderen this week it is Paris Roubaix next week, and Roger de Vlaanderen of Roubaix and cyclocross fame as well. And still, talks a good game, talks himself up. Yeah, I. I... <laughs> I remember a couple of years ago an interview with him uh, in London. It was uh, it was a very animated and interesting interview he gave. But yeah, an absolute legend. It's actually, my my dad raced bikes back in the 1970s, and um, uh, he was my dad's big hero. So he's a rider that you really admired. But yeah, a uh, real icon. Quality, quality bike rider. One of the big names of the time. I think this is the radar site. So it looks, it looks I was reading looks through like the book yeah. earlier on. This has been in this area of Haltert since the 1950s. And it has something to do with the airport over the other side of Brussels and Saventem, the main national airport in Belgium. And this was the highest point in this region reached by these towers to transmit the signals when uh, it was part of the, the landing equipment all the way away was not the site of that of course for many years that radar site used to help this broadcast the VRT ah. the Flemish national broadcaster used to use it as an intermediate station to, to transmit the signals from the Tour of Flanders and the Tour of Flanders taken on by a Fransman not just any Fransman Frenchman the former world champion I tell you what it's either got very quickly warm, or Julien Alaphilippe is already ready for business. Yep, it certainly is warm. It's uh, definitely when it popped out a few minutes ago. It's actually relatively mild out there. A lot of riders happy to ride in short sleeves, including Julien Alaphilippe. That's an indication of that breeze that's currently blowing across them. Not affecting the race at all. A few more seconds taken back by the breakaway now. Up to three minutes and 50 seconds, give or take a second or two. It's Rinders taking the opposite way around that roundabout. Merging straight away with his compatriots. Rinders is a Dutchman. Rode a long, long time in sort of the second and third division before he was picked up as a lead-out man for Dylan Grunewegen. Racing in the Ronde van Vlaanderen today for the rest of the team. He's there with Durbridge. There are three Belgians in this breakaway today. One of them's got his hand up. Tamino. And we are now 46 kilometers away from the Alde Quaramont, our first climb of the day. Good ride for this man, and just looking back at his results earlier the year, eighth in Kurna. Really good result. But yeah, generally a very fast finisher, of course, Kurna. In opening weekend, the one for the sprinters, but that's a pretty decent result from him. Still one long line here. It's actually, you can just see that the the, uh, the flag there, the Flandrian flag, just blowing. The wind is 
It's reasonably strong today, but generally you get the, if you've ever stood at the side of the road and felt as a peloton goes by, it actually creates quite a lot of draft of its own. Um, quite often it does actually distort um, well, it can move flags around. It's quite amazing, this vortex that's created as it rushes by at high speed. A few big groups just off the back there. Having taken a nature break. But Dillier just locked and loaded. Not one glance around from the man from Switzerland. More than happy at doing this job. 33 years of age now from Aral. joined Alpacin Phoenix, as they were known then, back in 2021. Prior to that, three years with Ajutua Le Mondial, and then spent the vast majority of his career from 2013, riding with a BMC. And his biggest result, well, aside from a stage win in 2017 of the Giro d'Italia, was, of course, the runner-up spot in Paris-Roubaix to none other than Peter Sagan. He was the survivor, the sole surviving member of the break of the day. Super, super ride by Dillia then. Unsurprising. It's been utilised in the way that he is now. As the break continue to ride, nice little tempo being set now. As the kilometres tick by 101, 80, 181 kilometres to go. Not too long now until we hit the first of our cobbled sectors, the Cassian. The Liban Huestrat comes at 166.6 k to go, closely followed almost immediately, in fact, by the Padestrat at 165.2 k to go. So not much recovery. Then the next cobbled section after that comes pretty deep into the race. That's the Holoveg, that's at 114 k to go. There's a Demian Tuz. has a conversation with his director sportif. Gives the Gilet back in. Just see his teammate there, Edvard Bersenhagen, former Norwegian champion. And winner of Gent Bevelgum a few years back. A long time ago now, best part of a decade since the Norwegian took that race. Interesting signing for the French team. Spent the last few years with Total Energie before moving to Decathlon. They'll be looking after the likes of Oliver Narsen today, one would imagine. And they'll be happy to have a man in the break. As we look at another one of these uh, rather scary giant puppets, I'm not too sure if that's anything to do with the Fabian Cancellara fan club. I doubt it. Um, I'm sure some of you will get in contact in relation to the origins of that one, but certainly pulling a face. That's certainly a race face towards the back end, maybe similar to the face that some of the riders will be pulling up the Paterberg for the last time. My colleague Rob has uh, dropped back into the race convoy. He's gone back to the pastry wagon which just sits in front of the broom wagon, uh, dispensing all sorts of pastries. Um, was that a pan of chocolate you've got back from the pastry wagon? It is, but I was tempted to get in the broom wagon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it is a lovely warm day here in Aldenarda. I tell you what, I could have sat out there and just left you to it for an hour. It is very nice, warm. It? Really not what was forecast, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty mild, isn't it? And apparently, well, we did hear from earlier on that it was going to be a bit of rain this afternoon, but apparently, having spoken to somebody outside, um, it's going to be fine now. Mm -hmm. It's going to it's set fair for the rest of the day, so it's going to be a dry or dry-ish edition. Partly cloudy, isn't it? Yeah, there's a few little fluffy clouds, but nothing overly threatening, as you say, Rob. Sunny intervals, would you say? Yeah, dry with sunny intervals by the looks of it. We're getting our first abandonment of the race, and I have to say it has come as no surprise as to the identity of the rider. And whatever's not right with Miles Scott, and we hope gets right soon, because he's a former national champion of Australia. He's a mightily good bike rider, but yep. he's not going well at the minute. Miles Scottson has abandoned the Ronde de Vlaanderen. Yeah, it didn't look good early on, did he? Uh, never good, but as you say, is a classy, classy bike rider. We wish him all the best. And I've got a man in the move, though, David Decker. And also, look at the lineup of Arkea b, b hotels. Florian Seneschal, you know, a rider that <laughs> could do well over this sort of train. Hasn't really shown a great deal this season, but is a classy, classy rider. Of course, spent many years with Sulal Quickstep. Took some good, notable victories there, but has moved across to Arkea. 
the chin to Albanese, another interesting rider, actually. He's done really well this year, Albanese. And this, I think, is the first... It will be the first time, because it's the first time at World Tour. He's been riding with smaller Italian teams. But Albanese, I think, a really shrewd signing. He's certainly going to pick up a lot of points through his consistency. But I'll tell you what, wouldn't surprise me if Albanese finished top 20 today. Albanese was you know ninth what? in the dress rehearsal in the go, yeah. Ed Ripres. Classy rider. He's so versatile. He's, he's got a real punch at the finish. He can sprint really well. and uh, He can get over the climbs. Um, so I think uh, today, I can't see him winning this, but I'll tell you what, a solid performance will be a top 20 in Flanders. For, for watch out for Albanese. There are thereabouts just floating around. Um, he's a rider that's really hard to get rid of. We're 10 kilometres out from our first obstacle of the day. And that's the Lipperhoverstraat, the first of two cobbled sectors that come back to back almost. Lipperhoverstraat followed by the Parstraat. We've got Sylvain Delia at the front. And we just had Lidl Trek move up in the line. Just sitting close. A few other riders are starting to move up as well. Decathlon are there. Yep. There's Ed Turns just out on the wheel of Delia. Ugo Ull just behind, the tall, rangy figure of Ugo Ull. Yeah, looks like they're going to be deploying Tim de Klerk in a completely different capacity today, which should be interesting. Interesting for him as well. He couldn't get more uh, floundering than a nice windmill. It's blowing today. Yeah. By the mauler. Those of you fans of traditional windmill hills, yes, today we'll go to the Molenberg. It's a difficult 90 degree turn, a little bridge over the stream, and those rough cobbles. Yeah, the Molenberg, the fourth climb on the menu today that comes at uh, just under 100 k to go, 99.5, just after the Wolvenberg. And then they do come thick and fast, don't they? Just looking at the distances between those climbs, Rob, there's uh, especially the first phase. And then we've got a little bit of a rest, but yeah, once we head into the Hellingen themselves, it's uh, up and down all the way, isn't it? It's a completely different character of a race. And even when you look at the profile, this flat, gently under flat start, gently undulating midsection, and then this sawtooth profile, and then that flat run in from the top of the Paterberg, the last uh, 12, 13 k's, pretty flat. Just trying to get a sense of what direction the wind will be blowing as they head down this very long runway of a finish here, Rob. I think it might be a slight crosswind. We'll have to have a maybe a nip out later on to get some indication of that. But it's relatively still. I say it's relatively still. The trees are moving a little bit. Nip out if you want to bring some coffees back at some, some point. I will do. Sounds as though producer Derek has always got his ear to the ground. It may well be a slight tailwind. Slight tailwind, OK. Well, if we have a group coming to the finish, that's going to be significant. Mm. Something we, as commentators, it's really good to know. And we, and we, if we didn't know that, we'd soon see by the, the riders positioning themselves on the left or the right. Uh, and we saw that in that sprint a couple of years ago with Kaspar Asgren, didn't we? He, he, he forced... He went on the left-hand side, actually, didn't he? Mm. I think he did, yeah. So Van der Poel started the sprint and then... No, now Asgren started the sprint, didn't he? About 250 metres out, he was told by his DS, just go long. Just go long. And then, of course, there was a couple of years ago in Van der Poel won, uh, where they sprinted, didn't they? And that the break was just caught and it was Tadej Pogacar who was, was trapped in there with Dylan van Baal and that, wasn't he? And the Valentin Madua was in there as well, wasn't he? And that was due to the wind getting blocked in on the right-hand side. And we stood here earlier on the finishing line. You can see the Flamme Rouge right in the distance, almost at the vanishing point at the end of the road. It is a very long finishing straight, arrow straight. Difficult when you're on your knees after 270 kilometres of racing yep. and you try to hold off the chasers. A lot of cobbles and bergs to come before then. And the first of the cobbled sectors is now within the next nine kilometres away. And not quite moving into the next phase of the race yet. But things are about to step up a little notch. And Drieste Bont knows that, he's been around long enough. This time last year he was riding for the man who's the favourite today, Mathieu Fonapool. 
the Bont's a wily old rider. If he ever finds himself in a group out the front, we saw this in Dwarz of Vlander on Wednesday. Good ride, he is wasn't it? a dangerous, dangerous man, the former Belgian champion. Three minutes, 56 then. And this is Sylvain Dillier. When you were talking about Matt coming right across the road, left to right, and it's getting strong. Look at that Norwegian flag there. Yeah, it's, um, it is quite brisk now. But they keep on going primarily in this direction now. And they actually, on the first run into Aldenada, they, kept, they don't obviously go across the finishing line, but they come within almost touching distance of the finish before commencing um, this twisting and turning route which gives the Tour of Flanders its true identity up and down the 17 bergs and the other uncategorized climbs along the way as well. There's not much flat at all. But the, the tempo should build up, one would imagine, just for this first cobble sector as you were just talking about, the Lip and Hovestrad. But as we approach the Quadramont with 134 k's to go, there will be a definite build up there. It won't be just one rider chasing. There'll be a lot of positioning play, and you'll see this momentum from the peloton start to build. And that really is pretty strong, that win there, isn't it? It's a cross tail win now. Just see the, the, the lead group now moving pretty quickly. Eight riders at the front of the Ronde van Vlaanderen as we're approaching the first of the cobbled sectors. David Decker alongside Bert van Leeberger. Stanislav Anjokovski is there as well, as is Damien Touzé. Elmar Reinders and Luke Durbridge are the only two riders who are in the same team in today's breakaway. They're from Jaco Alula, a team from Australia. And then Tammy Newt of Lotto Destiny alongside Vermota of Bingo Wallonie Bruxelles. He's the rider Vermota on monument debut today. At the front in the luminous yellow jersey. And we've just been through Erzella, past its old castle. The ruins of the castle, actually. Big battleground back in the day between the Catholic Spaniards and then then Protestant Flemish ride uh, Flemish people. Fortress was destroyed to pieces back then, but it's being rebuilt since the 1960s. As we go up to David Decker, and well, not a great start to the season for him, given his talent. The Dutchman is from good cycling stock. Had a third place at the uh, Grand Prix Montserrat earlier on this year, so he's been good in Belgium so far. You see a few riders just starting to move into position. Cyrus Monk, just on the left-hand side in that silvery black of Q36.5, a rider who, uh, with a few abortive temps, are trying to get away, looking after his leader. I would imagine it's going to be... They've got an interesting mix of riders, but I'd imagine it would be the young Yannick Steimler who'd be their protected rider. In fact, say young, he's actually 27 years of age, the German. Already will win on the board this year. But Monk moving up on the left-hand side, as you can see. Dillier still there. Now, the shape of the bunch now has changed because we're approaching this cobbled sector now. Otherwise, they'd be straight they'd be left to, to, to Dillier, wouldn't it? So this is just positioning play. This isn't chasing. This is just about making sure you're in good position uh, and also setting the template for what's to come. This is just a mere hors d'oeuvre, really, but it does set things up. It's part of the discipline of riding as a unit. Um, and this is a theme that will uh, really come to play. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how they play this one out. But uh, good to see Q36.5 uh, taking things up here. Adrien Petit moving up through the centre. Adam Marché looking to keep their main man, Biniam, safe. Biniam Germay who did an altitude camp in Eritrea at home before coming to Flanders, where he's based in Lerva, not too far from Lerva. There's Steven de Jonk, sports director for Lidl Trek, in conversation with Jonathan Milan, skin suited up and ready to go. Yep, pretty much all the riders that I've seen. It, I think every rider in the breakaway I've noticed has got a speed suit or skin suit, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think there is a bit of a differential. Generally, if it's a skin suit if you're riding a TT, but they call it a speed suit if you're riding on if you're riding a road race. And they're slightly different. I mean, they've got like pop, yeah, pop access at the front, so you can pop to the loo. Different pocket, but there's so many different permutations. Of, but generally, it's all about going fast, being efficient. 
And if you're in a normal row jersey these days, you're at a slight disadvantage. So it's all about just smoothing that airflow. Actually, looking at uh, actually saying that, I think the Durbridge might be having a might have a road jersey or difficult to see. To be honest with you, but I think most have got these speed suits on. Keep your eye on this battle for position here now. First cobbled sector approaching the Lipperhover Strat is the first difficulty of the day. Yeah, Fran Milosevic on the front there, the Croatian leading through. First sighting of Matteo Jorgensen as well. He's up there on the wheel of his teammate, just being looked after by Eduardo Affini there. Yeah. And, uh, coming into this first cobbled sector, John Digg and Corbett Piers on the right hand side yeah. as well. Is this because they just want to stay out of any trouble? Yeah, totally. This isn't about race winning moves. It's just that, you know, you could get caught out of position. And uh, again, it's just about getting the mind in the right place as well. Uh, Affini, so, so strong. You know, just about make it. I mean, imagine looking at this. I think Afini's job is to look after for, to uh, look after Jorgensen until they hit the climbs, basically. Or even over some of these climbs, Afini be fine. But deeper and deeper into the race, one would imagine where Afini will uh, drop away a little bit. But right now, that is the instruction. Look at this. Several riders actually sprinting to get into position, but Afini just making sure he's looking after Jorgensen here. And interesting, no other riders from Team at Visma Lisa Bike around, but Jorgensen. Um, looking at their lineup, although they've got depth, they've got the likes of Tish Banut, 13th in this race last year. Jorgensen himself was actually ninth, just inside the top 10. Dylan van Baal, a little bit of an unknown, but for me, really, it's all about Jorgensen. Um, Tish Banut, and a strong second, but it's more about Jorgensen, Jorgensen, shall I say. Um, so, yeah, just making sure he's in a good position, not taking any chances. And we've seen how finely balanced bike racing is with that crash the other day in Dwarves Door, Flandre, you know. So if you can mitigate and minimise any chance of getting involved or caught behind a crash, you're going to do it. And you're going to use a big guy um, like uh, Athene to put you in the right place. Matteo Jorgensen winning Dwarves Door, Flandre and becoming the first American rider to do so. There's never been an American man on the podium in the Tour of Flanders. George Hincapi was the best in fourth place. Coram Rivera, of course, Den Rivera, now Labecki, has won the women's edition for the United States. The first American man yet to be on the podium in the Tour of Flanders. Jorgensen, the biggest favourite to do so for a while. Yeah, he's an exciting rider, Jorgensen. As you say, very likeable character, really down to earth, very sharp, a real pin sharp intellect. And if you look at the way, you look back at Paris Nice and the way he won that, but it was the tactical play as well. You know, he just rode it. He was super, super strong, but very smart. And that as a combination is dangerous. But it's his versatility that I think well, over the next few years we'll see him emerge as, as a really big rider. And I, I think he should be a leader in a Grand Tour, I really do. But uh, okay, back back to the classics. But again, great to see. What an interesting program as well. Paris Nice, yeah. the Cobble Classics, and then the Tour. I love that program. Into Zottigem, and approaching the Flemish Arden. Zottigem is home to the Lippovstraat, just outside of town. The Flemish flag flies, and the peloton of riders makes its way through town. That's the uh, Egmont statue. Old Zottegem Town Hall there of Count Egmont and his family. I won't explain what fate befell Count Egmont and his wife. It wasn't a particularly nice one. On to the cobbles for the first time in this run of Vlaanderen. The Kaseya Mac and the course cobbles make the race, and they certainly do in this most special of events. First of seven cobbled sectors plus the 17 climbs. We've started now, Matt. We certainly have. This is it. Just a taster, just to get these riders warmed up of what's to come. Now, although we've actually got seven sectors of pavé, of course, there's far more sectors of pavé just uphill. So some of the climbs uh, don't have pavé on. A lot of them do, but this is one of the, uh, the seven specific flat sections of Pave. Cobbles, Cassian, whatever you want to call them. 
These are what characterise this particular part of the world. These are what make the Tour of Flanders what it is. But no real big shake-up here at all. So this, is, this break wants to stay together for as long as possible. And this is just an early, an early foray, really, after the powder strap, which comes immediately afterwards, as you were just saying, Rob, there's quite a gap. There's about the best part of 35-40k to the next cobbled section, but we do have the first of our clumps before that, and that, of course, is the iconic Order Quadamont. And look at the battle behind, just to head into the Lippehoverstraat, which is by no means the most difficult cobbled sector of the day. Lippehoverstraat will then be followed by the Paderstraat. Often taken on in races around here. Well, even here, Rob, you can just see, look at the movement on the outside of the bunch. Look at how hard it is. Sylvain Dillier, unsurprisingly, after spending the last part of an hour on the front, has been swept away. Uh, again, reminding everybody, this isn't a chase. This is pure positioning. Um, just to mitigate the chance of riders getting caught behind a crash. They want to be in pole position on these technical sections, and that's what that is. And we've seen the best part of 20 seconds being taken from the lead of the breakaway as a direct result. The Lippehoverstraat, a cobbled monument, according to the Belgian government, since 1996. Oh. I like that. Here we go, straight on to the Paderstraat. And after that, we go to the Paderstraat. Oh, this road has stood here for 2,000 years, the Gallo-Roman route between Boulogne and Cologne. The cobbled zone section now, the second in the race, as the peloton are about to head on to the first. Three and a half minutes still between the eight men up the road and those chasing on. And those chasing on here as the road narrows are trying to position their leaders. There's no alarm bells or panic stations about to approach. But there are certainly worries of protecting people from what might happen. Exactly. That's what this is all about. Then it just eases a little bit. They've got that positioning. This, this is what characterises a race, the Cobble Classics like this. There's, with after that, that big, long, flat section where everybody had settled into a relative, a relative rhythm, it's this ebb and flow of the race now as Movistar, one of the teams, moving through to the front. First sector cobbles then for the peloton onto the Libelhoverstraat. Torres the left-hand side, Jakobs the right as you look at it, Movistar are there. Bahrain victorious as well. Little bits of puddles left and right. And the flags making sure that everybody sticks to the cobbles, the Kaseya as they're known here. We start to see a couple of riders moving up. Tim Medlir is one of them, former Belgian champion and cyclocross star as well. It's more than comfortable off-road. Signage getting in the way of certain riders there and voicing their displeasure. Romelo's here as well. And we're hearing that the breakaway is now through the Padestrat, they're through the opening two sectors of Pavi. To Velzeke, Rudersova. And it's off one sector onto another. Peloton finishing the Lippehoverstraat. Little downhill here, always a worry. Thankfully, that rain hasn't arrived that was forecast. Certainly, when we get to the Stationsberg later on today, that, that could have been an issue. A few more clouds are starting to build, I could take the finish line, so let's see. Let's hope it stays away, the rain. With all the fighting for position there in the peloton, the gaps come down to below three and a half minutes. And from the Lippehoverstraat, 
Pedderton now passes to the Parastrat. And there's plenty of love for Wat van Aert. Get better soon, Wat. And, of course, we're missing him and the others who were injured on Wednesday from this race. One and a half kilometres long, the Parastrat. And this 2,000-year-old route. Thankfully for the riders, the cobbles aren't that old. There's always been a route here. The trading posts between uh, Boulogne and what was Gaul, now France. And over in uh, Cologne, Kuhn, and what's now Germany. The rattling of the bikes with the cobbles underneath. the difference there with the Movistar team. The, the speed suit almost looks a different jersey design, doesn't it, to the rest of the jersey. Torres there and the same team as Jacobs, who's at the front. They're led by Oyer Lascano here. Riders at the back. No issues along the Parastrat, it seems. Everybody just getting used to the cobbles. The wind blowing across them as well. One more turn and everybody's off safely. And the first two obstacles will have been negotiated with that incident. There's that tight turn with the mud on the Padestrat. And there we go. A bit of Belgian beton work, the concrete slabs, plenty of that on the route today. And plenty of people. Take a look at this. Vlaanderen's moister, Flanders' finest, with people all over the road on this Easter Sunday. Each and every one of these narrow stretches of road. Always a moment where something can happen. Always a moment where riders will be fighting for position. Up in the breakaway, they're away from any of that chaos. That's one of the good things about riding here. But you can see that the wind's blowing across the road. Luke Durbridge settling in behind. And you can see the wind coming from the left as we look at it. A crosswind on the road to Flanders, and the riders riding at 47 k's an hour. Interesting to see what sort of shape the peloton takes when they're on this long straight road. Surely it's too early for any fun and games as far as that's concerned, but you just never know. There's everybody in position. See Gidmai moving up behind. Got the riders stopping at the side of the road. Here is uh, Camponarts. Viviani moving up Sheffield and looking after him. And 
Again, riders we haven't really seen yet. And one of whom is Riley Sheehan. Young American rider who won Paris Tour last year. And we're hearing a, a couple of uh, punctures. Incidents that surely took place on the pave only just come to light now with the slow punctures and what have you. One of the Alpazine de Koenig riders, we're told, is waiting for some assistance. And here is Sheffield being protected by Viviani, the former European champion on the road. 159 kilometres to go in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Everybody safely through those opening couple of clave sectors by the odd puncture. And Philippe, what can he provide today? I've sort of become used to him not being up there now, and it's a, a rather sad occurrence. It's happened with Pedro Sagan over the last couple of years of his career. I don't think Philippe is ready for the retirement uh, queue oh. yet, but uh, he's there, he's ready. That's Sudel quick step. Strange, isn't it? We've got to a situation where we'd say that it was a shock if they won this race. Yeah, we were just having a conversation there, or a brief exchange of words with Remy Cavagna, a former, former teammate, a fellow Frenchman, of course. But yeah, it is an odd one, isn't it? Um, and Alaphilippe has been asked directly about the comments that we made in the press. He said, I've got nothing to say, you know. So it's, to be fair to Julio, he's keeping his playing his cards close to his chest and keeping his counts full, which is quite respectful. He's just getting on with his job. He's had a lot of bad luck in races as well. I mean, he's decked it a few times this year already. Um, but saying that, he's also been at near the head of affairs, you know. He was up there, he's in the front group in Milano San Remo. So there are glimpses, I think, of a, I wouldn't say a resurgent Alaphilippe, or, or I think there's definitely hope there. I think there's positivity, but it's hard to come back. Um, he's, had, he's had, especially in this current era, to, to re, I don't know, to to come back and reimpose yourself on an era of in quite incredible strength must be very hard for somebody who's as decorated as he is. But he is a champion, he's exceptionally classy, um, but we shall see. Um, but there is a lot of pressure on his shoulders. I mean, him and Asgren are clearly the, the leaders from their, from their team here. Um, but there he is in the centre, looking focused. He's got a job to do, and I do agree, Rob, you know, his career isn't over yet. We'll see Alaphilippe back, and I, I would certainly love to see him do something special today. Uh, whether he can, uh, that remains to be seen. But I certainly think there's not exactly cause for celebration, but I think there's a certain amount of positivity that I've, I've already seen from him this year. Um, he's been on the offensive, but again, he's faded a little bit towards the back end, so he's been getting involved. It's not the Alaphilippe of old, but he isn't sitting back, he's not resting on his laurels, he's trying, and, and the form will come if, if, if it comes. Elia Viviani protecting his leaders. Only a sprinter, but he's got a job to do as domestic today. He's got Sheffield on his wheel, Turner's not too far behind as well. Not really seen Josh Tarling yet, but he was impressive on Wednesday afternoon in Duarte of Vlaanderen. Yeah, very impressive, that was a great ride. Yo-yoing off the back, getting distance on the climbs, and that raw power, that big, big engine clawing himself, uh, winching himself back into contention time after time. And we touched upon Tarling's ability just before we came on air, didn't we? In the car, we were ruminating over his possibilities, but I think Paris Roubaix would be the one for that young man. Uh, great experience for, for him riding Flanders. Um, but I think for the Ineos options, it has to be between Sheffield, Ben Turner, really. I think uh, as their riders, interesting addition to the squad, Lawrence de Plus as well. But again, it's a very versatile rider. It's nice to see the plus riding, actually. I mean, I'm at the minute in the Oscar and for the race, but Lars de Plus is 28 now. He's been drafted in to make his Ronde of Vlaanderen debut following injuries to Narvaez and Rowe. They've had concussion, but to say he's excited is a big understatement. <laughs> but he's loving it. His family's delighted. It's something he's always wanted to do. And even though he's never, ever ridden the Flemish Cobble Classic, believe it or not, as Lars de Plus, doesn't really train on the cobbles because he's spent a lot of time up in Andorra as well and he's at altitude camps and things like that. He's got very fond memories of the bergs and the hills of the Flemish Ardennes. His only pro victory to date came at what is now the Renewy Tour, formerly 
Tour of the Benelux. It's had yep. different sponsors' names, hasn't it? And that came on the slopes of the mood of Herasberger. He was third on the stage. He won the GC. So you could say until today he's got a 100% record on the cobbles. There we go. There we go. Yeah. Tough to keep that up today, though, isn't it? Yeah, enormously. No, enormously. What way does it differ, then, riding, uh, you know, on a, a mountain stage, a hilly stage, let's say, of a, of a normal race, a Grand Tour like De Plus does, to this sort of race? Apart from the parkour, what else changes, Matt? Yeah, it's just the sort of effort that he's used to doing. He's used to training for a certain sort of uh, effort, for a certain specific set of efforts, and that's generally climbing for, like, between 20 and 40 minutes, you know, uh, riding at altitude. He's, it, it, the sort of effort that he will be required to do is to pull for long periods of time, sometimes at quite in, intense tempos, on the climbs in the Grand Tours, deep into a race. So it's a different sort of physiology. Of course, if you're a bike rider, you can ride any sort of race, but you won't specialise in it. So, um, but it, 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 you know, when, you, when you look at his, his, his physique as well, he is a rangy rider suited to the climbs and his whole calendar and all of his training will, will be We'll be focusing on that, so it is completely different. Whereas here, if you're training to ride well uh, in the Tour of Flanders, it's far more punchier, shorter efforts, um, far more top ends. So efforts of between like one and three and four minutes. I mean, none of the climbs on here, even taking in uh, the Quaramont, which is by far the longest with that, uh, in that horrible drag, it's probably a climb of maybe four and a half, five minutes, um, which at its longest, so most of these climbs are between a minute and a minute and a half of all our effort, not much time to recover, then you go again. So if you looked at the effort of the Tour of Flanders uh, as a graph towards the back end, it'd just be a series of spikes. High power, then you recover, high power. And that's why Van der Poel is so suited. But of course, Van der Poel doesn't ride in the mountains. He's a very specific sort of being as we get to... As we get a look at him in the rainbow jersey, still another layer on by the looks of thing, rummaging through his pockets for some nutrition. Um, but we know Van der Poel is versatile, but uh, again, a completely different beast to somebody who specialises in riding well in the high mountains, mostly at the service of others as well. So um, all the training is around these long, long efforts. I think he's looking for the store in Fritz flavour? Could be. We shall see. That would be a story, wouldn't it? Imagine if he won, fueled on frites and stew. <laughs> Game-changing. Well, I'm Bingo. They're from the other side of the country. They're from the French-speaking side of the country, even though there are riders from Flanders as well. Bingo, Wallonie, Bruxelles. And this is uh, Jelle Vermote. Of course, one of the three teams with only Belgian riders representing them, Wallonie, Bruxelles. Oh, bingo, while any Bruxelles nowadays. There is Van der Poel still finding the right food, making sure he's got everything for after as well. And staying nice and warm while he can as that wind blows. And just as you were out, Matt, grabbing me a coffee, thank you, by the way, he, um, he and the rest of everybody else will have noticed that the sun has started to hide away. The clouds are no longer giving us those sunny intervals. The wind is blowing again, and it's blowing in some darker-looking clouds. Are we going to get that rain that we were forecast? I'll just well, switch you on. Thank you. I was speaking into the void there, wasn't I? Um, still clawing my way back through the convoy after getting that coffee for you. But, uh, no, we... We could have a little bit of rain a bit later on. I think there's a relatively high chance that we could get some precipitations around one o'clock-ish today. A little disagreement there with Christopher Oldorf. That wouldn't be the first time we've seen that. But uh, Van der Poel now dispenses with the over jersey. He's down the skin suit. And this looks like a little bit of an effort. Yeah, definitely enough to get back into the, the slipstream of the car there. And as soon as you got it, you can see you can back off. So the wind, as you can see, is coming from the left-hand side. That's why he's riding up the inside, getting that little bit of shelter, not just from behind the vehicle, but from the side of the vehicle as well. Just, you know, what it, interesting little thing there. It's almost as if he was sort of warming up there. Yeah. There was almost an unnecessary degree of it. You know, he, he was actually trying pretty hard there, putting a fair bit of power through the bike. Tim de Klerk, the tractor, just saying to Dillier, do you know what, mate? You're doing a cracking job. <laughs> I'm not going to give you a bit of my cake. Uh, I'm not allowed to. 
but it looks like Tim de Klerk is going to be deployed shortly. And there is Mads Pedersen just sat behind there in fourth wheel. A lot of the big hitters now moving through to the front. There is Elia Viviani. Everybody a little bit wary of this wind maybe as well. Oh, totally. All it needs is for somebody to go a bit rogue or a team to put it in the gutter. Uh, you know, I think that's... Uh, yeah, I mean, you just never know. You, that's Lewis Askey just moving up on the inside in the navy blue of Group Armour FDG. But no, Dillier doing a very good job here. But 151 Ks to go. The fact that Tim de Klerk's there said that uh, I do think that Lidl Trek might start to give a little bit of assistance. And with the greatest of respect to the breakaway, again, this isn't about bringing the break back, this is about keeping this pace high, because in 16 Ks, we get to the Quadamont. So this is almost the phase before the real acceleration that takes into the Quadamont. We know that the Quadamont first time up, it's never really decisive, but if you get it wrong, you get in the wrong position. We know how narrow it is before they swing right onto the climb itself. Then that horrible steep part, the irregularity of the cobbles on the first sector too. This is now this 10K build-up towards the Quadamont now. So I think that we'll see Dillier being swept away. Yep, just under 15 kilometres to go until the Alde Quadamont for the first of three ascents. 150 kilometres ticking to 149 now. We've had 120 Ks of racing. The peloton set off in Antwerp this morning for the 108th round of Flandre. There was a 10-kilometre neutral start. Even the Easter Bonnie was out on the bike. Once the flag was dropped by Scott Sunderland, the attacks then came fast. Luke Durbridge really set things off. Five riders got up the road. Three then came across. Alongside the route, there were plenty of Flemish people showing their support for the injured Wout van Aert who is unable to contest this year's Ronde van Vlaanderen. Alpacine de Koenig, the favourites, tried to calm things down and control the peloton. It took around 45 kilometres before the peloton settled down and we then had a format, a pattern for the race. Eight riders were given the go. They were Durbridge himself who'd started the party. Von Leerberger, Anjol Kolski, Touze was there in the breakaway too, accompanied by Reinders, Decker, Vermota and Tamino. The break got a maximum advantage of 4 minutes 20, but then this happened. A level crossing went down, costing the break around 30 seconds or so. Sylvain Dillier was the main locomotive for Alpacine, keeping the break in check. And as they hit the cobbles of the Padestraat and the Lippehoverstraat before that, the break still had an advantage of 3 minutes 48 seconds. We're at the home now of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. It's Aldenarde. We're in the heart of the Flemish Ardent. Hello, Matt Stevens. It is great to be here for the high mass of the Flemish Holy Week. Fantastic stuff here. Aldenada for the first time. We skirt where they'll be finishing in 148 k's time. And this is where we head into the twisting, turning, sinuous, steep, savage climbs. The Hellingen that characterise the Ronde. The Tour of Flanders, four minutes is the gap to our group of eight now. And you can really feel the pressure building, can't you? Right by the river Skelder. The Skelder pad here takes you all the way up the river to the city of Ghent. On the other side, all the way over the border into France. You can even follow up towards Antwerp and further on to the North Sea. Today, we're in the opposite direction. And suddenly to the fore, we're getting the big names. They all want to be there as we come through town. And how times change, eh? Because in the very first round of Vlaanderen, the town of Aldenarde did not let a tour of Flanders pass through. That's interesting. Isn't it? They were that. interested in it. But now it's the centre, the heart of the Flemish Ardennes. Look beyond the beautiful cathedral and the main square in the distance. The Flemish Ardennes, its hills, its cobbles, its bergs. And this now is why we have Vegar Stakelangen protecting Niels Pollitt. Andrea Posqualon looking after his main man, Matej Mohoric. Several riders from 
Visma Lisa bike. The Von Deker brothers principally looking after Jorgensen and Benoit. The left inside Ben Swift. He moves up to protect his men. And Q36.5 are doing their best to help their leader, Yannick Steinle. These are the riders in the breakaway. They've left Aldenarda and they're now on the road to the Alde Quadamont. We are now just over 10 kilometers away from the first of our 17 climbs. It's exciting, isn't it? It's the longest climb of all of these climbs as well. The first of the three ascents, as you said, and apparently the atmosphere on the climb already is electric. We seem to get more and more people, a lot of infrastructure up there as well. Uh, we saw it the other day in some of the classics midweek. We saw all the, uh, the VIP lounges. Well, not just VIP, it's just for punters, isn't it? To get up there and enjoy the three sightings that they'll get of the Tour of Flanders. And of course, the Tour of Flanders for women as well will pass by there. So a big, big day out for the spectators on the Quadamont. One of the most iconic climbs, not just in Flanders, but in the world. It, it really is enormously important. And in last year's race, proved pivotal as well. It's up there with the likes of Alpe d'Huez and uh, totally. all the rest, isn't it? And, and the nice thing about it, it's over quicker. Yeah. Here is Aldenarda. The crowds are building. And there's the presentation stage for the women's round of Vlada that you mentioned. Starts in town here a little later on today. The flags fly of Flanders and of Belgium as a nation. And this town today is going to be jam-packed full of cycling fans from around the world. We'll then go left, right, up and down into the Cobbles Hills, narrow concrete farm roads through what is becoming increasingly unpredictable weather today. And past the throngs of passionate fans. This is a race that has absolutely everything. Town Hall the Belfry in Aldenarda. Now, there's some competition for stunning town halls in Belfry in Flanders, isn't there? But it, it's right up there. That's got to be one of the favourites, though, isn't it? That's got to be up there with your Van der Poels and your Van Aerts in terms of favourites, if we were to use cyclists as analogies. But, yeah, splendid in the square here. It's going to be packed tonight. It's going to be packed this afternoon. And there at the peloton around uh, three and a half to four minutes behind our leading group of eight, filing the way through. And just look at how densely packed the crowds are here. A lot of these people will be moving up, finding their places on the finish line. There's the uh, Centrum Ronde van Vlaanderen, the Tour of Flanders Museum. Get yourself in there if you've never visited. It is uh, brilliant. I know it's going through a little bit of a revamp. They've got a new site, I believe, for it in the next few years as well. Um, but uh, not just yet, but head down there. You can actually ride on uh, some rollers which replicate riding on the cobbles as well as looking at some of the big cycling jerseys, bikes of the past. It really is worth your time. And, of course, there's a really good bar that serves some really good beers as well. We might be going in there. Might or might not. I've heard unconfirmed reports we might be in there later. So we'll, I think we'll just have to go where the Flandrian tide takes us, won't we? Mm. <laughs> At that point, we'll just let ourselves go. Church of Our Lady of uh, Pamela in Aldenard. Yes, we're building up to the first passage of the Alder Quadamont. Getting up to halfway in terms of distance. But we will really only just be getting started. Climb, we'll be climbed three times. The second and the... Oh, sorry, the first and the penultimate climb of the race. That was the second last year. Interesting to see what the feeling amongst the bunch is now, though, Matt. Things will be changing, and yeah. I think we're seeing that without even being able to read the minds of the riders. You can see that by the type of rider that the faces we're starting to see in the front two rows now. Yeah, there's a certain type of rider that's moving through to the front now. You can just see this crosswind that we're moving into. Here's our break. Still got a decent lead there. There's a Decker deftly dismounts, lays his bike nicely on the ground there. Is uh, Bianchi. No panic at all from the Dutchman. He's back on nice and quick. That's pretty smooth. It's a cyclocross bike that change, huh? very, very smooth. Uh, almost graceful. So straight back on, stamping on the pedals. He'll get back into the slipstream of his team car pretty quickly as we see the peloton just splitting. Organic-like, like a shoal of fish as they reform on the other side. But, yeah, you're quite right. There's a certain type of rider moving to the front. I saw Ryan Mullen. He'll be shouldering the next 20 or 30 k's on the front as well, looking after the likes. It's um, 
of, of potential. I mean, they've got an interesting team, really. Will it be Mayers? Will it be Haller? No out-and-out -out real team leader. I think um, coming into this race, Bora Hansgrohe, I've just got, I've got, a, got a few options. Mayers, of course, on the podium. A very good podium in Ghent Wevelgem the other day. Uh, the winner of the final stage of the Tour last year. But Mayers, good. And Haller, of course, just seems to get better and better every year. He's always up or near the sharp end at the back end of the Cobble Classics. And right now, Beggar State Langen just in front of Niels Pollitt, who in turn is just in front of uh, Tim Vellens, who uh, would imagine uh, would be their team leader today. And watch out for Mark Hershey as well. Mark Hershey, I haven't seen too much of him, the Swiss road race champion. There's Decker, slowly but surely, patiently, intelligently, gets his way back into the, uh, the front group here. That wind's still blowing. You can see, by the way, that they're fanned across the road. And of course, it's in every team's interest to help this rider get oh, back totally. and keep the full complement and the firepower. He's going to go on the right inside the car, yeah. just save himself that little watt or two, that little grain of energy. E exactly. And you could just see there, the every time you know that, when you know there's a rider that drops back from a breakaway, as a team manager and driver, you'll be aware that at some point that rider's going to come back. So you've got to keep your eyes in the rear view mirror, mirror to the left, mirror to the right, because the rider will signal. And you could just see their deck appointed just to his right, so that will be caught. And so the, the, the team car of Sudar Quicks so move out to the left just to let him on the inside. And as you quite rightly said, right now, well, they're all in different teams, save for two riders. Uh, they're basically on one squad, and that's keeping, us, keeping in front for as long as they can. They need each other. Um, so, yeah, no harm done at all. And, uh, but uh, good ride there, good example of how to get through. It's only, and, and also how hard it is, especially in that crosswind. They're, they're moving very quickly. And just the way that Decker, from car to car, recovered, then moved up again. And there is Ryan Mullen, just in the centre, moving up, just in front of Nils Pollitt, former teammate, of course. Mullen looks across at the man that's now in white. The Abbey we just saw a moment ago, been there since 12.33. Well, that's probably been there since this morning. Probably took quite a bit of effort to get at the top as well. I d well I even the camera <laughs> operator, look at that. That's absolutely fantastic, isn't it? I would be strapped in. I tell you what, I don't know about the health and safety implications there, but I tell you what, that was a great bit of, uh, great bit of content for us. <laughs> I love that, the effort that people put in. Again, it's just, we laugh, Rob, don't we? But oh, it's we what do. this race is, <laughs> and we do laugh. It's so, so cycling. I mean, but that's what, that's what it's all about. And I tell you, one of the most cycling things I saw earlier on today, we just lost sight of him, was Victor Campenarts seemingly rapping um, at the team presentation this morning, getting involved. Certainly got a future, if not as a direct sportif, as a disc jockey, uh, I would imagine, at some rave in Ghent, maybe. But there he is. Hope he hasn't used up too much energy. Campanaris wearing the Lotto Destiny jersey. He's no longer a resident of Belgium. He moved to southern Spain over the winter. Andalusia. And not in the sort of grand legions of where well, a lot of the other bike riders live. He did it in a very Victor Campanaris way. <laughs> he's so, one of a kind, isn't he? He's fantastic. He lives in a very small village in Andalusia, not too far from the Euskal Tel rider Luis Angel Mate. Rents a house out there. Man who's been spending time in Spain at an altitude hotel, Mathieu Fodderpool, over in uh, not too far from Denia. There he is, rainbow jersey on. He's perhaps one of the last moments where he can be sitting down the back now. Start to move up soon before they get to the Quadamon. Yeah, he's just moving slowly. He, hasn't got he has got a teammate with him. I think it's Jeanne Vermeers, who he often rooms with in that very hotel. Um, I spent time there, actually. I did stay in one of the altitude rooms in that hotel. Very, very interesting indeed. He just sets the gauge. Mm and it can replicate being at altitude, yeah. It has competition, though, now, because there's one in Flanders. I saw it in the newspaper yesterday. Uh -huh. And um, they've even got a cinema room where you can set the altitude. That's good, isn't it? Getting, is that getting fit while watching the movie? How cool is that? <laughs> I think you still have I to go and ride your bike during oh, the day. Da dash, da oh, well, oh, well. Just keep your eye there on, on Fonda Pool. He was sort of shaking his legs again there. We saw the effort a little bit. I mean, is he playing with us? Has he had a good night? I mean, was, he, was he sleeping above the same disco that I was? You never know. Well, if he was, I mean, that, he's definitely going to lose a little bit of uh, a few watts today. Let's not sow the seeds of doubt too early. But, yeah, again, it's one of those cycling things that you see riders do, just shaking their legs out. It's almost like a nervous tick that you have, um, especially when he knows what's to come. Campanarts, D-arm warmers. 
Fred Wright in the center, twice top 10 over the last couple of years in this race. Hasn't quite performed, I think, at the level that he'd want on the approach to this race, but never rule out the British champion on that custom Merida in the center, just tucked behind Edward Turns, who in turn is behind Tim de Klerk. Campenarch in the center, Tim Merlier just in front of Asgren there. Tim Merlier, who could be a real big asset to his team. Mars Pearson there, looking to try and win Jens Wevelkiem and the Ronde van Vlaanderen in the same season. And the five riders before have done that. Look at those names. Yeah. Van der Aarde, Van Looy, Godefroot, Bona and Sagan. It's a special club. He sits third wheel there in the line of riders that is led by Tim de Klerk. O'Brien moving up right inside for Jaco Alula. Left inside, look at this, everyone trying to get up and... Everyone's going to have to be careful today. How strict is the VAR going to be on all of this? Yeah, we'll see. I think that little bit on that, I mean, I think they'll be all right on moving up, but if they, if they jump onto the bike path on the left-hand side um, or onto a footpath that's raised, um, they seem to be getting stricter, and rightly so, uh, and rightly so. It's also dangerous for the general public as well. I mean, all you need is a coming together with a pedestrian, and it's, 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 it's not good. So it's about protecting the members of the public as well and just also clarifying the rules there. Now, this is this little approach before the Quadamont. There's a couple of little twists and turns. Then we go through those fields, very narrow. Then we got that right turn, and then we hit the climb itself. So not long at all. This is ever so slightly up here. We can just see the ridge just towards the north of your screen there, where the fields start to go up. That is the top of the Quadamont. No real elevation of, of any note, but it is a significant climb, and it's a hard one steep section at the bottom, then that horrible drag for about a kilometre over the top. And that's where a lot of the differences are really made. Into Klersberger. See everyone trying to move up before we get there. And as Matt was explaining, these are sort of extensions of the road left and right that you're seeing here. There's no sort of curb involved, less danger. They're not bike paths, they aren't footpaths. So they can be used, or should be able to be used, to be moved up. But yeah. again, everything, as we said, everything's at the discretion of who's watching it. And when you're moving there, you don't know every metre of the road. It's always a risk, because you could end up having to stray onto one of those sections. Exactly. That's interesting. Fred Wright just almost caught within a phalanx there of Ineos riders. Three former, well, one British champion and two former British champions. Connor Swift, former British champion, and in front of Ben Swift, a double British champion. And then Josh Tarling. On the drops, the man who finished very highly the other day in the Dwarf of Landren. And also, I saw just behind him the tall figure of Laurent de Plus. This is a nervous looking bunch it as is. they head to the Quaramont for the first time. The longest climb in the Tour of Flanders. You can just see it up on the hill there. That's People it. are already lined left and right. It's 2.2 kilometers long. Average gradient is 4%. The steepest point is about 12%. It's cobbled almost in its entirety. You go through the little artist village through the middle, which today has turned into a natural stadium. And you've got all of the big VIP sections left and right and sponsor sectors where people will be stood as if they're on a terrace of a football ground. And here we go, the little familiar road. It just starts to slope up here through the town. The wind is blowing. Keep your eye on these flags because this is important for the race, and it is. Would say, is well, it difficult to say oh. there. It, looking at the map, it, because it's such a, a small relief, it's actually hard to tell just looking at the map, but we'll have to see another flag perhaps. If it is a tailwind, that could be interesting, but uh, let's get another view. I have a feeling it's a slight headwind, actually. It's a headwind. It is. It's it a is headwind, headwind up the Quadamont, so keep your eye on that. Yep. Also a big factor, the opposite enormous. reason you were going to describe. Yeah, no, enormous factor. They don't, it's not too long before they hit the cobbles. And there's the stats. First climb in the 108th Ronde van Vlaanderen is the Oude Quadamont to be climbed three times and it's the eight riders in the breakaway who take it on with a gap of four minutes and eight seconds of a nervous-looking peloton. We remember Wout van Aert, Jasper Sturver and those watching at home who can't be here. They're injured today. The big favourite is Mathieu van der Poel. But there is a whole peloton waiting to take him on as he looks to equal the record for wins. Ooh. And look how fierce this is behind. It is Kurs 
It's racing. It certainly is. It's Tim Mudlier on the front, changing from being let out for the sprints to leading into this corner. Remember, this is the approach to the little town before it. Riders buddy hopping across the central reservation. Very stressful approach. One of the riders from Wanty there, from Intermarché, should I say, just flick-flacking his way around that little traffic island. Another illustration of how much tension there is in the field here. Still, Rob, a long, long way to go, but you can really sense the focus now and the importance of making sure you're at the head of affairs as we head on to the pave. It's the Casea, the Cobbles. This race takes place on the cobbles with the aim of being on the podium. Look at the crowds. It's a headwind up the Isle de Quaramont and they've come from all over the world. You've got Basque people missing their national tour to be here. The Flemish are in attendance. The British flag there. It's a Spaniard on the front from the Balearic Islands. This is a world event. And the centre of world sport today lies in these farmers' fields in the Flemish Ardennes. It certainly does. In the centre of your screen, it's Louis Aski of Grufama, FDJ, riding side by side with Oscar Rezebeek, the team of Alperson de Koenig. There is Mathieu van der Poel. He's going to make sure that he doesn't hit the wind, of course. What last thing he wants to do is use any unnecessary energy, especially in a headwind here. Far easier sat in the wheels. Into Marche with Benjamin Grimay moving up on the right-hand side as well. Grimay, Wellens and company will have very bad memories last year of this section because of a very nasty crash, wasn't there? What took them out for quite a while, in Wellens' case, for quite a section of the season. It's the right turn onto the first slopes that lead us up to the Quaramont. Look what's happened to the gap. 20 seconds have been chopped off very easily yeah. without even trying as we look down back to Klersberger and listen to this reception. They're not even well old yet. They're only just getting started and already it's a football crowd. That's brilliant, isn't it? Luke Durbridge looking around, perhaps shocked to see that he's opened up a little bit of a gap. He's just got to be patient here. Durbridge, we know, rides the cobbles well. He's a man of experience. You see, that didn't extend the gap. There's no point. They need to ride as a cohesive unit. And Lerberger, the Belgian, driving hard on the front. He'll be loving this as well, but trying to keep your composure, trying not, not to, to let the adrenaline burn too much fuel is key as well. The roars of the crowds. And this is where the road just continues to rise. It doesn't look like it, but it continues almost imperceptibly for the next kilometre. Such a difficult climb after that steep section you're talking about, Rob. This is where the distances are made. It's a climb where there's no opportunity to recover at all. And if you've got anything left and you open up the taps on this section, this is where the gaps do open. This is where Tari Pogacar really put Van der Poel to the sword last time. Brilliant stuff. We're hearing that Edvor Boissenhagen has abandoned the Ronde of Vlander, becoming the second rider to climb off following Miles Scottson. Second half of the climb after the halfway point, and this is where it seems to just go on forever. Gets a little easier in terms of the grading up yeah. here, but you've been climbing on the cobbles for a long time. Most of the cobbled climbs in this part of the world are, what, a kilometre at most, something like that, a few hundred metres. This is different because it just goes on for that little yeah, bit longer. It's extraordinarily long. It is a real anomalous climb in terms of the distance. Um, and the hardest climb of the day is the Koppenberg. Hearing of a crash. Oh. Hearing of a crash in the peloton. Hearing of a crash, and here it is, it's Cyrus Monk on the right-hand side. 181 involved as well is the rider from Israel Premier Tech, who is Dylan Turns. This is 116. He, of course, is Fabian Linard. And issues as well for Anton Marche's Georg Zimmermann. And this is how it happened, Matt. Yes, yeah, right near the back by the looks of it. Let's have a little look. Oh, it's a right stack up on the right-hand side. Yep, Cyrus Monk going over the bars. Somebody also coming off on the left-hand side, so it's completely halted. Mm. So that, that, that was actually... Mate Mohoric getting Mohoric, caught up towards the, the back. That's the last thing you want. He will get back on, but it's all of these... Marco Haller also caught in the mix there as well. This is, why, this is why they work so hard to it's be at the front and expend that energy, isn't it? To stay away from being held up by these things. Exactly. And a rider of the, of the quality of Mohoric, I'm surprised he was actually that mm. far back on this climb. But we know it's not decisive in terms of the racing, but you can lose so much energy if you're in the wrong position having to chase. Good riding by Lewis Askey on the left-hand side. Razorbeck in the centre. Also, 
Andre and Petit in the centre looking focused. That gnarled face of his grimacing now as the gradient starts to kick up. This is the hardest part of the climb, that lower section. It's also where the gradient's at its steepest, but also the cobbles are at their harshest, almost broken in the centre. Very difficult to pick the right line on that early section of the climb. And from here you can see the newer Quadramont as well, which is the main road that runs parallel. And look at that, what a beautiful picture. It's a Sunday afternoon in Flanders. The 14th Sunday of the year is the most special. And look who's come out to play already. Van der sits in about 10th wheel, the world champion, making sure he's exactly where he needs to be. And his rivals are following him. Jorgensen there is in around 20th wheel. Yeah, William Germay moves up into around 30th wheel. Wellens, you're about to mention, I think, Matt, is up there too. Yep. Germay just rolling through. To the front bar, looking OK. Tom Schoens. A few of the other names there, Michael Matthews in the centre. Madawas on the left-hand side as well. This is Sheffield, that is Corvey. You can see Haller moving up on the left-hand side. Viviani moves up. Eva Lompart. See, this point in the field, this is where the riders who were caught by like Marco Haller, these are the riders mm -hmm. caught behind in the crash a little bit. Gianni Moscon, Alaphilippe as well. I wonder if he was caught behind that crash too. Mohoric there, no big splits in the peloton. And over the top of the climb, we go onto that big main road. There's an opportunity there for a little bit of regroupment. And the pace isn't full on, but uh, Rezebeek doing a great job here, taking about 15 or 20 seconds, and we've still got a fair bit of the climb for the peloton to be on. Great gr dr drone shots here. I'm loving this additional bit of content we've got here. It gives you a great sense just of the, the, the drama and also the atmosphere here as well. I'm told that that's a fly line that goes oh, all fly the way line, the so, okay. We are expecting some brand new drone shots yes. later on, and we'll save them for you let's as a not, surprise. Let's not, yeah, let's not tell you where they're going to be. But, uh, yeah, it's a great shot. Fly line, I mean, it's great. Adds so much to the, to the broadcast, doesn't it? Getting towards the top of uh, Old Quarter Hill, the Alde Quadramont. Pedersen near the front there, Jeanne Vierne, she's also there as well. Jorgensen, look who's opted to latch onto the wheel of Matteo Jorgensen, Mathieu van der Poel. Astrid looking good as well, the former winner. This is Bissiger left inside, the most advanced of the EF Education Easy Post riders. Former winner Betiol is around halfway down the peloton, just gone past the screen now. And it's Oscar Riesebeck of Alpecin de Koenig who leads them over the top. And the peloton has gained 40 seconds there on that sole intro and outro <laughs> from our first climb of the day. Yeah, great bit of riding there. Razorback took the whole climb. Oh, yeah, Lascano there as well. Ben Turner, Arvinos Grenadiers on the inside. Matteo Trentin in the black of Tudor now. Rattling through. You can just see the shockwave's been sent through the muscles, the shoulders of these riders as they thunder across the top part of the Quadramont. Were still to come. That's only climb number one, 16. Hellingen still to come, Rob. Hellingen by name and well, pretty hellish by nature. And that's a week before we get to Paris Roubaix. And these crowds will get bigger as the afternoon goes on as well. There'll be a lot of people making their way there now as we speak who've been to watch on other sections of the route. And time to carry on up the road now, past the top of the Alde Quadramont. Next climb comes in around. 17 kilometers time, and today will be the Capellaberg. Yeah, the Capellaberg, quickly followed by the next section of cobbles. The Holleveg comes right afterwards, and that's 114. So from the Capellaberg straight onto the Holleveg, so an interesting double punch there. Yeah, it's actually a really interesting sort of 10 kilometers of racing, isn't yeah. it? Because we'll go to the Capellaberg, Holleveg, the Wolfenberg, Kergata, and the Jagere. Yeah. That's the sort of real opener. We've had the, the sort of focal point there where everybody has to switch on. The opening salvos can come there. And then we go into the final 100 kilometres after that, where there will get 14 climbs and two further cobbled sectors. It, it really doesn't stop, does it? Oh, no, you've got the Mullenberg at 99 k's, the, the Marlborough Strat at 95.5 k's to go, the Berendries 4 k's after that. There's not a lot of recovery. I think the biggest gap between climbs in the final phase of the race is only about 15 k's. Normally, it's between 5 and 7 k's between climbs. Not a lot of opportunity to recover or shut down gaps as the crowds continue. Wonderful atmosphere here. 
as uh, Van Lerberger drops back, takes a little bit of extra nutrition, a couple of words of advice and encouragement from one of the most okay, experienced sir. pros, well, ex-pros out there, <laughs> and now far more comfortable in at the team car. A lot of experience in the mind of Kesa. Well, they'll be busy in his father's bar today in Kent. Televisions will be there. They do a lovely bowl of soup in there, Rob. Do they? Yeah, really. Nice. I went there on a, on a quiet lunchtime midweek once while I was doing some filming out here. And uh, they opened it especially for us and made us a lovely bowl of soup. But yeah, it also, you know, you can party in there big time as well. They've got DJs in there. It's a, it's a great bar, isn't it? Three and a half minutes. Listen to that wind. Yeah. Oh, wow. And oh, we're in the, the heart of the Flemish Yard then now. These races. I forgot. Michael Morkoff. So I've not. <laughs> look at, I'll be honest with you, looking through the, the lineup of Astana, I didn't even realise Michael Morkoff was riding today. But, he uh, wasn't due to ride no, until yesterday. Late addition, wasn't he? He made the journey over yesterday. He's 38 now, he's Magal Mago. He's going to be 39 soon. He's riding the Ronde of Vlaanderen for the first time since 2017. There we go. Um, he's the oldest rider in the race. Helping out his team, as he invariably does. And look at this, we're fighting for every twist and turn. And uh, this is, uh, you know, people get sick of me saying this, but it's such an important point to make. And I'd like you to illustrate it as someone who's been there and done that. You know, I can only talk from where I'm sat in the nice warm commentary box. I've never had to get my elbows out, thankfully, for all those around me, because I think I'd be a real hazard <laughs> um, and fight for these positions. But a lot of these races, Matt, seem to be won and lost, not necessarily just on the cobbled sectors or on the hills, but it's these innocuous roads between them where you fight for the 90-degree turns and the narrowing of roads. And even Fonda Paul knows that. His team's all protecting him here. Yeah, it, it's... It, when we... In, at this phase of the race, almost every single stretch of road, whether it's cobbles, whether it's packed dirt, whether it's tarmac, whether it's uh, on the grass verge and back in again, it all matters. It really does. We are into, we've still got a good three hours of racing to go, uh, but the Tour of Flanders, the Ron van Vlaanderen is are properly underway. But again, Sylvain Dillier back on the front again. He was swept away earlier on as the teams jostled for position just to get the strategic advantage as we headed into these uh, very difficult, challenging sectors. And now it's flat across the front, still running into that headwind. Mpama FDJ riding very well in the service, no doubt, of Stefan Kuhn. Desperately looking to get onto the podium. Has had a good season so far, a rider of such capacity. Sixth place in this race last year as we look at a fluttering flag of Tischbenut. Could he do today alongside Matteo Jorgensen, the two leaders of Team Visma Lisa Bike? Dylan van Baal on the road back from recovery. Remains to be seen what the Dutch road race champion can do today. Well, he's ahead up to one of the highest points of the entire Tour of Flanders on a main, one of the few main road climbs. Non categorized Dries de Bont, a man in good form, dropping off a gilet or something to. One of the Swaniers at the side of the road, safely back in the fold, just on the wheel of the Swiss champion. Interesting to see what Mark Hershey can do today. Another coming oh, together. Oh, no. Who's down? There's somebody down Ooh. this time. And I can tell you the rider down is from uh, Wallonie, Bruxelles, bingo. It's Floris de Tier. Left hand side, Ineos Cornelius, looks like Ben Swift. It's ben Swift. Uh, there's an issue as well for the rider from Israel Premier Tech here. Two riders from Israel Premier Tech. More affected this time. I think it's Chris, is it Chris Nylands? And it is Chris Nylands. He's got the uh, Latvian flag. Sheehan as well riding. Sheehan is the man who's riding off. 204 here is uh, Uno X's William Bloom Levy. And there's a problem for Nico Dens. A spectator was hit. That was what's happened, um, unfortunately. Uh, a woman has been hit and she's on the road, so a spectator has been hit. That's what it looks to be. That might have been the case. Thankfully, we've moved away. I can tell you the rider actually wasn't Chris Nelons for Israel Premier Tech. Was it, it was, the, uh, was it the Guillaume day? Boivin. Oh. Guillaume Boivin, the ah, former no. national champion of Canada. Now, here's Floris de Tier. 
And again, well, we were just talking about how innocuous these main road sections can look. Every year they prove to be so vital. Yep. And look at this, it's, it's got the sort of nerves going again. We're going for a left turn here. You've got those little bits of road traffic furniture to avoid. And everybody, if they weren't switched on already, that has to be a wake-up call. Exactly. It's only 12 k's till we get to the next section of Pavé, the Holoveg, and that takes us straight in. Well, sorry, it's the next climb, sorry, it's the Kapellenberg, which comes at 115 k's to go, so we haven't got too long. Uh, 10 or 11 k's to that point, Lewis Haskey drives through to the front. There's Lawrence Pithy in the centre, and on his wheel is Stefan Kung on the hoods, looking good. Oil Lascano drifts through to the front. Immediately, he was shielded from the wind. Sylvain Dillier looks across, just checks on the location of his teammates and, of course, his team leader. Going over towards Ronsa and particularly Marc Dahl next. That's where we head to now. Into East Flanders, where we are. As we've been through the Flemish Brabant parts today, we will very briefly touch West Flanders as well. But into East Flanders and Marc Dahl to head up the Capelleberg. Between Marc and Kerkem. Then we head to Martyr and the Holloway. And places that are very familiar to anybody that's ridden their bike in the Flemish Ardennes. And Martyr's catching back up after that crash. Fred Wright is one of those riders there. Um, uh, looks as though Lascano's getting his way back on too. Yeah, that was nasty. It looked like it actually happened just on the top of that climb, maybe where the feed was. Again, I don't want to speculate on what happened there. But a bit of roadkill in the centre there. Rod is moving around that one. Askey very vocal. And on the inside now, Tudor Pro Cycling as well. Obama with sven Erik Bistron moving up to do his work ahead of Askey, who knows Belgium well from his cyclocross yep. days. This is Jorgensen, who's having to move up on his own. Yeah, Jorgensen latching onto the wheel of Tom Schoens. Not a bad wheel to get on. Schoens had a great year so far, runner-up in Strada Bianca, consistent in the classics. Athene in the centre there in the yellow. So powerful, making it look easy, but believe you me, they're having to put some power through the pedals just to maintain this sort of speed. It's flat at the front, but I tell you what, if you're breaking into the wind here, it's very hard. Biffy sitting third wheel behind Askey. Behind him is Stefan Kung. There's Niels Pollitt, the former German champion, and it's already very, very hairy at the front of the Ronde of Vlaanderen. We've only just gone past the halfway point, Matt, and the uh -oh. game's really only beginning. Yeah, you, you, there's, there's almost there's been like a sea change, isn't there, in terms of the atmosphere. We can feel it here. You know, the pace has picked up, everybody's focused. There's already been a couple of, of nasty little crashes, just showing you how nervous this race can be. It's always the same. Julien Alaphilippe just moving up on the outside there. Fred Wright in the British champion's jersey drifting to the back. This is this washing machine effect that you get as riders move round the outside, swamping the riders in the centre, who then effectively get pushed through the centre of the peloton and moving out. That's why you need riders who've got the strength to hold that position. If you're not strong enough, that's when you get swept by. But good riding here by the peloton. After that initial loss of time up the Quadamont, it's stabilised now, just on three and a half minutes. Just watching our uh, finish line here. Some of the team buses come underneath the finishing gantry. Thankfully, with plenty of room to spare, Rob, I have to say. <laughs> no green edge <laughs> incidents from Corsica. We hear that Guillaume Boivin, rider who we mentioned had been caught in the crash, the former Canadian champion, has now abandoned the race. Easter Bonnie counts rising. There's been plenty today, hasn't there? I did say I was going to have a chocolate egg. I think you should go for the it. At the I'm, think you I'm, should I'm, go. I'm already it was, it was all too exciting, wasn't it? It was. There's too Matt, much going Matt, on. what do the Flemish sports directors say? Eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. You should be doing it all day. I'm surprised I haven't got somebody in my ear, actually. I need my wing. I need my wingman no. for the end of this race. Right. Well, while Matt tucks in, let's have a quick look at the front of the peloton because this is getting very hairy again. And you're seeing sprints here akin to the end of Tour de France stages just for each and every corner. We are seven kilometres, just less now, at the front of the race from our next climb. But on these wide highways, there's that much more room to move up and everyone's getting the call. Trentin follows the wheel of Lascano. He's the former or he is the current Spanish champion. Benoit, we can just see there on the wheel of Affini. And Benoit, well, let's take our hat off to him because Benoit 
thinks he may be riding with broken or bruised ribs, but he does not want to have an X-ray because the adrenaline, he says, has been working for him so far. He's <sighs> been pleasantly go. surprised with how he's racing after his crash in the Airdrie Press in Adelbeck. Well, there's plenty of adrenaline at the moment, and that's Ryan Mullen, a rider that's so, so good at this. On the front, Jordi Mayus on his wheel, the former Irish double row champion and TT champion, using that raw power he has just to make sure Mayus is sat in a good position. Lance Pithy again, so, so good at getting his position right. No teammates with him, but look, right at the head of affairs, Magnus Sheffield, the young American in the red of Ineos Grenadiers moving through. Tim Wellens also there. This constant rotation. Yeah, lots of riders now losing teammates because of so, there's so much movement in the bunch here, Rob. The washing machine's been set to full spin today and we are not even into the main phase. This is an astoundingly difficult and chaotic Ronde van Vlaanderen that, in all honesty, has not really got started yet. It's not properly kicked off at all here, but it just shows you just the, just the raw intensity of this race and what it takes. OK, we had the active start, and then about an hour and a half where riders could... Ooh, there's a little bit of a coming together, and now that little compression there as riders moved in from the right, squeezing that space. So, so stressful. Another Rick unfortunate abandon there, yeah. First rider from Tudor Pro Cycling to abandon. Of course, they're the team that are owned and run by Fabian Cancellara, the man who has the record here that Mathieu van der Poel is looking to equal with several other riders. All of that fight for the right turn towards Marcadal. Look at that, riders having to bunny hop over that little traffic island. Well marshalled, mm. but that is the very nature. Now, be, having the knowledge of this route, that's why the teams, although many of these riders, the big favourites, will have ridden this race on numerous occasions, that's why they all go out doing the recon. You could ask why. They know these roads. It's just to get themselves reacquainted with it. That race knowledge, and not just the knowledge of the leaders, but the knowledge of the domestics of where to move up. Do you go early? Do you move up late? You know, there's so much. The more knowledge you have, the easier it's going to be here. Uh, but also you need a big engine as well to move up at the right points because of the constant movement. Mats Pedersen bandaged, battle scarred from the crashes earlier in this week, taken through to the front by Vegada now. It's a fascinating watch at the front of this peloton here. I can tell you that the breakaway are just about to start climbing the Capellaberg. Second climb of the day. Jakob's there through the front as they're coming through Marka Dahl. This, by the way, is one of the most ridden roads by bike riders in the whole of the Flemish Ardennes. Again, no matter how many times you ride it, depends on which way you're going to turn in the race. You have to think about that as well, because there's so many of the famous climbs in the Flemish cobbled classics that are in and around this road. We're next going to go to the Capellaberg, as I said, and it's going to be taken on first by the breakaway. The Capellaberg is a 1.1 kilometer long climb. Average gradient of 5.9%, peaks up at 10%, and it is the head of the race that is about to start climbing it. Yeah. Head of the race still there. Let's remind you who they are. 3.3 k's away from it. Vermote, Tamino, Renders, Durbridge, von Leerberger, Decker, Aniolkowski and Tuzé. A good set of riders riding together after a 45-kilometre fight to stay out there, leaving Antwerp, Flanders' biggest city. We're coming into Marke Kerkem. And we're coming into the foot of the Capellaberg. Yep, next one. <clears throat> Going to start rattling through them now. The gap between the top of the Quadermont and the Capellenberg is one of the longest gaps between any of the climbs. So now they do come thick and fast. Not a lot of opportunity. And we'll see the continuation of that movement at the front of the peloton, which in turn just depletes the reserves. There's only so many times you can ride in the wind on the front and drop back. Teams, rods will start getting dropped after all of those repeated efforts. And we're getting fueled up as well. Left and right, keep looking at this. Riders on the pavement, it's difficult one to control this. No use of payment is a big, big call going out on race radio right now. Keep your ears and eyes on this. Race radio is giving the call. Well, now then. 118 k's to go at the front. The gap goes under three minutes for the first time. They're obviously under strict orders here to keep things in check.
It is. No, it is so difficult. It is so difficult because as, as a rider, it's the natural instinct to move up. I get that. You have to remember the rules, and each of those situations has to be taken into account by the commissars looking. And of course, we know they've got the, the video, but they're not going to spend all afternoon looking at this. So I know a lot of you at home will cry consistency. Why has that happened? Why have they not been taken out? Why have they been sent off to the naughty step? Difficult to see everything. Ryan Mullen moving by another crash. Cra Ooh, nearly a Should crash. Should have been a crash. Wow. Thankfully, it wasn't. Well held there. And again, it was somebody in and off there on that little bit of a boulevard going out. That's Patrick Eddy of Australia, who thankfully is OK and keeps it upright. It's pretty much a miracle that everybody kept it upright yeah, there. That was a very good bit of uh, restraint skills. But look at the effort it requires to just get back into the peloton. Let's have a look at this again. A bit of a wobble there. How he kept that up. Well, some real good skills there. And that was... Uh, Louis Jean Lewis keeping it up as well in the, in the green jersey for Bora Hansko, who, by the way, is on his monument debut. And monument debut that nearly ended in tears there. Yeah, it would have been a short one, wouldn't it? Uno X mobility now there on the right-hand right -hand side. Not too far away. You could see the figure of former winner. 2015 was when Alexander Kristoff won this race. There he is in third wheel. Just behind the very experienced Eva Lampard. They're still with that man in the move, remember, but for the first time in a long time. In fact, since the break established itself, Rob, the lead is now under three minutes. And I'll remind you, there's no singular chase. Not one team has decided to take things up. It's just multiple teams constantly vying for pole position with these multiple chains of direction, different changes in the width of the road. Look at the road we're on now. With very oh, another crash. Prang. And Mirko just about keeps that one safe in the end. We've had an issue there for one of the riders. It looks like Kellen O'Brien. 2-3-6 there is Victor Vokuyi, who was in the break the other day. And it's Luca de Meester from Bingo Wallonie Bruxelles. And this is happening often now. We've talked about the nerves. I always worry that we're over-exaggerating things, but unfortunately, Matt, the images tell us we aren't. And look at the riders again. Footpaths all the way. This time, just trying to avoid things. Yep. I mean, we know how complicated the, the road furniture is, but there was a, a, pennant, a pennant man clearly marked. It just happened. There's all these different compression points. And as well, the riders having to... There's no choice. Mm. The riders had mm. to hop onto the pavement to avoid actually laying the bike down. But again, that was actually very well marked out. Clearly signposts as well, there was a pen. It's just one of those things. This literally is a racing instant. It, it, it's it's uh, never good to see, but what other way? This is just the way it is. We are on open roads uh, in quite technical, uh, with a lot of technical road furniture as we head up the uh, Capella Berg. A, uh, a tarmac climb, I think, will be quite welcome for these riders after the brutality of the first ascent of the Quadamont. I'm trying to listen to the race radio here and relay information that comes in that we might not see on our screen, and it is chaotic at the minute. There's warning after warning, there's incident after incident, and now we're moving on to the Capella bag. Look at the fight for the left turn there over that little moat, and already we're getting riders caught up in those incidents, yep. and Bora Hansgrohe are sending riders back to wait for their leaders. It looks like that might be Nils Pollitt at the back of that group, or unless it's Vega State Langen. Not too sure, but anyway, we're zooming away now, but uh, that group should get back in contact. Vergada now on the front, Mats Pedersen sat behind, Tim Wellens looking very cool, calm and collected. The vast experience of Matteo Trentin also very well positioned there in the black, just in front of Fred Wright, the British road champion. The breakaway onto the Capellaberg, a reminder of what's coming up, because if this follows the pattern that we've seen a couple of moments ago, this is going to be chaotic, isn't it? Yeah. The hollow egg is straight after that. Then, after the 650-metre-long cobbled sector, they turn off to the Wolfenberg. Wolfenberg doesn't have any cobbles, but you've got 17% gradients. You can see these flags, the wind is blowing a gale. It's tailwind there, it becomes crosswind here. Positioning becomes more vital. After the Wolfenberg, they go to the Kirgata, 1.4 kilometres long cobbled sector. And then to the Jagere, and that's before a relative rest of cobbles and hills for around 8Ks, but there's the stress of the build-up to the Morlenberg, which is always a key point in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah. 
You've got all those, those climbs coming thick and fast, and the longest break in between them, there isn't even that long, it's like 11 k's. And half of that is going to be spent either chasing to get back on because you're too far back, or actually then building up for the next one. It's real on and off the pace. No real proper opportunity to recover. It looks a little bit calm now, but of course, the road's so narrow, there's no where to move up. So it's worth investing a little bit to buy yourself a little bit of space here. As you see another, well, basically, um, what looks like a bearded Cyclops in a Belgian jersey. I'm gonna, I'm scarred for life, I am, I tell you, Rob. <laughs> Love it. And I thought it was a hard watch seeing all the chaos in the peloton at the minute. Off we go, and here we go. Holloweg. On to the Holloweg, 650 metres of it, by the way. Full sectors, one and a half kilometres long. But we will turn off to the Wolfenberg. Of course, Wolfenberg moving forward from hill five to hill three. Replaces here, we would have had the Corte Kier at this point. This is the Capellaberg, uh, and we've had some sort of restoring of the pattern now because Alpacin de Koenig have moved Font de Paul towards the front. Lidl Trekker there, Fisma Lisa Biker there in conversation, and it's Alpacin de Koenig through Riesebeck who are just controlling the tempo on the hill. Yep. And look who's behind. You've got Soren Kraj Andersen on the wheel of Van der Poel as well. That's a, a one thing. You think, oh, let's get riders in front, but also you need a rider just behind as well. Now, this is one of the small chasing groups detached as a result of the crash. You can just see damage to the hip of one of these riders here. Miholjevic and Rajovic are seemingly out the game, you'd say, if they're not getting back in. Eddie is there, unless things really slow up in front. 2-4-3 is Jakob Eriksson. And this now is the front of the race. And bizarrely, these hills, at the moment, it's not going to be the case throughout the race, but these are the most controlled part of the racing. Yeah. Pretty calm at the front. This is the place to be. Most of the big favourites here. Mats Pedersen in the centre. Mathieu van der Poel just on the wheel of Axel Laurence there to Fred Wright looking good. Alexander Kristoff have spotted. Matteo Trentin still there. Lascano, this is the first little miss. And a move. Little move. And a move. Here Uno X decide to really go. This is hill number two of 17, the Capellaberg. Uno X. Of course, didn't make the breakaway today, but they have made a move. And this allowed, just through marking, Alpacin de Koenig to get a further man up the road. And that smart. might not be the worst thing for Mathieu von der Poel. That's a smart thing to do. They don't need to do any of the riding. They can actually knock it off. Soren Kraj Anderson has just moved into the front. Again, this compression, the lack of width in the road means that uh, it's, uh, once you get away, there's not a lot of other teams. If you've got a few teammates on the front, they're not going to chase. They can allow you to create that gap very quickly. There's the Cyclops over, over well, surveying the scene, and you can really see how strong the wind is blowing there. They pick up a tailwind just as they come through that left-hander. Uh, Julien Alaphilippe was quite near the front there as well. He's moved up. And we move to the Wolfenberg, hill number three. Big important sectors, the Ronde van Vlaanderen really starts to motor on. No cobbles here, but a maximum big gradient that really stings the legs. I always wonder so what's the atmosphere the rest of the year on these hills, because today it's a natural stadium, but you know, you've got people who order the shopping online here. What do they do? You know, they put like, I live on the Alde Quartermont or whatever. Now, the rider who has chased on, Jonas Abramsen, who we saw in such good form on Wednesday from Uno X, he, of course, was on the podium in Duarte of Vlaanderen. Yeah. And Axel Laurence, who's gone with him, is the under 23 world champion. Mathieu von der Poel hasn't sent a man up the road, he's had a man marking, and now everybody else must really start the work. It's a bit of a masterstroke, really. Yeah, there. it's a good move. You can just, I think that's Kasper Asgren's going as well. I think they've sent Avini up there. Avini on the front. Matteo Trentin marking too. Jorgensen sat second wheel at the moment. Now, this is very interesting. They're trying to bring this one back. They know they cannot afford to give Alperson de Koenig a, um, an armchair, really. So right now, all of his riders can sit back. Mathieu van der Poel's in a good position. And uh, we could see Axel Laurent flick his elbow. He's working. Yeah, so that's a good, a really interesting little move. The peloton looks small to me there. There was a split in halfway down that bunch there. Something wasn't right as David Decker is on the radio. He gets to the top of our next climb, the Wolfenberg, and we'll be heading off to 
the next set of cobbles. This is Jonas Abramsen, first ever podium in a cobble classic in the midweek. He's never won a pro bike race. Yeah, he's strong. I mean, the way, I mean, it was away all day. Got caught by the race winning move. Obviously, the pack was reduced because of the crashes, but then was strong enough to go away in the final as well. It was massively impressive. And you're quite right, Rob. This is reduced. I wonder if there's been, let's have a look. Maybe it was just coming back together there. Yeah, it does look like it's coming back together. But uh, Laurence is But look at this. I tell you what, Visma Lisa Bike do not want any Alpes in Koenig riders up the road. They do not want to con concede having the front foot as they hit the Wolvenberg. And they're hitting the Wolvenberg with one of their main men. Look at this. Visma Lisa Bike are on the move. Visma Lisa Bike are on the go. 112 kilometers remain. And Matteo Jorgensen, the winner of Duarte of Landre, is choosing to anticipate the world champion, Mathieu von der Poel, who stuck way down further in this hill. The man in the rainbow jersey has been spurned into action. Alongside him, the man, he took the rainbow jersey off, Julien Alaphilippe, and this is a turn up for the books. It's von der Poel's agents, his helpers, who are having to mark the move from a very confident, outspoken, flying the flag for the US and for his team, Matteo Jorgensen, and that is a big early statement. Just trying to see where Van der Poel is. He was, it didn't look like... I, I'm, I'm wondering if Jorgensen sent something, saw Van der Poel on a climb. All you need to do is look across at the power meter. The, all these riders know each other. There he is. It's not too far back. But that little move on the front, do you know what? That was a big flex. That was a flex. That was surprising on hill number two. Or three, sorry. I mean... I mean, we've got a lot of racing still to go. It, we may look back on that as a big mistake, but I tell you what, you don't do that unless you're feeling strong. He, what he doesn't want to do is stay too long in the wind. Might do it on a climb. Afini now takes over on the front. That's a smart move. He doesn't want to drag the bunch along here. Think back to smart Mathieu Van der Poel. Yeah. Think back to Mathieu Van der Poel. Think back to him shaking his legs. To when he went behind the car, there was a shake of the head from Rodolf, and it was like he was trying to get going and trying to get warm. Has he revved up the engine properly? Is it there? There's a split in the bunch here, again, with 110 kilometers still to go in the Ronde of Flandre. And how many climbs do we have left? We've got 14 climbs still to go. It was almost as if... I mean, I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I saw that, that Jorgensen was riding on the front. I thought it was a teammate bringing it back. I mean, 110 k's to go. The break at 1 minute 37. And he's riding. Yeah, they're still riding as if it's, it's very, very interesting. The Mads Pedersen is there. Where is the world champion? There is Julian Alaphilippe. There he is. And he's just about 15th or 20th back, riding very patiently. Th this could be just a decision for himself to think, I'm just going to ride a bit further back, let everybody else do what everybody thought I would do. Maybe he's riding, riding in a counterintuitive way, or maybe... Jorgensen has sent something and says, I just want to make and this... And now Pedersen, now go. Mars Pedersen on the move. Battered, bruised, banged, and still with over 100 kilometres to go, it's clear that there is a mood, a move, to try and take it to the world champion before he rides them all off his wheel. Fantastic stuff. Well, we saw that. I remember speaking to Mads Pedersen about, uh, about this very race, and he said the way to take things up is early is as early as you can. Look at the splits here. You were right, Rob. I don't know if it's just because of the acceleration on the last climb on the Wolvenberg that split things, because this, this peloton has exploded so far, and that's why we're seeing a willingness of riders to, to keep on riding at the front as they do another change of direction. Riders fighting to get back into contention here. Well, still triple digits in terms of kilometres to go. And this race has really come to life. And take a look at this group, because there may be some casualties. I can assure you that not many were expecting favourite and second favourite to be up there having to follow each other with 112 k's to go. And then third favourite to attack two k's later. It's brilliant. Absolutely fantastic stuff. This is Rex, isn't it? Laurence Rex goes clear. This is a man of real power. And he's being followed by Visma Lisa bike. And this looks like Afini, I think, is going to chase him. Yep, Afini now has a look over his shoulder. This is back to the breakaway. The gap now. All of that action has meant that they've lost the best part of another minute. One minute and 31 seconds. Still, I can't believe it, Rob. 108 k's to go. And two of the pre-race favourites have already lit the blue touch paper and started to show their hand. Eight riders still at the front of the Ronde van Vlaanderen with 108 kilometres to go. 
but for how much longer? We're on the Kergata, cobbled sector four. To the Yagare after this as Rex looks behind. And we look at a completely blown apart peloton. You've got no more than 50 to 60 riders in the first part. Yep. Then there's a gap, and you'd say the second half of it there, with the strugglers and stragglers after that. This is Rex left hand side. Pithy there as well on the right to take just putting the bottle in between his teeth. God, he does position himself well, doesn't he? Melia really through does. the centre. Yep. Milan has made the front group. There's Mohoric. In the meantime, there's an oh. issue here for Sylvain Dillier for um, pardon me for Suren Kraut. This is the last thing that they want to happen because he's got Dillier's bike here. So there's already been one issue. I think clearly Dillier's given him the bike, isn't he? No, there's a real issue. And they're trying to sort it between them. Different sizes. Dillier said, no, hang on a minute. They're, they're wearing the different numbers that we've got in the programme. So Dillier is still on his own bike. And uh, Soren Krau is on his own. They've just got different numbers. They're five and six rather than the other way around. A late change to the yeah. advertised <laughs> schedule. Really threw us out then. Well, that's the way the Ronde of Vlaanderen is today. <laughs> well, a lot going on, Rob. 108 kilometres to go, and this is the first little bit of regrouping. Binyam Girmay had been caught out in that second part of the peloton. He moves in there. You do wonder whether that little move uh, by Jorgensen wasn't... I mean, but he saw Van der Poel was misplaced, was just a little salvo just to see what happened, and saw there was a few riders starting to struggle, and is clearly feeling good. And you wonder if his mentality has shifted a little bit. You know, we know, the thing is, we know how smart that Matteo Jorgensen is. And he wouldn't have done something like that just on field, just for the hell of it. Not with so much at stake. He's one of the big favourites for this race. He's already won big on two occasions this year. He's proven on this sort of terrain. It was a really interesting one. It really was. There's definitely a reason behind it. And I'm wondering if he did said something to send something in the world champion or saw that it was rather struggling. He just wanted to turn the screw a little bit more because he could. Sometimes, as our, as our colleague Adam Blyther said before, sometimes you feel like you've got diamonds in your legs. You just feel that good. You can afford just to squeeze it, just to see what happens without investing too much. It was fascinating to see, especially that counter punch from Mads Pedersen shortly afterwards. Incredible. Take a breath. This Melissa bike, who haven't won the Ronde of Vlaanderen since the Rabobank era. Rolf Sorensen, 1997, their last winner. They had the master plan last year. Didn't quite work. Apart from that, having to miss out again this year. They're missing Laporte, they're missing Tratnik. But alongside local hero Benoit, the Duarte of Vlaanderen winner from this year, Jorgensen and Roubaix. Duarte of Landre and former Omlopit Newsblad winner from recent seasons from Badler. They have a squad that says its tactics have changed and they'll now be underdogs. Well, tactics change. If they're freed, they're already having digs. Yeah, I wouldn't call them underdogs. Uh, I, I would call they, them... They allowed themselves yeah, to be called I, I think, underdogs. Well, I, I guess when, when, you, when you think about the, the class that they've actually lost, uh, and I, I guess I, I know what they mean, but blimey, they've still got such a strong team. They really, really have. The likes of Benut, Jorgensen, Van Baal, he'll be back in the mix as well. But yeah, a little bit of a calming now. Trenton moves up on the inside in the black jersey in the centre of your screen. That was a Magnus Sheffield of the Ineos Grenadiers. Yeah, so a collective drawing of breath here as the peloton gets back to uh, what it looked like before. Still quite a few riders out the back, but expect more of this. And what is next on the menu? The next section on the menu is the the Jagali, the Jagali, sorry. It's the next cobbled sector. Yep, Jagali here through Martyr. Listed monument by the Flemish government since 2004. Coming off that now. Uh, at the front of the race. Was Kergata. Starts just before that. And after the Jagere, well, we then head in towards the final 100 kilometres. There's Vincenzo Albanese on the inside, the we were talking about earlier on, just on the wheel of Chris Nylands, the Italian in the red of Arkea B&B hotels. There's a 
And a drop bottle there. And there's some movement here from the breakaway. Onto the Yagare. Avoiding the speed bump, just about opting for two sides of the road. Find, trying to find that. Uh, well, we, we miss you, is the message. Well, we miss you. You don't need to necessarily speak Flemish to understand that one. On to the Yagare, and the cobbles are dry now, but look at that, Matt. Drop or two of rain on the lens. I'm looking out of our window at the finish line. The clouds are lower. The wind's up. The wind is up. They're greyer. They may be about to deposit their wares on the fields, roads, and, crucially, cobbles of Flanders. It's going to make it treacherous. I tell you what, if, if it just rains a little bit, that's worse than if it just absolutely pours down with rain. Um, it just keeps the oils and the silt just on the top, makes it very slippery. The cobbles are, the cobbles are slippery enough, as we know, but just with a little bit of, of, of rain, you have to treat them with even more caution. They become even more treacherous, given the multiple corners that we have. Lots of different change of direction, especially with the wind blowing as well. There's so many different impact factors. That's what makes this race so stressful, Rob, so chaotic, is all the different change of direction. The, the surface changes, and then the wind changes as well, as Soren Cray Anderson, thankfully for Alberson de Koenig, double denimed up to the max, gets back onto the back of the peloton. I just look at the speed of the riders going around those corners, and I had a glance down at our time schedule, because, I mean, it, this is bike race, and it always looks fast. But look at this. We are over five minutes faster at this point than our fastest predicted time schedule, which would be at 44 kilometers per hour. This is a rapid ronda until now. It's not going to slow down again. And we had a record-breaking Milano San Remo. And this is the constant theme. It's what I, I, I feel that I'm talking about so much in modern racing, Rob, is just the races are getting faster and faster, more aggressive for so many different reasons. The races are opening up so much earlier. And even the first part of the day, we had a cross headwind as well. So it's not as if they've been blown to this point with a raging tailwind. They haven't. It's just been fast. It took a while for the break to go clear. They were never given too much leeway, maxed out at four minutes and five seconds. They've now got a lead of one minute and 38 seconds, still with over 100 kilometers to go. As one of the most experienced riders in the peloton, Yves Lampard moves up on the inside. Oof. You don't want to be handing up a bottle there. That's, you'll take your arm off at that speed. Blimey. Regarda looking around, right from Needle Trek. Tish Panut in the centre there, with Jorgensen on his wheel. Jorgen, think about when Jorgensen was doing that move, Rob. He looked so calm. Mm. He looked utterly in control, didn't he? He looked so calm, so I'm cool. I'm glad you mentioned that. Things are about to stop being calm if they were at any point before. We are now less than four kilometres from the Morlenberg. The Molenberg that really does signify switch on time if it wasn't before. The Molenberg, we head into the municipality of Zwalm, famous for its wind, its water mills, and of course, Jolindora country. But today, it's to the Molenberg we're ahead. You have to position yourself properly going into this. The road will narrow significantly. The rain Whoa. is starting to fall that little bit more. And the fight for position in the Ronde of Vlaanderen is probably at its most fierce than at any other point. Yeah. The thing is, the gaps are going to accentuate as well. If it does continue to fall like this, it's just a few spots at the moment, but if it does start to fall, as is indeed forecast, it could become very, very stressful indeed. It'll completely and utterly accentuate um, the length of the peloton as riders drop off the wheel behind, cautiously pick their way through these technical bends. And even, I think, with the best knowledge that you have, there's so, it's such a complex circuit that you're just in the midst of racing, then the next turn comes, it's a right, it's a left. It's very hard to get yourself dialed. The place to be is actually at the front. But look, look at the wind as well. Yeah. Look at the wind here. If that's happening in the breakaway, this could well happen now in the peloton. And if you didn't need another spanner in the works, tough luck. We have one. 
the Rana for Vlaanderen is exploding in front of us, and we still have 101 kilometers to the finish line. Yep, still the best part of two and a quarter, right? About two hours 15, two hours 20 at this speed. So, two, well, 170 k's in the legs of these riders, and the race is just starting to hot up. We've seen a few flurries, a few parries. Matteo Jorgensen on the offensive. Shortly afterwards, Mads Pedersen too, just for fun. It was almost as if to sort of counter it. Well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to have a go as well, just to see what happened. Exciting. A shout behind the nerves of fraying. <laughs> that was Dan Haller. His teammate just trying to calm things down a little. Through the centre, Tim Wellens is right there in the wind himself. He knows that at the Morlenberg, you have to be in the right place. Yep. It's interesting he's got no teammates around him. Again, but it's uh, very difficult. I mean, there's not a lot of colour blocking here, let's be honest with you. It's so chaotic. We've had that many crashes and splits that riders are just fighting for position themselves. I mean, really, everybody's all over the place right now. Elia Viviani just towards the back of that group, having done a fair bit of work earlier on for the Ineos Grenadiers. 1 minute 37 seconds, so it's staying steady now, the gap. But as you say, Rob, we're not too far away from the Mollenberg. In fact, I think the break, we're nearly on it in the next half a minute or so. Yep, the old water mill at the bottom of the hill will soon come into view. The Molder Gamola. A water mill like the Cobblestone Road itself, listed as a monument. One of the hardest things about the Mollenberg is this. That turn, the little bridge across the water. So narrow, Some of the roughest cobbles you will find in Flanders. Ladies and gentlemen, we're into the final 100 kilometres of the Ronde of Flandre. This is happening now. The race is already underway. You fight on the cobbles to be on the podium, and these are some of the hardest of the lot. Yep, just see how small that little left-hander is. In about a minute's time, Rob, we are going to face this left-hander. They're moving into a headwind here. That's because you can see that's determined by the shape at the front. Good riding by DSM Fermanick NL on the left-hand side. Three riders on the right in the yellow of Team Visma Lisa bike, but that it's such a narrow pinch point. It's going to really thin out as they hit that left-hander. Van der Poel was there on the left-hand side as we looked at it right inside. Now, no teammates around him. He's following the train of riders for DSM, Firmenic Postenel. Just behind the riders, you can see on your screen there, in the blue, white and orange, there's the rainbow jersey. Yep. Left-hand side, you can see Dan is looking for his teammates. He can't find them from Needle Trek. They're out of position here, and if there's an incident on this small bridge across the water before you get to to the famous windmill, it is not the place to be caught out. Here they go, moving up the right hand side, and now then there's an extra acceleration from Barla moves in as well. At the front, you can see Jorgensen is the man yeah. actually following the wheel now. He's following with the Pedersen. Pedersen's been led into that climb. Von der Poel doing the same. Left hand yeah. turn. Here we go. One of the most important pinch points in the whole of the Tour of Flanders. <laughs> Cut right across it. We actually ended up on the dirt there. To see the angle almost went at exactly 90 degrees. Fred Wright being bolt might have to put his foot down. Look how slow they're having to put their feet they're down stopped. here. They are stopped at yep. the bottom. Anybody who's missed the boat there has had to make a big effort. And now oh. Mars Pedersen takes off. 100 kilometers remain as Mars Pedersen wants to test his rivals on the Morlenberg. Jorgensen is the first to follow. Van der Poel is reacting better this time. He's having to come through a lot of traffic and a lot of way behind, but he's starting to get going. Metronomic Mathieu is now tapping the legs and he's under the wheel of Jorgensen towards the top of one of the hardest climbs in Flanders. 100 k's remain and already the three pre-race favourites are at the front of the race. Yeah, and one of the other pre-race favourites is trying to get across the act, Stefan Kung, the Swiss rider from Groupama FDJ, out of the saddle, trying to get across with Adrian Petit, I think it is on his wheel. A couple of other riders, there's some big, big splits. Pull it now, trying to drag himself and Valens across the gap for you, E.T. Memorance. Degen Kolb has blown up over the top. Christoph rolls over too. There is Christoph at the front as he comes over the top of the Morlenberg. Betiol further behind and at the front of the race, Benoit making it good numbers for Visma Lisa bike because Jorgensen's here here. Benoit's there at the back and soon at the race, maybe Evgeny Fedorov because that is far too far back. Yep. At the back of the race, riders being completely lashed. So, so hard at the top. I mean, that peloton 
hit the bottom of the climb. OK, spread out. It's the best part of a minute to the last rider still in the bunch. These big splits have occurred, but that is an elite group of riders. You called it over the top there, Rob. Three of the three pre-race favourites with 99 k's to go have risen to the top. Absolutely fascinating stuff here. Three riders from a Visma Lisa bike in the mix there. Impressive stuff. Jorgensen happy to do the pacemaking on the front here. He wants a hard race. It suits him. He needs a hard race as Father Paul comes through. He's not quite going to pull through too much yet. Looks behind him. Also, there is, uh, looks to be one of the Van Derke brothers. You can just see as well, Pithy's in the group. Behind is Wellens. Also making a cross there That's was yeah. one of the rivals, was actually uh, Nils Pollitt. And now I think this is maybe Wellens who's going to go. Yep, Wellens is on the wheel there. Oh, that's a Tish Benoit. Benoit goes. Benoit Pithy. I've got, to, I've got to cross. Great. But they, they, as soon as they've got numbers at the front, they're attacking again. And the tactics here, they talked about changing them. The climb start to come thick and fast. And look at the wind blowing across the road, right to left as we look at it. 98 k's to go. That's going to change. It'll be headwind around the corner here. And now they head to the Marlboro Strat. Wow. Tish Benoit driving this little group. Tim Wellens in the slipstream there. And it's Tim von Dijk. Tim there? van Dijk, yeah, indeed. Well, Mads Pedersen's going to have to pull here as well. Mads Pedersen now, second wheel, looks around, but on his wheel is another Visma Lisa bike rider, the national champion of the Netherlands. Van Baal is looking pretty decent here. Matty Bohoric on his wheel. I can tell you that Binyam Germay, unfortunately, has missed that group. No Binium Germay there for Ander Malshe, perhaps still suffering from his own injuries in the midweek. We're flying down the hill now and we're heading to the Marlboro Strat. There is the Flying Dutchman as we go down the hill. The Flieger and the Hollander. It's super visible here that uh, although Visma Lisa Bike have said they're the underdogs, any time the race comes back together, they've always got numbers. They're all, they always want to be on the front foot, never on the back. That's why we get in these attacks so early. You think, well, why is Van Dijk attacking? It's because it means the others can rest and it creates chaos and disruption behind. They're always attacking. It's fascinating to see. They've clearly got a clear instruction and it's to make it as hard as they can for everybody else. They're riding into a block headwind up the Marlborough Strat here. 97 kilometers to go. And the breakaway suddenly only has 53 seconds. Yep. It's kicking off behind them on the Marble Strat. And remember, from here, we get another series of big climbs. Ala Philippe wants to go. He wants to get up the road here, and he's going to be chased straight away. Yep, Vermeer's on his wheel. Jean Vermeer's the former gravel. And it looks as here, though yeah. that Lidl Trek want to be involved. Squinch. This time through Squinch. Ala Philippe there. Uno X in the chase, move after move after move. This time Visma Lisa Bike missed it and they must chase themselves. And this time it's Jorgensen who's doing the chasing. Also involved there, one of the riders from the Ineos Grenadiers, that particular rider is Magnus Sheffield, the American. And behind him is Stefan Kuhn. Alaphilippe goes for a second time. Yep, Alaphilippe goes again. He's got a teammate there as well. Some little splits occurring here. Van der Poel Van der Poel. knows, yeah, he's got to go He's here. missed that group, yep, he's missed the group. And he has to go across. Pearson has to follow him. Yeah. He can't allow Jorgensen, Alaphilippe and others to go up the road. Alaphilippe's been brought back by Jean Vermeersch. Pollitt was there as well. Trentin was there. Sheffield. That was far too far of a dangerous move. And Jorgensen really does have legs today. He's got bundles of energy on the roads of Flanders to say that there are 96 k still to ride. He's just got to be a little bit careful that he doesn't. I mean, um, again, I'm almost like feeling I need to say to him, just whoa. But I don't know, I love it. I, I love the way he's riding, but I'm just, it's a long way to go. Are these not the tactics, though, for Visma Lisa bike? To just cause chaos, try and tire out Van der Poel and see if they could take advantage with somebody as we get another move. This time it's Pollitt. Yep, Pollitt. Big, big engine from Pollitt. Nylance also there for Israel Premier Tech, another very smart rider, latched onto third position here. Jan Vermeersch always present there from Alperson de Koenig. And another group, this Owen Duhl, also mm. sat there just in front of Lawrence Peter. The first time we've seen anybody from EF Education Easy Post in that black kit. Yep. So Duhl has really established himself as a pretty decent classics rider, hasn't he? We went through and passed the Flying Dutchman pub on the corner there. And every time a move has gone far, it has been the Dutch team Visma Lisa bike. And now from Barla's making his move. Left hand side, we've cut away from it, but Van Baal is making his move. Here he is. Dylan Van Baal with a former teammate on his wheel. 
It's kind of, is that Ben Turner on his way? Yes, it is indeed Ben Turner. Bonolt wants to come across. He's going to chase this. And if they can get two riders in here, oh, well, how would Alpacin de Koenig react to that? Tell you what, I, th I tell you, it looks like it is actually Oliver Narsen as well. It is Oliver Narsen there in the green and blue of Decathlon AG2R trying to get in the mix. Meanwhile, the break, oh, 24 seconds. Well, they finished on the Marlborough Strat now, and they will head towards the Berendries, which is one of the most horrible hills in Flanders. Break this is here. a very, very good group. There is no Mathieu Fodderpool. There is, of course, a Dylan van Barla. There's a Tish Benoit, so that's two riders from Visma Lisa Bike. Little Trekker involved. Squeens, I think. And Fodderpool's got to be careful here. Again, if you're him, though, what do you do? You can't chase every move, he's got a no. teammate up there. There's other teams that have missed it, though, here. You've got EF Education, Easy Post, Dual driving on the front, uh, Uno X have missed it as well, and there we go. There must have been a bit of an issue um, for the leader, Alberto Betiel of EF Education, Easy Post. They're all on the front trying to bring it back together, but they're a long way down here. This is Group 2, Group 1's up the road. This race is split to pieces. Ben, ben Turner now driving clear. Ineos Grenadiers with Ben Turner making his move from the chase Pedersen group. Pedersen in this move. Pedersen in the group for Lidl Trek. Behind you've got Tish Benot, who's willing to contribute. Remember, there's a bit of an optical illusion here because he doesn't look like he's got a teammate, but he has. His teammate is the Dutch champion, Dylan van Barla. And I'm looking behind DSM Firmenich Postenel when I get across. This is a good little move, you know, because Gianni Vermeersch is the only teammate of Mathieu van der Poel in this group. And this is a group full of big, big engines. So difficult to collect your thoughts and see what's happening on the road. So at our quick step, have a rider coming across. They also have a rider in this group. Two riders from Checo Alula. Rider there from Decathlon is waiting back, maybe ready to help come across. This group knows it's about to have company. And, of course, if Oliver Nazen's coming across, it's a great opportunity for Decathlon, so it's no surprise that Touze will be told to wait there and help tow this group across. Yeah, and there's a couple of... And members. there he is, he's gone to the front and he's going to help to tow the group. Yeah, Nazen looking good. At the back, not doing any work at all. Is that Tim Merlier in this group as well? It is Tim Merlier. Yep, good riding by Merlier. Let's have a look at the gap to the peloton behind it. I've already mount. It's going to be... Oof. It's six and sevens, isn't it? Another group going, being followed this time. And looking back to Lascano in this group, you can see there is uh, the Van der Poel, there's Fred Wright. He's almost sitting back now and saying, look, it's up to you. I've got a man in the move. It's not... Well, he's got a teammate up there. This is now going to slow down. This could... Well, 94 k's to go. Rob, that is a very dangerous move of some of, of some of, of a selection of the pre-race favourites. This is going to be difficult now. He's going to have Van der Poel is going to have to run other teams. A Van Vala up the road is always a day. Exactly. Van Vala Pedersen up the road, Benut, Pollitt. Whew. Somebody. And that is uh, former minister Herman de Croo. Watching on from the sidelines. I know that the current Belgian Prime Minister was out yesterday riding the sport if we ride Flanders. Stuff. Uh, that's his uh, son, of course, Alexander de Croo, who was riding yesterday. It's Brent van Moor is the other rider in that group with Pedersen, by the way, sorry. So there's going to be two Lotto Destiny riders at the front once these groups merge, which is going to be in a couple of seconds' time, one would imagine. We get to Michel Becker, and that means one thing. That means it's time for the Berendries. A narrow 940 metre long 7% average gradient climb. Former rider Frederick Backert has his farm at the left hand side here. And as the riders come together at the front of the race, this is the new group leading. They go up the Berendries, and this is a mightily dangerous group at the front of the Tour of Flanders. Chasers are there. They're led by other riders, including the world champion and pre-race favourite Mathieu von der Poel. Mathieu von der Poel and one of his own big rivals there chasing on, of course, is Stefan Kung, is Julien Alaphilippe, is Jordi Meus, and now van der Poel himself comes on the right-hand side. This is chaos, glorious chaos yeah, on the roads of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah, Andre Pascolon moving up there, the Italian for Bahrain. Bahrain have missed it, Movistar have missed it, Tudor Pro Cycling have missed it, but tell you what, Visma, Lisa Bike have not, and they've got one 
of the best riders on this sort of terrain, Tish Benut. Although he's battle scarred, he's clearly riding strongly. Look at the gradient here as it kicks up. But this, this is a very interesting move. Renders, who was in the breakaway this morning, has been shelled out the back. Oyer Lascano makes his move from this chasing group. Von der Poel wants to follow this one. Trentin is going as well. You can see, too, that there are other riders coming up. There is Von der Poel. Jorgensen finds himself a little further back this time. Yeah, some little gaps having up. Fred right there on the wheel of uh, Matteo Trentin, following uh, Loyal Lascano. Big engine, Lascano always willing to press on on the front. Trentin goes straight over the top, right in the slipstream of the Italian. And it's Kung, or is it Pithy now bringing... Uh, it still Looks like Kung to me. Front of the race, 21 seconds of a gap towards the top of the beard, and Dries being led by Tish Benot and his teammate, Dylan Fumbala. This now is Fred Wright, the British champion. Lascano, national champion of Spain, and now the world champion towards the top of the beard, and Dries makes his first real acceleration in a while. Yep. Fred White looks over his shoulder, so you've got the British champion, the Spanish champion, the world champion at the top. They've narrowed the gaps, 21 seconds now to the front group, and Van der Poel actually doing a pull on the front now. He knows this could be a critical piece of the race, still a long way to go, 91 kilometres, Rob, still around two hours of racing as Van der Poel takes that corner at speed, out of the saddle, Lascano shuts him down, Kung on the wheel. Van der Poel's on the radio as well maybe asking for a little assistance here from the car. Yep. What, what does he do? When does he go? What does he follow? Can he follow everybody? It's Fred Wright who goes next. And by the way, with Abramson on his wheel, they're going to quite a fast descent here. Yep. A good little stealth move there. Movistar also going over the top. Little Trek shutting the gaps. There we go. There's one teammate of uh, the world champion there just moving through. Remember, we don't... I'm not too sure if Soren Kai Anderson has managed to get back in the mix. He's going to be a key, key rider, but meanwhile, this group are dialed. 90 kilometres to go in the Ronde of Flandre. We've had six of the 17 hills over the top of the Berendries. The leaders now are Gianni Vermeers, Lawrence Rex, Bert van Leeberge, Tish Benoot and Dylan van Baal, both of Lee Visma Lisa bike. Oliver Nasser with Damian Touze. Ben Turner, Mars Pedersen, one of the pre-race favourites, alongside Luke Durbridge, Niels Pollitt, Lionel Tamigno and Brent von Moore. It's 13 riders. Doesn't look like such an unlucky group. There are some big names in there. And the world champion, Mathieu von der Poel, yes, has a rider at the front. He's got two but he's now. But yeah. he finds himself back, doesn't he? He does indeed. I think it's Axel Laurence, the Frenchman, making his debut in this race, he's been tasked with trying to bring this gap, and he won't be able to do it back on his own, that's for sure. They'll soon be... They'll soon have them in sight on this stretch of road, but a block headwind for one rider against the, the raw power of that group out in front. Crash There's another behind, crash. Crash behind and involved this time is the number 73, Emil Herzog, youngest rider under X, the former winner, 2016 winner, Alexander Christoph, who has an issue there. And this is a Ronde van Vlaanderen. As the rain continues to fall, that is non-stop is crazy that is so difficult to keep tabs on it's all happening everywhere it certainly is oh decathlon ag2r i've rode a blinder so far today with two in this uh, group damian Touze and uh, oliver narsen good riding by tim Merlier. his a teammate has gone but pursued our quick steps not been a bad day so far and meanwhile there we go, the world champion has three teammates on the front will there be any other riders any other teams that have missed out Tell you who is there, though. Soren Kraj Anderson is back in the mix. A real test of Alpacine de Koenig, then. Yeah. And a test of resolve for any of the other teams as to whether they get involved or whether they bluff, gamble, and say, Alpacine de Koenig, you must do all the work because you'll have the world champion. It looks right now there's nobody else who's going to help them. 21 seconds, Laurence now on the front. Still a long, long way to go as we look a little bit further back. A few spots of water on the lens as the former European champion one of the most experienced riders in the race tries to get back in contact. It's going to be hard, though, isn't it? This rain, actually, not quite... Pre yeah, it is starting to fall now, Rob. It's properly starting to fall. the finish line as well, yeah. Yet. The rain has arrived in Flanders for the final 89 kilometres of the race, so the damage is going to be done on the cobble sectors and on the hills. This Tour of Flanders is turning into quite the test. There's 
so many good riders. This, this isn't a group of chances. This is a group of real engines. That's the difficulty that Albers and de Koenig have got. I mean, look at just the class. You know, Vermeersch is going to be sat on, but the power of Lawrence Rex, uh, Benut, Van Baal, Narsen, Turner, Pedersen, Pollitt, uh, and the two riders from Lotto, Destiny, Tamanio and Van Moel. There are some big, big engines here, but they've managed to pull a couple of seconds back, 19 seconds. But it, I wouldn't say it's do or die. There's still a lot of racing to go. And there's some other big teams that have missed it that are potentially throwing away their chances here. Groupama F. De Jure haven't committed. Bahrain victorious. Tudor Pro Cycling to a lesser extent. Even the squad in the red Una X mobility, but they don't really need to chase here. They've got them back in sight, but it is now. They need to bring this back because this is exceptionally dangerous. Tishpin note at the front of the Tour of Flanders crashed well over 10 days ago now. Look at this, just looking at the road surface there, that, that little light covering of rain, that's what makes this so slippery and so, so dangerous, especially coming into these corners. You know, the, the tyre technology is far better than it used to be, but still, when the rain just starts to fall, it's when it's at its most dangerous. Give my back in this group. They're not hanging around here. They are really piling on the pressure. Back of the main peloton you're looking at now. Hang on for your life if you can. There's here, sheep. <laughs> yeah, if you're not feeling good, that's not the place to be. Another solitary second have been taken off. It's a good ride, this, though, by Alpecin de Koenig. It and Fonderpool's committing his team here as they come through near the Brackel. And they're heading, by the way, towards Brackel, home of the legendary Peter von Petergem. Winner of the Ronde on two occasions and towards the Falkenberg, which is our next climb coming right up here. This is the hard thing. When you've been riding on the on the flat, you've got three riders. As soon as you hit a climb, it changes. It's so hard to keep that momentum going, especially when you've got the likes of this man on the front, Dylan van Baal. Even a not fully fit Dylan van Baal is mightily powerful. Hill number seven of 17, the Falkenberg. Climbing near the Brackle that used to be cobbled, by the way. First included in the late 1950s, stayed in the route until 1970. But some clown decided to put some asphalt on it in 1973. Here we go. Here we go. Pole, I think. Here we go. Yep. The world champion takes off on the Falkenberg. His teammates doing the work to close the gap. And it's acceleration by the man in the rainbow jersey who decides that he has to take the bait has to make the move, and look at how he gets across. Just a few hundred metres on the Falkenberg is all he needs to close the gap and put out the first fire that has been raging for the last 20 kilometres. It's going to take a lot out of him, but look, look what's happened here. You've got Tom Schoins, Matteo Jorgensen for the first time on the back foot here as well. Pithy just a couple of spaces back there as well. One of the rods from EF Education, not too sure if it was Betiol or, or Duhl, but good riding there by the world champion. Great riding by his team. Latched on the back almost anonymously now. He's not going to say a word. Just let the others keep on ride, uh, keep keep on riding. They're probably not even aware. They might be now because the TV pictures in the team car. But what does Jorgensen do now? Does he drag the rest of these riders across the gap? Scoyne's the same, remember. Does Scoyne's really want to bring Jorgensen back in the mix now as Pedersen, Pedersen hits the front? Just as Van der Poel had made contact, Pedersen goes. Van Bala can't follow. Neither can Benoit. This is the first problem for Visma Lisa Bike. They've been brilliant tactically till now, but Alpacin de Koenig stays strong and he's marking. Gianni Van Meers is doing a sterling job today. Absolutely. Like you say, 12th in this race last year. He's a smart, smart rider. He really, really is. Doesn't need to do a turn. Of course he's not going to do a turn. You know, but you don't want to drag a, a rider like this around. It just makes, for the first time in a while, Van der Poel can breathe. He can breathe now because it's up to the other teams. It's up to Visma Lisa Bike, who then had the advantage. And the beautiful thing about the complexities of this race, the power dynamics in the race constantly keep shifting. Van der Poel on the back foot. Now he's now it's little trek on the front foot. Van der Poel can rest up a little bit. Fascinating stuff. But also Pedersen clearly absolutely flying. And from what we can see so far, doesn't look like he's been too adversely affected by the laydown midweek. And he's dragging Vermeer's clear now. But look at this, still two hours of racing on the clock 85 kilometers remaining in one of the fastest tour of flanders we are ever likely to see such a good race so far really is been exciting it's polly i think isn't it oh, no, it's 
it's not quite stuck along in at the right back. at the back. Sorry, my mistake there. Groups Riders the getting back on. Seven seconds for Pearson. And he has Gianni van Meers with him, former gravel world champion. Good cross rider. Pearson, former world road champion, but yet to win a monument. That is his big aim. Yeah, twice a winner, as we know, of Gent Vabelgem. Took that world title. It's somewhat a surprise, wasn't it, in some of those atrocious conditions. But now he's quite clearly one of the best riders in the world. But Rebels, as soon as the rain starts to fall, it's when he comes into his own. Mm. Apparently never rides on the turbo trainer, and he's got a special bike that he rides in the winter to cut through the snow drifts. Whatever the weather, Pedersen is out riding in it. He really is as tough as they come. Mars Pedersen still has an anchor on his back wheel but he's still managing to eke out the seconds. And behind, they'll chase him, but it's not a concerted chase, so that is why the seconds are able to go out there. Is this Corbin Strong? I think it is Corbin Strong, by he's the looks of it. been put into this race to try and discover, and he's certainly discovering that he is strong. Now then, keep your eye on this behind, because Visma Lisa Bike are playing their next card. They want to make sure they're represented at any move that comes as we now head towards Berktenalto, which comes in around 10 kilometers time. So there's time for the tactical play games to play out here on the open road before we get to our next climb. You've got, you've got to admire just the, the verve and the panache of Mads Pedersen here. Really love it, attacking from a long way out. If you can't beat him, join him. Just exposes the weaknesses of other teams and you've got to back yourself as well as there's a big attack by Turner I think it is on the left hand side of Ineos Grenadiers oh, no, it's Tarling isn't it's it? Tarling oh. who's going to chase and Jorgensen who knows that's a good engine yeah Medellin is there he's having a great Tour of Florida so far today Betiol has made it into the front group as well starts to show himself in that black jersey and pink helmet and keep your eye on Fodderpool who awoke from his slumber, who's following. Now then, it's Connor Swift. Yeah, good move. Already been on the ground today, remember? Ben Swift as well. Owen Doyle won't do it. I don't think Owen Doyle will directly chase a former teammate of his. Straight over the top. Vermeer's still not taking a turn. He's doing exactly what he has to do here. Yeah, sat on. And, uh, of course, Pedersen knows that. He's not even going to ask for a turn. There's no problems there. Although, is that... Vermeer's going to drift in front. It is. Well, right now, there we go. First Clearly, time. maybe it's been said, right, put the pressure on the, on, on the Visma Lisa bike. That's probably what it is. Fascinating. Given a little bit of freedom. Yeah, it is, fasc it, it, it is enormously fascinating. Oh. A big, big crash in the round of Flandre. Cortina's involved. Kung's, Kung's involved, and it's the umpteenth stroke of bad luck for Kung. There's anger there oh. towards Kiss Ball, and the anger's coming from the rider from Lotto Destiny. Oh, my word. The bikes are tangled up. 197 there from Lotto Destiny is the angry rider, and I can tell you that is Brenton Mood. Covey. And this is Alex Alessandro Corvi who's down. It looks as though we won't be seeing more of Alessandro Corvi today. It's been a chaotic race, isn't it? So, so, I mean, and what happens when, when you get a, a bit of wet, the brakes are, effect, even with disparate, it's just, it's just far more stressful on the road when it's like that, clearly. We don't know what's happened. I would imagine a touch of wheels, but there we go. It's the end of the race for Kovic, possibly Case Ball as well. Well, Case Ball was the recipient, wasn't he, of the anger from Brentford Moore there. Let's see what happened. Oh, and look at that right inside. It looks the as though in the crowd. It looks as though ball went down in the crowd. It looked like somebody's arm went mm. up and caught somebody. Oof. And the right inside, just managing to avoid that, was Chris Nylons. Fred Wright as well. Is Tarling actually down in that one as well? And that's Alessandro Corvi still down. It looks a little collarbone I'm afraid, that one. Yeah. And with ball back on his bike, he will continue. So Alessandro Corvi, the big casualty there. Of a run of a Vlaanderen that is not giving any pardons to anybody. It certainly isn't. Unforgiving, unrelentless, high-octane, high-entertainment for all of us watching. K-1 
chaotic. And well, it's going to be the survival of the fittest today. It certainly is. This is a big play as well by, by Mads Pedersen. We know how strong he is. We know how good he looked in Gent Wervel game. Not just in winning it, but just the manner he won it as well. And the way he was climbing. And the couple of big accelerations he's put in today. Um, enormously impressive. But he could almost say, let's not, let's just leave him out there for a bit. Do you know what I mean? Um, they said it, it don't, don't think this is a big chase at the front with it. This is Van Dyke going. Visma Lisa Bike do not want to be forced to chase. They want to send riders up the road. That's very interesting. So on Krause, straight on it, Velens in the slipstream of the Dane. Kiss for Oscar in there in fourth wheel. Oscar in himself now is going to come move. through. And we know how good he is at this. And everybody should know that he is not somebody to be messed with. Keep your eye on that, because Kispert Askren going away in any bike race is always a key point. Fonapol knows that, he's straight on the radio, and he tells his teammates that he does not want yep. Askren up the road. Exactly, but this is great at the moment. I mean, although Mads Pedersen is a big, big engine and a big race favourite, this is a big, this is a, I mean, even by the stretches of what we've seen some of the big riders these days do. 81 k's to go in Strada Bianca, this was nearly 90 k's to go and Pedersen opened it up. This is a big, big gamble. Um, but I tell you what, if I was if I was Alperson, I'd say just, just, just ride with him. Let's just let, let keep him out there. Keep him out there. And let, if other teams want to bring him back, bring him back. But right now, I would say let's just let him dangle out the front and play with Jan Vermeer for a bit just to see if we can wear him down. I mean, we shall see, <laughs> but it's, it's fascinating. It really is. I prevent Janivin, present Janivin Vermeer with a golden opportunity exactly, as yeah. well. By the way, rider we saw at the front there for Visma Lisa bike was Per Strong Hageners, and that is a tremendous performance from the young man who's had a crash recently. Nice to see him back, but making his debut in the World Tour this year. And there he is, Per Strong Hageners at the front there, blonde hair, yellow jersey on through the centre. As Askren now tries again, so should our quick step are playing their games too today? Yep, Owen Dool straight on it there in third position. And this is the run into Bergtenhauten now. Another flag display. And we're in between two climbs that have basically swapped cobbles in between the 1970s and now, because if the previous hill, the Falkenberg, lost its cobbles because of 1970s town planners, this one has had its cobbles restored, the climb that we go to next. And it's begun to appear on some of the routes of the most famous races once again, a real leg breaker of a hill. And this is uh, the now retired professional local resident, Alan Piper's favourite hill. Has he got Better a bench on this? The one that's he got a bench on has. It. Yeah, his wife bought him the bench for his birthday, didn't, didn't she? That's lovely. Miguel Biel comes to the front for UAE. So they're starting to regather a bit of force, and Tim Welland starts to move up. On the wet cobblestones, we're going to look at how damp these roads are now. In fact, they are bathed. It's very slippery, yeah. Jonathan Milan, for the first time, is moving up. Dan Uhl in the centre there. Gianni Vermeersch up the road, of course. Well, there's Carno on the inside. Gabots for 20 seconds. Yeah, this is a Ineos Grenadiers moving up on the right-hand side. Valentin Maduas there on the right in the blue, or the red, white and blue. Also, for the first time as well, Alberto Betiol back to where you think he should be, the former winner of this race in the black and pink there of EF Education Easy Post. Plus is up there as well. Keep an eye on him. Laris de Plus on his debut. He's looking all right. Yeah, he is looking. Right inside, 1-2-1 one, one on his back. Yep. Just on the wheel of uh, Ben Turner. It's uh, Connor Swift on the front riding here. And after being caught behind the crash, Fred Wright moving up in the centre as well for Bahrain. Now, there's another little pinch point there. Oh, they do make me nervous, Robert, tell you. <laughs> So many riders. Now, which riders have been called out here? Somebody, it looks as though Alaphilippe has. Yep. Alaphilippe called out in this group. Here she as well. Nylance. Stryker Longen is there. Of course, you might not be surprised at that by this point, but there is Florian Seneschal. He's been called out towards the back. 63 representing Bahrain is Kamil Gradek. Again, no big surprise there. For Leerberger, who's in the breakaway. Mark Hershey as well. It's been out on near the back for the entire race. I don't know if Hershey's feeling good or not. But again, uh, 
It should be able to get over there. One of the lighter riders, but should be able to get over this terrain. But again, hasn't really featured at the front at all. Vermeer looks around. He's just laying off the wheel into these corners a little bit. He's a skillful rider, we know, because of his cross background, but he's not taking any chances. Because Pedersen really coming into these, these corners, corners pretty quick, but uh, Vermeer just sensibly dropping off the back wheel just in case the worst should happen. Beetle Trek last won this race a decade ago when Fabian Cancellara won for the third time. They're at the front with Mars Pearson, the former world champion. As the farmers making themselves known at the corner there. <laughs> Left turn as we go to Bertinaldo. And it looks as though those dropped have one final chance to get back on before we under the cobbles again. Yeah, I think that's Tarling dragging them back. He was caught, caught in that crash, wasn't he, Just on There he is, just on the front. Powerful figure. Got three of his teammates driving. Connor Swift, in fact. Max Walscheid in that group as well. Cortina, remember, they were still getting back on after the crash we saw earlier on. Yeah. I think you still find Stefan Kung in that group as well. One of the pre-race favourites was caught, was on the deck. Mm. Good news for Kupama FDG and, well, Kung, you feel for him. As Van Paul is there, ready and positioned how you'd want to be. Remember, on the last climb, he made a big effort to make it across. It looked easy. How many of those bullets does he have to it, fire in this race? Exactly. But conversely, hey, you're quite right. Jorgensen's already fired a couple of bullets, and uh, Mads Pedersen is firing a series of repetitive salvos at the moment every time he hits the front. So a lot of the main protagonists, three of the big favourites, have already committed a lot of resource to this race. But right now... 22 seconds, still a long way to go, 76 k's to go. Um, I think uh, the UE team members are happy to just let the pace go. I don't think uh, Team Visma Lisa Bike are too worried about this. I think there's several of the big teams, the DSs, are saying, just let him ride. Just let him ride out the front. Let's just try and tire out Mads Pedersen because outside of Van der Poel, I think he's one of the biggest threats. And Hershey, I think he's struggling in this crosswind here, isn't he? It's a windy run into oh. Berkton Alter. Even the locals are sheltering, and they're used to these conditions. Oh, that's so hard. You can feel for Hershey there just trying to close the last bit of the gap. It was Van Leerberger who's actually come through just to take up the pace. Perfect course knowledge there for Oppos into Koenig. They're sitting right at the other side, aren't they? They knew what was coming up. Yeah, and this is the sort of information that will be fed now by your DSs, is just where, where to ride, because often when the red mist descends, you're just trying to hold the wheel in front, you're trying to uh, moderate your own effort, but if you get information right, we're going to go left, crosswind, move to the right, just those little bits of information that will be constantly coming because of the multiple changes of direction. This is such... It's a race where you need to be focused, but it's difficult to be focused because of the, the physical effort that, that you're having to perpetually undertake. Such a difficult race, such a, a massive workload, both mentally and physically. Mars Pearson right inside as we look at it, tapping out. And, well, he is absolutely on fire today, yep. despite the injuries picked up on Wednesday. 27 seconds, and it's going to take his compatriot, Biel, to try and pull things back for Tim Wellens and UAE Emirates. See that, the way that he just took, just had to back off pedalling there into that ever such a slight corner. Betiel now moving up into a very good position, but he's stamping on the pedals, a furious pace being set up here. Van der just slipping and sliding a couple of places there, but he's moving up now. This is Biel, Wellens now moving now. back, Wellens on the right-hand side, Crow is there, left-hand side, moving up with Van der Poel through the traffic. Betiol is looking good, Rex is looking good, Maric there, then there's a gap. Milan is forced to chase, and this Melissa bike now are in real danger of losing all of their cards they had to play from the front of the race, or even the second group. There's nobody there. Because all of those yellow jerseys are slipping out the way. Talk of the killer bees, they've lost their sting. Yep, they've done a lot already, they've been on the offensive now, they're falling back, 17 seconds it is. Big bit of pace setting, great riding by Mikhail Bjerg to take them into the bottom of that climb. Tim Wellens now setting the pace on the front. I tell you who looks like he's absolutely floating at the moment is Alberto Betiol in the pink and black. Soren Kral Anderson there. And is it Lawrence Pithy just on the wheel? There's a rider from Group Armour, FDG. It can't be Kung after that instant back there. Definitely a blue jersey uh, not too far away. But the gap is now closing to our two leaders. It's a minimal gap at the top of Bergton out, just 13 seconds, but here's the slow up. Here's the hesitation. What a Milan. race from Jonathan Milan. Here comes Tishpinot. 
well. There's Jorgensen at the back of the group. I wonder if he's done it, whether he's just hiding or he's done a little bit too early. It's difficult to say. Kirmai's getting a little bit better. He's missed a few splits, but he's followed the move there. Still 74 kilometers This is to go. brutal, Rob. This is absolutely brutal. Julian Alaphilippe, well, that says it all, really. He just hasn't got it today as he looks around right at the very back of a group that's actually dropped from the peloton here. Putting most there. Oh, oh. And Stefan, Stefan, Stefan. So unfortunate to get caught in that crash. This oh, is going to... Oh. Oh, Sean Stefan King, yet again in fine form. Once more, a nasty stroke of luck. Bloodied, battered, bruised, and out the back. As we see to the front, it's a man who's bandaged up. Mars Pilsen, who now has Gianni Vermeers for company. I think this is good riding by Gianni Vermeers. Really is. Just keeping rolling, keeping them out in front, because it means, I mean, still, we talked about the relative lack of strength of Alpsen de Kerning, didn't we? They've still got four or five riders in the front of this race. They really are punching above their weight today, looking after Mathieu van der Poel, marking all of these moves. Now, this for Groupama FDG is Lawrence Pithy. I can tell you that yeah. Valentin Madouas is further back in the group for them. Being followed by the world champion, Van der Poel. Milan's having a very good race as well. And now we go over the top here, and we head towards the Neue Kreuzberg Autant. Absolutely fascinating race so far. 12 seconds for our two leaders out in front. The winner of Gent Verbogen, the former world champion, one of the big pre-race favourites, has come out of this race punching, but he's opened up very early indeed. He went, I think it was, with around 90 kilometres to go. He was immediately joined by the former gravel world champion, Jeanne Vermeer, a teammate and close friend of the world champion, Mathieu van der Poel. 73 kilometres to go. Bergtenot is done. Next climb on the menu comes in about nine kilometres time. That is the new Kreuzberg or the Otond. Big attack on the right-hand side from UAE Team Emirates. That's a big acceleration. Arkea Samzik also not too far away. I think that is the figure of the Italian Albanese, who has a look round. It is indeed. I think that was a genius signing. Vincenzo Albanese, so such a good all-rounder. It is Mikkel Björg now accelerating clear. Albanese going across to, to the move. Yet more moves. So lack, lacking in control of this race, it is. it's incredible. It's chaotic, mate. It's brilliant. I can tell you at the finish line, a couple of riders already rolling through, taking the short route to the bus given the rain and the fact they're at the race. And they are already heading. There's one rider from Bahrain riding along with a few VIPs there back to the finish. Yeah, uh, looks like uh, this is the finish of the, uh, the Sportif. front of the Ronde van Vlaanderen with just over 70 kilometers to go on the big Sunday of Flanders finest and some pretty horrible weather this afternoon 13 seconds for Johnny Vermeers the former gravel world champion Mars Pedersen the man who was a road world championship to his name but is yet to find that elusive monument I really I'm fascinated by this ride of Mads Pedersen. And I'm also equally as intrigued the fact that Vermeersh is there and riding with him. Because what it means is right now there's a, a strange alliance between Alpersin de Koenig and Lidl Trek to force the other teams to chase. Uh, the other big teams in this race, uh, primarily Team Visma Lisa Bike and UEE Team Emirates, they're the only other team that have been kind of anywhere near coordinated in this race so far. But there was a brief moment there where for the first time, Team Visma Lisa Bike looked to just slipping on their grip of the race. Jorgensen a little bit further back, far further back than he's been. Mm. But again, in a race this long, Rob, uh, there are quite often points in the race we can feel good, feel bad, then feel good again, especially if you've got your fueling strategy wrong. But Pedersen stomping on the pedals here as the rain continues to fall. There we go, Vermeer's last top 10, 2022. Interesting looking back at that group, yeah. Fisma Lisa Black haven't followed, have they, as much, but they still have six men in that chase yeah. group. And you can see them there. There's plenty of them there. And they know still what's to come. A lot of bike racing still to come. We've still, we're only on. Well, next up on the menu is the Otond. 
and that comes at 64.2 kilometers to go. And then we've got the second of the ascent of the Quaramont just shortly after that. Well, we go to, to Ronce first, and we're going to get our move before we go there. This is Kispa Askren trying to join them. Now Jorgens is going to follow. Kispa Askren, Connor Swift, Matteo Jorgensen, what a mixture of riders. Now Madwas gets involved. It's Rasmus Tillett in there as well, with the uh, orange helmet. A wine duel. Yeah, duel's having a good, good ride today, isn't he? And all the while this has happened, the stop-start stuff there, well played, Stefan Oof. Kung. He's on his way to coming back. Second group here, by the way. Yeah. There's another group to get beyond and to get into that front group. And the gap's gone to 25 seconds, Matt. Yeah. I think this. I still think this is perfect for Albus and De Kerning. You know, Razorbeak on the front setting that tempo. But do do they really need to set the tempo with Vermeer at the front? I'm just, or are they just dictating the pace rather than dictating and setting mm. a tempo, chasing it? They're two nuanced things. They really are. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because you know, if you're thinking basic tactics, you don't chase your mates. It's not a great look, is it? But they also know who Mas Pilsen is, and Gianni Vermeer should be the no first to know that. He knows that there has to be a big game here, surely in support of the bare own world champion. Uh, uh, th 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 the fact that Vermeer has been riding, unless he's been told to still, I, I would... I mean, you need as many resources as you can deep into the race. We know uh, Rezebeek can actually ride well in the climbs. Why not just sit up and, and force um, the other teams to do some chasing. There's several other teams as missed. There's only two riders up the road. And uh, although Vermeer would be hard pushed to, to beat Mads Pedersen, there's still so much racing still to go, so many opportunities for Pedersen to potentially fade, is that I think that Alperson de Kerning should just knock it off at the front. On the last shot there of the Krausberg, we saw the road that we'll see later on, the cobbles. We've now turned off the Klersberg and the road that goes all the way over. Take a detour instead of going straight to Klersberg. Can we go this way over the Horton? And, of course, merci to one of the main men who took this on. It's Mars Pearson weather. It's a Mars Pearson long range attack. He first made his move today with 109 kilometers to go, then again at 86 k's to go. He's got an anchor on his wheel in Vermeers, and Vermeers, who has the teammate, Mathieu van der Poel, watching racing. The world champion's not had his own way at all today. He is being forced to work with us, to use his team to chase, to use his head, to battle the elements as well as the riders. Twenty-four seconds. Pedersen and Van Meers working hard together. Trying to work over the rest of the peloton. Van Meers, though, has been sitting on in the last few kilometres. And now... We've got several riders out there, several riders working hard. As we remember, an Hector Flandrian. To say that the cobbles on the Au de Quaramont are very slippy and they're being told to take care. Yet another ingredient added into the mix in a crazy race. We've been racing for over 200 kilometers in this Ronde van Vlaanderen. And we are now heading down the hill. And down towards the Alde Quaramont. In less than 10 kilometers climb, we will be climbing for the 10th time. Off the top of this particular road we now go. Back onto the main road again. 
And we'll be heading towards Klersberger. 28 seconds, and even with Vermeer sitting on here, Alpacina Koenig are being forced to ride ridiculously hard to keep a gap that's grown to 27 seconds. Sensational. Rieserbeek's putting a real shift in. On his wheel there is Kraut. Laurent's third wheel. Leader, Van der Poel further back. Milan's there, Squinj is there for Lidl Trek, and Lawrence Pithy's ready to pounce. But it's 29 seconds, and Marth Pitherson just will not be pulled back. What a feat of resistance this is from him today. The wind's howling. It's Ronde van Vlaanderen Strat now for the first time today. The names of previous winners etched onto the road. The concrete slabs of Ronde van Vlaanderen Strat being taken on by Pedersen and by Vermeers. 25 seconds, it's just come down from 30 seconds. And this is all Pedersen against Rieserbeek. He's now had to move away. And here we go, Laurence has come to the front. And Alpacine de Kerning aren't quite losing the battle yet, but Pitherson is making it so difficult for them with other riders from Lidl Trek ready to pounce. What a fight this is, a tug of war between the two teams. And if this man were still alive today, would have witnessed this. What he created 108 editions later. My, would he be enjoying it. That is the monument to Karel von Wenendaler, one of the creators of the Rhône van Vlaanderen. Yep. I'm sure he's looking down from wherever he is proudly at the way that this race is being taken on today. Attritional conditions, chaotic racing, racing in the most swashbuckling style of old, racing that we've become accustomed to. But I tell you what, one of the pre-race favourites opening things up with 90 kilometres to go is something that we have not seen in a long, long time. It's impressive stuff. But I'm still interested. Uh, Pasqualon now comes to the front for Bahrain. I, I do think that Alpes and De Koenig don't need... I just think they don't need to, to commit quite as much. I'm a little bit surprised they're using... They're burning through riders. The risk is, is that Mathieu van der Poel, with 40 k's to go, um, when we hit the climbs, like the Koppenberg, for example, over the top of there might be a little bit isolated. And I tell you what, the Koppenberg is going to be absolutely treacherous um, uh, in weather conditions like this to get any sort of traction, mate. I tell you what, it's going well, to be very difficult. There's just been a warning over the race radio to all riders and teams to be very careful on the cobbles of the Alder Quadron because of the slippy nature. Yep. No time, unfortunately to stop and take your pressure out your tyres. Not when so you're travelling like, at 80 k's an hour down the newer Quadamont. No, definitely not. But here we go. And this is a big moment, isn't it? Down the other side, the parallel side to the Berg, they'll be climbing back up the cobbled side in just a moment. Here we go. This is a real fight for position going in towards the bottom of the newer Quadamont that turns into the older Quadamont. Yeah. Hold on to your hats. Yeah, this is, this is where... I just hope everybody just plays it safe. Good to see. I'm wondering if, I'm not too sure if, in my absence, Stefan Kung has got back in contact. I think it might be Lance Pithy. From Bali here. Yep. Just dropping off the wheel. Is this this right hander at the bottom? So we got around, I'd say about 60 riders left. It's these quick deviations that um, make for nervous viewing, uh, Rob. It was on the right-hand side where Fonda Paul himself crashed on the way back. Well, before he then had to ride back and That's finish right. fourth. Well, he ended up on the pavement, didn't he? And then almost hit a spectator that time, didn't he? He crashed and then kind of fell off again. But uh, 25 seconds, a couple of seconds knocked off. It's not quite as stressful for these two riders in front. Vermeer just takes oh, a slightly different line here, though. There. Yeah, Van der Poel right near the front there. This gets moving up right inside yeah, J.K. Lula, and on his wheel is Mathieu wheel. van der Poel. Yeah, good wheel to get on. We know how well uh, Mezgetz can uh, can go, especially in the downhill. Took a really good win in the Tour of Poland on a downhill finish a few years back, but so very well placed there for Mathieu, Mathieu van der Poel. Came round that corner in third position. How the race has changed since we came onto the Alde for the first time. 
It's been blown up, it's moved, and here we go. Gianni Vermeers coming to the front for the first time in a long time, certainly since when we got to Ronsa last time. I'm still... I mean, his team aren't on the front now, but they, they don't need to ride. It's like I said, they don't need to ride at the moment. There's so many other teams with resource there, and a, and a, and a dwindling, a gradually dwindling resource for Mathieu van der Poel when, he, in my opinion, he doesn't need to ride at the moment. Um, 15 seconds is the gap, so they can knock things off and leave it up to other teams. Bahrain victorious there, and also the UAE team members moving through to the front as well. Junction's always a nervous one coming into the approach road to the Alde Quadamont. This is one for the guys with a big engine who can push a big gear. Second time up, what the three-time winner Johan Museo describes as his favourite hill in Flanders. Yeah, it looks like they've got Kamil Karadic moving on to the front now. The pole, big rangy pole from Bahrain Victorious, just trying to set the pace. It has come down significantly now to just 11 seconds now, Rob. 57 k's to go, though. All that fight behind for the position coming down the new Aquaramont and into that corner's really done damage, hasn't it? Yeah. Ten seconds from Mars Peterson and a crash. A crash, everybody back up again, but it's held up riders. And from Bala was held up. You could do without that at this point. Corbin Strong in a bit of an issue as well, but back on his bike. It's a headwind, remember, onto the Quadamont too. This is gonna really hurt Mars Peters. Uh, Mads Peterson's got to think about what he does here. There's the replay of the crash. Just uh, just an innocuous one. Just get a bit of an overlap rather than sliding out, actually. Who else was caught there? One of the Visma Lisa bike rods couldn't quite identify who that was, but we need to get Bala. back to the front van Bala as well. But it's at the front of the race that we kind of just, yeah, just got, I think there's just an overlap because he, he went, he fell over to the left, just got the wrong side of a wheel on that corner. But does Pedersen allow himself a little bit of rest by him, knock it off, even if it's just for a minute or so. I don't know whether he should continue riding now. Um, or get himself over the steep bit, recover and wait to see and regroup, because if there's some big accelerations over the top of this climb, Pedersen, it might be hard for Pedersen to react. This, is, this could be quite a critical point for the, for the race of Pedersen here. We are well into the part of the race now where there's little chance of recovery from issues. The last 56 kilometers of relentless action are about to take place. It's the Al de Quadamont for the second of three ascents today. Old Quarter Hill in a race where no quarter has been given. I'm wondering if we're starting to see the first glimpses, of course we are. A little bit more of a laboured style there from Mads Pedersen, or whether he's actually just dialing things back a little bit. Oyelas Carno at the front there. Again, no. Well, good bit of placing in terms of position there from Mathieu van der Poel, and he'd be more than happy with the situation now, knowing that one of his key rivals is slowly but surely wearing himself out in front. Turns on the left-hand side for Israel Premier Tech, Las Canos there, Pithis there in the blue, they got onto the cobbles of the Arda Quadamont, and Mathieu van der Poel stops to try and wind things up at the front. It's Pedersen who continues to grind his way up this hill. Van der Poel on the right-hand side, it's becoming more and more fraught as it's Las Cano who it is making the acceleration. And for Oya Las Cano, is there a better hill? This is perfect for him, isn't it? This is absolutely perfect, just sheer brute force. Lawrence Rex also looking good, pithy also looking good on the wheel of the world champion but this is impressive riding by Oya Lascano he's got that grunt isn't he and the thing is he can continue on for a long time he's got three or four minutes of this sort of effort he hasn't even he has looked round now and he'll see the shadow of Mathieu van der Poel on his wheel Pierre Gautra at the bottom there for Decathlon and there was a gap after him as now van der Poel makes it up to the front and Mars Pearson is about to be caught the race once more makes a sea change and the riders going away it's a group of the same Stay riders we saw last year, and it's Van der Poel. Now then, you questioned it, does he have it? Are there the minerals there to respond? It doesn't look like it, but you never know with Mars Peterson. He is making the change in acceleration, and he's doing his best to hold the wheel. But look at the acceleration from Van der Poel. The crowd cries, and it's the world champion giving them exactly what they want again. Van der Poel, Lascano, Peterson. Then it's Pivi, then you get Vilmirsch, also there as well Tim is Dylan Turns. Not too far away is Tim Wellens behind Pierre Gautra. A little issue for Mate Mohoric, then it's Tom Squinge. And a long, long way back now to Visma Lisa bike. 
They've played their cards. The man who holds the aces is the world champion. And Mathieu von der Poel at the minute looks like he's going to take some beating today. Yeah, he's looking very strong. Remember, we've still got another ascent of this brutal climb, but look at the gaps, the fissures that have opened up now. This race has detonated on the second ascent of the Quaramont. A brave ride by Oil Ascano, not looking for any assistance at all. Old school run, I tell you what, Dylan Turn straight over the top as well. Jenny Vermeer, she's found a second wind as well. The gap is actually closing now. Luscano is dragging back the world champion on the muddied cobbles of the Quaramont. Listen to this, the mud there, it's like watching the cross. Look at Lascano. And there well may be something that happens that we might not expect today. It's not a one-man show. It was in danger of looking like it, as Mars Pedersen has found something else. Mars Pedersen, whatever happens today, is a mighty bike rider. This is a real good group of riders have been impressed by Dylan Tjerns. I mean, he's been absolutely nowhere today, hiding in the wheels, but that's the way you need to ride this one, save your energy. But it's the team that's on the back foot now, it's Vesma Lisa, but there's Matteo Jorgensen on the, on the wheel of Oliver Narsen. Narsen is there, leaving up and Matteo Jorgensen and the rest coming up behind. It's the famous five here at the front, it's Fauna Paul, Lascano, turns, pithy, and at the back, still there. They can't shake him. Mars Pedersen on the wheel there, making it six, in fact, with Wellens. Oh, this is what a race this is. This well, is so here as well. Lompard is making an appearance too. Yep. Matty Mohoric, Laurence Rex, good riding by Ben Turner there as well. Michael Matthews in the mix there too. Nils Pollitt at the back of this little group. This is Trentin, that's Morgado on debut, let's not forget. Biel is there, they're dirted, they're muddy, there's Benoit. And Campanat's come up the back, that's Fred Wright as well. This now is Sheffield and Stefan Kung will not give up despite giving everything on debut there's Laris de Plusen on that hill going a long way backwards with Jonathan Milan over the top now let's see how we go always the case after the Quadamont for the second time how do they get organized who rides and for how much yep well I tell you one rider that always do a turn, and that is the man on the front now, Oyelos Khan. It's a very short one, though. They're exhausted just by that big effort. But this could provide an opportunity for the group with Narsen to get back in contact. Great uh, riding here as well by the teammate of the world champion, uh, Jani Berrios, to stay in that group. Turner also there as well. I think this is actually going to come back together because Wellens is not clearly riding. Pithy doesn't want to ride as well. And uh, I think the man at the back there, who opened things up initially, the former world champion, um, Mads Pedersen is going to take a well-earned rest for a bit. He's not going to ride at the moment. He needs to recuperate a little bit as Mohoric brings this group together. The Visma Lisa bike have one of their cards back into the game in Jorgensen. Michael Matthews is coming back as well. Lampard, that's a turn up for the books after his recent form. That's very good news. And here we go, because this now is Benoit being brought back into it by Strand Hagenus. It's not long before hit the Paterberg for the first time and we're actually on the approach here to the bottom remember that really tight right hander very quick running on these concrete slabs twist and turn snakes you've got that hard right hander we've seen riders lose it in the dry on that corner before Rob and then well it's one of the steepest climbs of the day the Paterberg 20% near the top and on these cobbles the next two hills by the way names that will strike fear into anybody who knows anything about racing in this part of the world Paterberg Koppenberg within six kilometers of each other. 50 k's to go, you're looking at Pollitt. Yeah, the Koppenberg, I think. It's, a, it's 800 meters long, the Koppenberg, but I think it's uh, probably that hard. It depends, not as long as the Quadramont, but it's brutally hard and then drags up over the top as well. And then it's quite a steep technical descent over the top. Well, Mohoric driving this group here. We know how fearless Mohoric is. And just the skill, if you're a skillful descender, but you struggled a bit on the climbs, you can just squeeze a bit of an advantage on this downhill section. Wet roads, but Mohoric, one of the finest descenders in the peloton, buying himself a little bit of breathing space at the bottom of the Paterberg. Smart riding. There's the hill up ahead. It's the right turn and a real tough 90 degree to take on after they've descended here, and, and some are liking it better than others, yeah. as you can see. Oh, it's nervous down here. And again, just naturally, riders will just drop. Whether you're nervous or not, you'll always give the rider in front a little bit of space. You won't overlap because of the risk of sliding out. 
Cortina's looking good. He's used to these conditions as well, coming from northern Spain. There's the world champion. And then back to Dylan Turns. You can see that Turns... This is Wellens. We look back, Van der Poel has lost quite a bit of ground there. He's alongside Jorgensen now, Lascano. And look at this on the left-hand side. Turner is trying to take his chance. Yep, Turner's looking good. Remember, Ben Turner came from the cyclocross scene, so he's used to knowing how to control a bike on slippery conditions and has opened up a bit of a gap. Turns looking pretty comfortable. Wellens there, Rex impressive too. Van der Poel, who the last time he was attacking on this hill, Wout van Aert was crashing in the Airdrie place and Harold Baker. Good riding as well by Riley Sheehan, the American there from Israel Premier Tech. An issue for the former winner there, Betiol, and now Van der Poel is making his move. This is a short hill, but it feels like eternity with all the big gradients that are here. Short, decisive, steep, rough cobbles. This is hard work. Pedersen is fighting. Yep, Pedersen is really going to suffer here. They've got to go up this one more time, remember. But this is where riders are just fighting against themselves and gravity, the gradient, the ferocity of the cobbles, fueled by the, the cheers of the crowd. This is an absolute grind, but this is impressive stuff from Ben Attorney. It really is. Cortina's looking the best he's ever looked in this race. There he is. He's got a teammate as well. We talked about Movistar early on from cobble phobia over the 40 odd years they were coming here. And now then, a gap to Michael Matthews. Manantin Madouas and riders called out back here, including Niels Pollitt, including Betiol, Lompat, Vermeers. And this now is Benut. Yep. Kral. Campanars, oh. as well as Morgado and Trentin. Sheffield, he's there with Tiller. And wow. There we go. This is our little treat, Rob, I think. The drone shot taking us down the hill to see the gaps. Yep, hold on to your hats. And we now go towards the Koppenbeck. Tell you what, that's a very impressive ride by Ben Turner. He's uh, caused a lot of gaps over the top of the climb, but this is uh, great stuff here, isn't it? Just appreciate the moves, the speed, the rider's eye view of this. You're following Matthews here, who's trying to get back on. This is the start of the next group, as there's a mechanical issue now. Don't try this at home from Marijn van den Berg. Yeah, it looks like he's uh, either unshipped his chain. He's back on it now. Back to the front with Cortina. 50 k's to go. We are now five kilometers from the, pa the Koppenberg. I tell you what, we saw this man Right impressively in opening weekend, didn't we? In particular in Omloop Het Nieuwsblad. He faded towards the end, but it was his, his ride on the final climb that was impressive. But now he's gone clear now. He's got a slight, well, it's a crosswind here. And now Mohoric. Yeah. Mohoric, now who chases him? It looks Nassim. as though Nasa might go, he thinks about it. Van der Poel's waiting, he's not reacting to everything. This is a great situation, by the way, now for Lascano. And if Jorgensen goes, then Van der Poel will go with him, the world champion, the rainbow jersey, following the last of the killer bees. Yeah, it looks like Mads Pedersen is just at the back of this group, but look how laboured Pedersen is. Well, this isn't Pedersen, actually. This is Pedersen's strange. further back. This is Schoins and... Uh, wow, and Pithy. So Schoins and Pithy, I, th I think... Well, Mads Pedersen is definitely... No, no, Mads Pedersen is just in He's that in front that group. group. I tell there. you what, well, he won't be doing any work for a while. He'll just need to be... to keep on fueling. But Movistar are having... A heck of a ride so far. Well, they've got a sports director at Movistar who has the know-how. Of course, they've always had the odd rider who was strong, but it's a renewed focus on the classics, and Jürgen Brulons, former Belgian champion, is now the sports director for these races for Team Movistar. He's also a fluent Spanish speaker. His partner is Spanish, so he knows the game, he knows how to get around, there's no lack of communication on the radio. Indeed. Van der Poel's going to need a little bit of assistance. He's getting a little bit of assistance now from Matej Mohoric going through. Jorgensen following the wheel of the Slovenian. As they're moving through. So they are relaying now. And good to see Dylan Churns back in the mix as well in this race. The man from Israel, Premier Tech. is still pithy on the wheel. These distances at this stage of the race with this fatigue, this much fatigue in the leg, they, it looks so easy. Why can't they just shut that gap? But believe you me, they are right on the very limit as Pithy just goes through to take his turn on the front. Stretching out, 
Trying to get some respite is Matej Mohoric. In the meantime, it's nine seconds now for Iwan Garcia Cortina. They are nine seconds, by the way, that could very quickly disappear. Yeah. We're into the final 50 kilometers of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. The combination of the Koppenberg, Steenberg trees, and the Tienberg, a series of hills with almost no rest in between, are to come. If one of the favorites goes, the others will have to respond. Yeah, the Koppenberg. In the dry, Rob, as you know, is one of the most chaotic climbs and we've seen in the past some quite iconic scenes back in the 1980s. We had uh, seen riders' bikes being run over uh, back in the day. But it is, I think, it's going to be just hard to get forward momentum and to get any purchase. It's so, so steep. And also the cobbles are notoriously slippery, but also very jagged as Turner goes again. Just trying to take advantage of a little bit of a let-up. This looks like it's going to be well as Sue chases. And now Pithy, who's just got in, will decide to go straight to the front. Yeah. Rex closing the gap. Nats Pedersen having to do a little bit of work here as well as his teammate latches on the back. Tom Schoins just off the wheel of Dylan Turns there in turn just behind the Spanish champion. And as you said, you wouldn't have thought that this stage of the race it would be advantage Movistar, would you? But it is. <laughs> 13 seconds and growing for Cortina. Man from the city of Gijón in Asturias, northern central Spain. Climate similar to this, he won't be adverse to this weather. And to add to that, he's one of those many riders who's moved to Andorra now. Used to the cold, used to the hills, and as there's hesitation heading into the Koppenberg, it's advantage Cortina. It certainly is. Listen to the braking yeah. as well, they're so nervous around these corners here. It's a brief opportunity as well, just whether this could open the door for somebody to attack and also just to recuperate ahead of the Koppenberg. It's so, so hard. What you don't want to do is approach it full gas. They know what's coming. They're looking back to see they might be joined as well. Yeah. 15 seconds and growing, 22 seconds here, and now there's a move. Yep, it looks like it's Wellens. It's followed by his fellow countryman, Dylan Turns on the inside. That means Betiol is coming back. Matthews, Matthews reapproaches. 46 there is Luca Mozzato. Good ride. Gianni Vermeer, she's back in the mix as well. The man that was up the road with Pedersen, there he is on the right-hand side, is the only teammate of Matthew van der Poel. No wonder he's turns. eager to get back in contact. Dylan turns to make a move, being followed by Rex. Yeah, Mozzato, very impressive here. Very recently a race winner, Luca Mozzato, by the way. He's in form. Yep, just slots into the front wheel. Slots in front, shall I say, of Michael Matthews. And Alberto Betiol is now back in the fold. A former winner, remember, a few years back in that black special kit today. But meanwhile, this is that little right turn that takes you into the bottom of the climb, through the town, little twist and turn, and there is the hill right in front of you. This is the climb that made even the great Eddie Merckx put foot to ground. A hard series of hills starts here. But when isn't it hard in this craziest of Rana van Vlaanderen's They've come from far and wide to stand on this hill. It's the place where many dreams can be destroyed. Ivan Garcia Cortina will be in dreamland right now, but he only has 21 seconds on this list of riders who are all waiting to take the lead of the race away from him. It's a harsh, relentless tour of Flanders, and Garcia Cortina is the first to take on these slopes, on these cobbles, in this weather, they go up to 22%. Yep, yeah. they can pick his line here as well, so they're, they're the only way to get over this climb effectively is this another group with Magnus Sheffield leading. Looks like Group 3 is going to merge with Group 2. Matteo Jorgensen on the front. It's been taken over now. Well, right in the centre is where the, the crown is where the cobbles are at their worst. But I tell you what, as it, get, it gets its steepest, oh, there we go. There's no problems. traction. Never mind, oh, Eddie Merckx. It's happened to Cortina as well. If you're running, you're in trouble. It's and it's a mechanical issue, it seems, for Ivan Garcia Cortina. And while that happens, Mathieu van der Poel makes another move. The rest must chase, and those dreams have been ruined. Oh, my word. He's stuck in the mud as well. And here is the gap. It's growing. This is like looking back to the 1980s. There's mud on the Koppenberg, and there's riders off their bikes behind having a walk. It's Van der Poel, it's Jorgensen, and the rest, they're cyclocross style. Rob, this isn't just about power, it's about skill. 
it's about, I mean, rather than reduced to a standstill, but Van der Poel can ride it because he is prodigiously talented. He's supernatural on the bike. Jorgensen, though, focused. Mats Pedersen still there, just managing to keep forward motion, but one of the most skillful riders in the world and one of the most powerful is combining those attributes and riding away from the rest of the field. And the rest have got their foot on the ground. Mathieu von der Poel's there. This is Matteo Jorgensen. They're left, they're right. There's masses of crashes. It's like the famous 1980s ascents all put together again. The Koppenberg with its classic nasty side on show today. It's von der Poel who is alone towards the top. It's von der Poel again who must be brought back if he's to be beaten. He's almost supernatural on a bike. That could be ridden. But only two, three riders have managed to do it. And look at the distance. Jorgensen, those focused and in great form. I think that he'll be able to get back on terms on this descent. He's not going to panic, but look at the distance that's been opened. Pedersen's think... now cracked. Yep, looks like Pedersen's cracked. You have to hand it to him. He has fought like a ride. warrior so today. This is some ride by Mads Pedersen. And he won't give up. He will not give up. Dylan Tjerns is back in the mix as well. I don't think I've seen an ascent of the Koppenberg in the modern Ronde van Vlaanderen like that. No, I, don't, I, I can't remember one like it. There was a couple of days beforehand when it was washed and it was exceptionally slippery. No riders could get up it, but thankfully it dried for the day. Launch Rex coming through. Ben Turner also upright. Betiol there as well. This has split the chase to pieces. 43 k to go, 30 seconds, the, the, the gap to the back. <sighs> Just a note of caution. If that's the case on the Koppenberg, we still got to go to the downhill on the cobbles of the Stationsberg. That is also, I hate to say it, quite literally a banana skin. Yeah, that's where you need a lot of skill, isn't it? Issues here coming up the hill for just about everybody. Oh, my word, look at Lompard there. Yeah. The faces of these riders all fighting their own personal battles. Josh Tarling over the top, Owen Duell on the inside. Vega Stick Langen there as well. Degen John Degen Cole, Victor Kampenarts, some of the Cano, who was right up to the front of the group. Movi Stars challenge, we talked about it. It's just disappeared. He must have had an awful issue because he, I wonder if he's, he's had another mechanical issue as well because that was strange. He was in that front group. Uh, yeah, there we go. The only people happy there are the photographers. Yep. They have got the pictures of a generation on the Koppenberg today. But this, I mean, this man, I mean, the, I mean, the skill he's got. We know, but the distribution of power, he did, Rob, his back wheel hardly even slipped out. It's the way he's able to balance, distribute the power over his bike. He's completely at one. Whatever the terrain offers up, he can cope with it. He really is next level, borderline supernatural skills on a bike, and we saw it, because that was rideable, Jorgensen rode it, but, but the way that Van der Poel rode it was just, well, something to behold, just look and learn. Kids, if you're watching this bike race, get yourselves on a cross bike, get out, you know, have fun on a bike, but this race has absolutely exploded. Mads Pedersen now a distant 30 seconds behind, Jorgensen six seconds behind the world champion, well, we thought it was going to explode on the Koppenberg, and boy, we have got a completely different race on our hands now. It's race on for Matteo Jorgensen, trying to catch Mathieu von der Poel. No rider from the United States has ever been on the podium of the men's Ronde of Vlaanderen. There's a long way to go yet. Jorgensen could be on the way to that. The question is, can he stop Mathieu von der Poel from equaling the record for the most wins in this race, and again, coming round the corner, you see the difference in the skills, difference in the bike handling. I mean, that ascent of the Koppenberg wasn't quite Jesper Skibel, however, it was something we have not seen for a generation. No, not at all. That was, uh, it was absolute chaos, it really was, but it looks as if Matteo Jorgensen is about to get in contact. I mean, the gap falls short, and just by the camera angle there, your Jorgensen out of focus, but he is gradually reeling back in Mathieu van der Poel, but I don't think Mathieu van der Poel is going to give, is going to wait for Jorgensen here. If Jorgensen gets on, it's because he's chased and got on. So everybody right now is just riding their own race, and it might be that van der Poel's actually ever so slightly moving away now. God, this is brutal. 
It's the Easter edition of the Koppenberg Cross with Matcha von der Poel out front. Well, he was still on the radio quite a bit there, grabbing a gel. Remember, he himself has responded to the odd attack. He showed last Sunday that he is human. There is racing to come yet. And to come now, we go to the Maria Borostrat, Steinbeck Trees, Stationsberg and Tyenberg. The thing is, Rob, I can't see where the chase is going to come from. Everybody's at six and sevens and riders are on their knees. Just that beautiful shot of the riders picking their way over the top of the Koppenberg. Each, every single one of them in varying states of distress. <laughs> you know, relative composure from this man and from Jorgensen. But beyond that, riders are just fighting to keep their composure. The rainbow bands cutting through the gloom today. Nine seconds to Jorgensen. What a race. We've still got an hour of riding, Rob. This has been an incredible edition of the Ronda. It always serves up something super special. But by, but by golly, this is a race and a half. It's just changed in so many different facets, so many different chapters. A bold move by Mads Pedersen. Here we go. Maria Borostrat, first downhill on the wet cobbles. Then we go up to the Steinbeck Dries. After that, downhill on the Stationsberg. And all of that leading into the terrible Tyenberg. It's 13 seconds for Van der Poel, who is trying to ride away here. Van der Poel wants to finish this. Yeah, he's not going to wait. He's a dangerous rider, Jorgensen, he really is. And if he ultimately does get back in contact, I'm sure they will work together. But right now, Van der Poel's riding his own race. And if this man manages to get back in contact, well, that's good. But look at the difference in pace. And between. look at Mars Pedersen. He's still He's there. Still there. Well, he, I, think, I think whatever happens, even if Mads Pedersen blows, he can still just ride, can't he? He's so, so strong. But again, there was a bold move early on. He opened things up early, but they've got to be approaching a minute behind now. Uh, completely and utterly out of sight. But um, good to see Dylan Turns riding at this level in this sort of race, it really is. He's been top ten in this race before, a few years ago, in running for Lotto Sudal, isn't he? Or the iteration of the team then. 18 seconds now for Mathieu von der Poel, who on the first few hundred metres of the Maria Borostrat is really continuing to put the nail into the coffin of everybody else. Now then, let's look back. Oh, no, it was that slip. There was no mechanical first no. up, it was a slip. I think then he, he was looking, I he was... He thought, yeah. It was the Koppenberg being the Koppenberg that did for Ivan Garcia Cortina and then the rest. No, there's no issue there, mate. He's letting some pressure out of his of his of his tyre. That's what he was doing. He was just tapping the valve. Von der Poel flies past. Jorgensen is there as well. And in this situation, as we go to the top of the Steinbeck trees and head towards the Stationsberg, Matcha von der Poel is on his way to equaling history. Still, anything can happen in this race. We saw it in the World Championships, but. I, I must agree, Rob. There's kind of an ominous feeling here. You know, a positively ominous one, if, you, if that's not too much of a paradox. Keep but your this eyes on this. Looking good. Oh, yeah, this is dodgy. Ten days ago, Mathieu van der Poel was flying up the other side of this hill on his way to trying to do something in the Edri Press. Winning it. Race he'd never won before. Now he has to descend in wet conditions. Leading by 20 seconds from Matteo Jorgensen towards the Stationsberg, and Jorgensen, despite being so strong today, is slipping and sliding back towards the rest. Yeah, the time's going out. Just, I mean, he was riding on about a sprocket or two low, he could just tell. It was a higher cadence, but lower speed. He just didn't have the same force, the same, the same puissance that we saw uh, van der Poel putting through the bike there. Cortina coming back. There is Wellens Rex Betiol. Betiol's ridden a smart, conservative race, hasn't he? But that's the way you need to ride this one. He knows how to win it. He's got such a big turn of pace. He's clearly measured his effort very well. Turns also looking good. There we go, 33 seconds now as the gap continues to grow. 34 seconds now for Van der Poel, who has the Stationsberg out the way, and who is now heading towards the Timeberg. The man in the rainbow bands. 
already the world champion. Just under 40 Ks from the line. Now has to keep his head. It's another of those Fonda Pool days. The conditions, the way the racing's happened, all contributing today to a sense of something special and epic. Jorgensen was close, he was a handful of seconds away. Now he's at over half a minute. This is Mathieu von der Poel's race to lose. Yes, it's a long way from the line, but it's Mathieu von der Poel's race to lose with almost 40 kilometers to go. Yep. Almost with, well, each kilometer now. This man ships another couple of seconds, but he's got to stay composed as well. Everybody's going to be very, he's going to be almost, not quite running on empty, but deep into their reserves, especially in these sorts of conditions, especially how hard this race has been. But Van der Poel is absolutely relentless. But still, through all the gloom, the mud and the grime retains a certain grace, doesn't he? He really, he really does. The best legs today at the moment, the best skills, the best head, the way to react, the way to race, have all come from this man, from Mathieu van der Poel. He goes onto the Tienberg, nicknamed the Bornenberg, and he's going to ride past. No time to admire the big leg statue at the top of the Bornenbeiner, the Bornen's leg statue. It's all about Mathieu van der Poel. Number one on his back, number one on the day, hoping at the end of it to become number one joint top of the list with three wins more than anybody else and it's quite the list Mathieu for the pool just his sixth ronda could end today should end today Matt Stevens from this position with a 50% win rate yeah it's only his fourth race <laughs> it's incredible isn't it as a Jorgensen now enters this hellish climb 37 k to go Another handful of seconds ceded to the man in the rainbow bands. Another 16 seconds to the next troop, and then 126 to group four on the road. This is a super ride by Matteo Jorgensen, but he just cannot match the raw strength of the world champion as Alberto Betio lights things up from the chase group now. Just had it pointed out to me as well. If he carries this home, and look at the gaps growing. No, it's just... They're exploding. 47 seconds to Jorgensen. A minute and one to the group we just saw. 129 from riders just starting the Timeberg. He has blown the race to smithereens. Mathieu von der Poel with one of the longest Tour of Flanders solos. And you cannot see any result here, barring incident or accident, than him bringing this home in... No. Uh, uh, just absolutely incredible conditions. It's what do you have to look at when we again we're not looking back on this race just yet. We've still got 37 kilometers and some brutally tough terrain in conditions like this. We've seen it before. Riders can just explode. Anybody can get their fueling strategy wrong. It's so um, the, the, the monumental distance, the attritional conditions, just the brutality of the terrain, the elevation, the wind, the numerous attacks. The things this man has, had, has got to shut down, he's still got to make sure that he's managing his energy expenditure. And we've seen it before, riders go blow with 10, 15 k to go. If you've got no legs up the Paterberg last time or the Quadrimont, we've still got to go up there again. We've still got that duo at the end as Jorgensen quite clearly is starting to fade here. Look at almost, just look at the ghostly, ghostly white oh. face of the American. This is hellish now, it really is. It might be a... Um, um, an idea for him just to wait up a little bit, get in that little group, recuperate a bit, because Betiol is looking rampant here. 37 k's to go for Mathieu von der Poel. 50 seconds of an advantage over Jorgensen. And look at Pedersen ride. Stand up and salute and Flanders will. He is an Hector Flandrien just for this performance. Yeah. What this race has forced riders to do, riders cherish this race so much, Rob, it's so important, and we've seen the evolution of the way that this race unfolds, and it seems as if riders are so willing, that they, they want it so much, they're willing to do, all, like, even the most ridiculous. Like, we saw, we saw Van der Poel go long here, I mean, just broken the race apart by force of nature and the skills that he's got, but also the willingness the willingness of Pedersen to do what he did. That we, we saw what Tadi Pogaccia did last year, you know, but they can't, it can't always happen that way. But it's just because of how important this race is, riders are willing to lose it 
in order to win it. And Pedersen uh, will be criticised for the way he rode today. And you can look at it a lot of different ways, but I think he, he will be criticised. But I think he's ridden with real panache and real verve. And you've got to try different things. You've got to try and put it to the other teams. He did it. It didn't quite come off. But an another story that we have to focus on as well is the depth and, and how strong Alpes and De Koenig have ridden today. You know, they've ridden so well. For me, it's really smart to almost... And the way that it was questionable why the way Alpes and De Koenig were actually riding on the front, what exactly are they doing? But the way they just let Mads Pedersen dangle out in front, just burn his reserves. And then, ultimately, when he was hit on the Quaramont, just didn't really have any response. But we'll see. Still 36 k's to go, and it looks like Pedersen, in tandem with Rex, might get back in contact. No time to pause for Mathieu Fodderpool, but we do that. Taking stock of this absolutely relentless race today. Mathieu Fodderpool could join those names today as three-time winners in the men's Ronde van Vlaanderen. Boise, Magni, Lehmann, Museo, Bona and Cancellara. And he's only 29. You get the feeling that if he continues like this, this is the perfect race for him. As we said, five appearances before today, never worse than fourth. Out of those five appearances, four times on the podium as well. And today, well, it's going to be a big disaster to stop him being the winner, never mind being on the podium. Matt was getting excited then. It, it's such a crazy race. Go on, Matt. It, it is, I just say, no, the, the, this man out in front is just taking time out the rest behind. Uh, everybody is still riding here, but the sharpest to me looks as if it's either Tim Wellens or Alberto Betiol, but good riding there for Pedersen, tenacious riding to get back in contact with Rex. He might give himself a little bit of a rest, but this man has now settled into his rhythm. Can't push too deep. Still got the best part of 45 minutes to ride, but just look at the fluidity of the pedalling style there from Mathieu van der Poel. It is absolute poetry on a bike. In, <laughs> we'll look back on a quite magnificent era of racing and when he ultimately does retire, which quite clearly isn't going to be for a very long time given the contracts that he's recently signed with his team and with his bike partner, Canyon. He is so impressive. And, and you were saying, Rob, that it's the ideal course for Mathieu van der Poel. It's also the ideal conditions as well. We know that Belgium in the spring can bring gloom, can bring slippery cobbles, but he is the rider that has it all. He has all the prerequisite skills required to win the Tour of Flanders and is set fair to win his third edition. There's a little bit of frustration behind Dylan Turns having a word with Lawrence Rex there. And this is a group a little bit further back, just under a minute behind. Valentin Manuel Baduas, great ride by the Paris Tour winner at the back there with the flowing locks, Rolly Sheehan. So still to come, just over 30 kilometres. And you can see that riders starting to take stock of what they're riding for as well. Same situation in a lot of the last few races. It is Fonda Pool versus the world, and they're riding for the best of the rest tactic. And the best of the rest prize right now, 124 from Fonda Pool to Group 2, 207 back to Group 3, and still to come, we go back to Ronse, we go up the Aude Krausberg and the Hoton, we then go back to the Quaremont and the Paterberg for a final deadly combination, and after that, 13 kilometres on the flat to ride to Aldenard, as Fonda Pool's team car moves up now to service him. I bet they're glad they haven't got to go up the Koppenberg again because they'll be getting their training shoes out of the car to run up it so, so hard. But yet the car pumps across the gap to our leader who continues to take time. But yet still some real tough climbs to come in this race. It's all about management of effort now for Mathieu van der Poel. We've seen him before without trying to, by trying to keep a little bit of tension in the game. We've seen him before blow. We've seen riders in this position just lose it. And over this sort of distance, if you get your strategy wrong, and you run out of gas, there's no coming back. 
you can't just roll around the Tour of Flanders course, not with the, the Quaramont, the Paterberg, the Kreuzberg still to come. You've just got to ride just below threshold, holding a little bit back for these climbs. And given the buffer that he's built now, he can actually afford to just breathe a little bit. You know, he doesn't need to stress, he doesn't Here need to go. take any risks in the course. He's going to get that first bit of breath, contact with someone else, a chat with Christoph Rodor. He's going to get some sustenance. Yeah. This now is an important part for him because, of course, he's had radio communication, but he's now seen his mates. He gets the food he wants, he gets the drink. Of course, he's got to carry on riding, he's got to keep this advantage, he's got to keep it up right, let's not forget, given the conditions. But he now has a chance to take stock and have that race management that generally he's pretty good at. Of course, maybe apart from Yorkshire back at the World Championships in 2019, um, he's got that to try and manage home. Behind, we talked about the fight for the podium, Cortina, probably, I think, rather cleverly, are just trying to take advantage and slip away. Yeah, especially when you sense that there's disharmony behind. I think there's disharmony for a couple of reasons. Uh, there's a, most of the riders are at the end of their tether. They don't, I wouldn't say they're happy to be there. Some riders are. I'd imagine the likes of Laurent Rex would be more than happy to be the sharp end of Tour of Flans, looking at staring a top ten in the face. But also thinking... Right, I don't want to blow this, so I'm going to just hold back a little bit. And there's riders with a bit more punch who get a little bit frustrated when they when they know that there's riders who aren't working. Although they're weaker than them, it can cause a lot of frustration because that group behind are actually closing. Yeah, they're actually closing. They've closed another 10 seconds. That's quite a big group here. So Dylan Tierns getting a little bit frustrated. But when, you, when a rider repeatedly attacks, it completely breaks any harmony that they had. But if they want to hold off this group behind, my suggestion is, before they get to the, the Kreuzberg and the Quadramont again, there's a period of about five or ten Ks, they just work as a collective unit just to buy themselves a little bit of time. 30 kilometres to go, and we return to Ronsa. You're talking about Fondrias' World Championship win, of course. Also famous for Benoni Behert, um, grandfather of uh, the now-retired Guillaume from Kelsburg, winning the World Championships here, as you've got a six-time cross world champion and a current road world champion pushing the envelope in the wet roads. Not too much has changed, not too much can change. It's not like he can relax, but I mean, what if you're Christoph Rodolf there, what are you telling him? You're just telling him just keep it not that he needs to be reminded of how good he is, it's just about reminding him to eat and drink. Just the simple things. It just needs to be. The information that he gives him now needs to be clear, unambiguous, and as we get into the final, maybe a little bit more encouragement. Just for, but right now, it's more about what you don't want to do is cause a big adrenaline spike. You want to just say, eat, drink, keep a tempo you've got, keeping him addressed of the gap, but also telling him that he's the strongest. Mathieu, you're the strongest. Mathieu, you're the strongest, you know? It's because uh, he is. And here we go, three climbs to go. The terrace hoses tell you where we are. It's the Alder Kreuzberg. The concrete soon turns to cobbles. The road will become ever more slippy. But as long as everything's OK under those tyres, we know that this man has the perfect technique. Exactly. And this is a long climb as well, so he's just going to settle into the rhythm. At no point during this race, or even when you look back at the way that, that Mathieu rides a bike, never laboured in the pedalling style. Even when he's attacking on a steep climb, he's, he, he gears, he's got high cadence. That's a, that high frequency pedalling style that he needs in cyclocross to get out of those. When he comes to a dead start, he practices those explosive efforts. I've had the privilege of being out training with the team and seeing him doing these efforts. It's re remarkable. He does a lot of these fart -like sort of efforts if he, he would just, on instinct, decide to accelerate at any given time. And, and that's what he's used to. But within that as well, there's real fluidity. So there's, an, there's a real economy at work here. Um, he's aero on a bike as well. And as I've said before, almost like I feel like I'm waxing overly lyrical. He's just a, completely at one with the machine. He's got so much power to put through the bike, but he does it with so much symmetry, so much efficiency. He just is, <laughs> you know, he's just one of the finest bike riders that, that ever graced a bicycle. He's on his way to becoming the man along some other legends who have won this more than anyone else. 28k still to go, it seems very strange to be saying that. 
Again, you always have to take it with a note of caution. But he's extended his gap on this climb so far to this group. 136 now and gaining. Hardest part to climb is on this cobbled sector here once you get past through the first terrace houses. Then when you get onto the main road again, just sort of continues to rise towards the Horton. Yeah, horrible, horrible climb. Mads Pedersen wisely just sitting at the back of this one. Still salvaged something from this race, but he's got to be really cautious about how he rides these next few climbs, stay out the wind much as he can. But you could argue with 28 k's to go and with the amount of time he spent on the front, um, you know, there's, there's not much he can do to actually replace what he's actually done. It's his legs are going to be in pain. There's fueling, Rob, and then there's like, I've just got nothing left in my legs. There's a difference. You can't just keep fueling ad infinitum. There's a cost as well in terms of damage to the muscles as well. Um, just the physical cost, rather than the fueling cost and physical cost are linked, but sometimes you're just absolutely ruined. And I think that Pedersen has borderline ruined himself, but he's a man that can suffer like no other. And if he can push through that suffering, he could salvage a podium here. This is a sensational ride from Dylan Turns. Who this time last year was struggling with problems at home, personal problems. He's really dug in, got himself back on the bike. And look, he is looking like a born-again rider there. Yep. Is Michael Matthews also looking pretty good? This is the group at 210, what we're calling the peloton. Coming past the cars here, and they are closing the gap to the group two. And interesting to see what would happen if these groups come back together. Yeah. I mean, just, I think, just getting to this stage of the race. And I think what we have to remind ourselves as well, Rob, is just, just riding this course, <laughs> just literally riding your bike 270 k's over this sort of terrain on a relatively steady training ride would. Just, I mean, firstly, it would take you seven or eight hours just to ride it at like 38, 35k an hour. But the fact they're doing this at 44, 45k's an hour, they're going to be like riding almost with like blurred vision, just like coping. It's just almost a like coping rather than strategizing. A lot of riders are just thinking about coping and getting through, thinking about scraping into a top 15, maybe even a top 10. So how organized they can get behind remains to be seen. There's not a lot of teams with multiple numbers, but I was just about to say the sharpest looking in this group, Betiol and Dylan Turns, and it's coming at a cost. Jorgensen now struggling at the back. It's paying for it, isn't he? Yep. He's been brilliant. And again, it was he who started all of the craziness. I have to look back to my notes. 112 kilometers to go when he made his first move. They were playing their cards, but as I said earlier, Van der Poel was holding the ace up his sleeve. It was really interesting. I mean, we had people were saying, yeah, the other teams are going to have to attack him. That's exactly what they did. But he had resource around him um, a couple of times when he looked like he was on the back foot. But the power, the power shift between the teams was at one point that Visma Lisa bike were in control, then it was Lidl Trek, then it went to Alpes into Kerning. It split it around. There's been no one dominant team in this race. I mean, they're the three teams that have basically made the racing today. Some other good riders in the mix, of course, but it's very interesting the way that that power has shifted from one team to the next as the race has progressed. Get your eye on that second group because it's really moving and shaking. And what was the peloton is being broken up as well. No change here. Over the top of the Horton, and Mathieu von der Poel now has just two more climbs to survive. He's on his way to the final circuit. He's motoring, isn't he? On the drops, old school style. And this is a little break. These are looking good. The this podium. Is, yeah, this this is look. These two look strong, don't they? And a sensational ride it would be from turn. Yes, we can talk about Van der Poel, but I don't think anybody really expected us to be talking about Dylan Turns for no. the podium today. No, and that's um, that's fair to say. Yeah. Dylan Turns, of course, very decorated rider, super, super classy. But a lot of his wins have almost come from nowhere, haven't it? Like flesh the other year. It's like, whoa, oh, Dylan Turns is back. But he just brings out these performances. He just steps up, steps up his game, doesn't he? Except for Marke, of course, looking after him now, former yep. rider. Had to retire last year. That's Cortina. He's been a source of pride, really, for Marvi Star. 270 kilometers were on the clock and on the menu at the start of the day, 25 of them remain. We've had 15 climbs, we've had seven extra cobbled sectors, two more cobbled climbs remain. Matcha von der Poel's at the front of the race. 
He has one minute and 43 seconds of a gap. Matcha for the pool, barring incident or accident. Today, he's going to equal the record for the maximum number of Tour of Flanders wins for the men. He's going to win in the rainbow jersey as well. Only six riders will have done that by the end of today. Van der Poel will be one. He can equal the record, but Mathieu Van der Poel can take his own record today. He's on his way to being crazily consistent. Van der Poel is likely to become the first rider to finish on the podium in five consecutive editions of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Brix Schotter recorded a podium in five consecutive starts between 1946 and 1952, but he missed two rondes in that run. Mathieu van der Poel, throughout the great 108 years of history of this event, is going to achieve something unique. He is a unique bike rider. So on the way to his own record, Van der Poel now heads back on to Ronde van Vlaanderen Straat, where he already has a couple of those stamps that are painted onto the concrete slabs. He's won it twice. He's on his way to winning it for a third time. And as I was just saying, he will be the first ever man to podium in five consecutive editions. His own little bit Some of history. Records within records, isn't Exactly. <laughs> I mean, and there's so many sequences and records today. We know that this man is a record breaker. He's a man who was sent to rip up the record books. He does everything in dramatic style. He's a born entertainer. And we've still got two more climbs to enjoy him riding away here. But again, I don't want to kill anyone's excitement or enjoyment, Matt, but let's be realistic. It's looking, it's looking like he's going to win this. <laughs> it's looking like it, unless something extraordinary happens, unless it's a, an awful twist of fate and uh, bad luck, um, or he blows. It's as simple as that. Um, because the rate he's riding at the, ro the moment is just stronger than everybody else. And unless he completely blows a gasket, everybody else are fighting for the minor placings. I say minor placings, I mean magnificent placings. A, a podium spot in the Tour of Flanders can help shape and define a career when one looks back on it, you know? And, and that's why these two are riding like they are, it's, isn't it? It's so, so significant. Yeah, and this is a proper battle. Really super. We, we often overuse the word attritional, but I tell you what today, Rob, this has been brutally hard. A former winner sat there at the back there after cramping up midweek. Hopefully that won't happen to Alberto Betil today, but this man, almost with every pedal stroke, incrementally just moving clear now. Super low on the bike, efficient, but look at that. That is just pure suplesse, just the way he's pedalling that. I mean, clearly at high speed here, running out of gears, into that aero tuck, gulping in the air, knowing he's got a 1 minute 46 cushion on the chasing group behind. And knows that in about half an hour's time, he'll most likely be making history yet again. Flying down the new Aquaramont. A new generational talent. Heading up the Alde Quadermont to equal an old record. Mathieu von der Poel is a unique bike rider. An amazing athlete. We really are running out of things to say about him. It's written, it's, when you're, again, look, looking back on the race and he's ridden this race with relative patience. He let the race almost come to him. He, he just let the race, we well, didn't let it, but the race happened in front of him today a lot more. And we knew that would happen. But with his team around him, he waited, he bided his time, and it was almost as if he didn't even really have to sort of explode the race. He just, the race just kind of, he just kind of moved past it all. It's really interesting, the evolution of the race today for Van der Poel. So lower slopes now of the Quadramont for the final time. Oof, nearly went into the crowd there. This is, you know, he's done that before. There's that worry. <laughs> we said he does everything in dramatic fashion. God, he's, keeping us, he's keeping us on our toes, that's what it is. He said, I want to give these commentators uh, a little bit of extra excitement. 20 kilometers to go. Number one on his back, number one on the road. World champion. 
And for the men, the first time since 2016 that we're going to have a world champion winning this race ever so slightly. Since then, this man's won, and he's looking like he could well be on the way back to the podium. He's really been strong again this spring. OK, he had cramp on Wednesday. He's blown up spectacularly on a couple of occasions, hasn't he, in recent races, but he's shaking away again here. Yeah. Keep an eye on him. Sometimes that can be a sign of somebody actually having an issue, but also it can be just a way of, of just relaxing the muscles a little bit as a, as a preemptive strike, just in case you feel something. Just give the muscles a bit of a shake out, especially on a descent as well. It's pretty chilly out there now. So just shaking the muscles out. Good ride riding by Cortina as well. Very good riding. Good to see Wellens up in the mix. But if you look at the, the riders at the sharp end of the race today, Riders that have been around quite a long time. A lot of experience at the front of this race today. That's Michael Matthews that's managed to come across to this group, you know. Matthews has now joined this group with Narsen. Well, keep your eye on Cortina. Only one Spaniard has ever been on the podium of the Ronde of Vlaanderen. That was Juan Antonio Flecha. Jorgensen looked like he might have been on his way there not so long ago. Faded, he's still in this group and still looking for his team's best result and he's going to be Visma Lisa Bike's best rider, it seems, on the day. Yep. Here's that famous road again. He knows it well, doesn't he? Six appearances here. And Mathieu von der Poel is going to be cheered onto the slopes of the Alde Quadamont again. This time he's alone. And once again, he looks to be riding away from the rest. Still his lead increases. Yep. It's a freshly tarmac section here. Just making sure he takes the shortest line, smoothing out the road from apex to apex. That natural attention to detail that becomes innate. That's what he's like. He's completely dialed out of the saddle again before sitting down and tackling the cobble section, which comes in about two or three hundred metres time, the steepest part of the climb. But as you said, Rob, there's another seven seconds there from 41 to 47 to 48. He is a real force of nature. Unstoppable today so far. Mathieu von der Poel about to move on to the cobbles of the Quadamonts. The Dutch fans are there to see the flying Dutchman fly up this hill. He'll have to just make sure he regulates everything, but on these cobbles, in these conditions, it's not easy to measure your speed, is it? Just to get for, just to continue forward motion at a decent pace, you've got to put a lot of power for the bike. Seriously, Rob, you've, you've got to ride hard just to get the bike going forwards. And obviously, at this stage of the race, you know, he can't back off too much, but for himself, yeah, he won't want to push himself too far into the red. He'll be feathering it as we see some pretty strange sights. You do get that in cycling, don't you? Look like Freddie Mercury on the right-hand side from the I want to break three years. Good to see Freddie back in town. Given his name and family history, Mathieu Fottepool has always been under pressure. But in his own right, he's made himself another star of some repute. Adding to his legend by winning Sanremo last year, but he's back at his favourite monument here, on his way to taking it for the third and record equaling time. Look at this. Listen to this. Fonda Paul will be victorious. He's already heralded as a hero, even before he gets to the line. Absolutely superb solo effort from Mathieu van der Poel, who has torn this race apart. Onto the flatter section. This drag continues over the top. 150 now, another couple of seconds are taken. 206. It looks like group three and group two. There's not too much between them at all. But hasn't missed a beat, is he? Hands locked onto the hoods. Hardly ever uses gloves. He says he just likes to feel everything about the bike. That's why he doesn't use gloves, even on these cobbled conditions. Absolutely flying over the top part of this climb.
all alone in front of the crowd. What a sight, what a sound. You're watching one of the greatest bike riders of his generation. One of the greatest who's ever competed in one of the sport's greatest arenas. It's taken another six seconds in about 500 metres. He's absolutely flying. He's going to... He won't be able to control the adrenaline now. That'll be coursing through his blood at the moment. And they'll also be feeling the pain. We know he's human. This is going to be hurting, but they get to a point in a bike race where you can actually feed off the pain. You enjoy the pain. It fuels you. Again, the gradient briefly kicks again towards the top part before mercifully easing back onto the main road. What a ride this has been by van der Poel. It's going to be the best part of two minutes at the top. A few more metres of metronomic matcher tapping away at that rhythm and the Quaramont will be conquered for another year. One more corner to turn, and here are the chasers. Fonapool will feel good. This is Betiol, he's with turns, 153. Behind there, just coming to vision now, and the fight for the podium is a real one. That is where the racing lies now, going into the finale, with just a part of Ber to come after this. Yep, yeah. it's fractured into various groups. Van der Poel solo, of course, Betiol with Dylan Tierns, and just about 10 seconds behind, maybe slightly more, Garcia Cortina alongside Tim Wellens, and then three, Lawrence Rex, Matteo Jorgensen and Mads Pedersen, and then only 15 or 20 seconds back to Narsen, Schoins and Matthews. So the biggest group on the road at the moment at the front of the race is a group of three or four, that's all. So it's split to pieces. But as you said before, this is a superb ride by Dylan Turns, and also another revelatory performance by the man that clearly loves. He is the Italian Flandrian. And this will cement his legend, I think, Alberto Betiol. Still got to get over, still got to fight off the threat of that group with Wellens and Garcia Cortina behind. But I'll tell you what, he's starting to suffer for the first time. Look at the face of, well, of, uh, of the Italian Betiol here. Michael Matthews up there as well. Remember, he was on the podium in the first monument of the season two, fighting away. But look at this, a turn-up for the books. When Dylan Turns first came on the scene, you were thinking about him as a man for the Ardennes Classic. Yep. Not a real Flandrien. And Narsen is in the form of the last few seasons to Sheffield's there. Wellens, who last year at this race had horrific memories. There's Morgado fighting away. And this Tarling. is Josh Tarling. <laughs> Watch out, those of you going to Hubei next week. Madwas is there, they've been in the wars. It's Cortina, it's Trentin, it's Lampard. There too, coming up behind, is Jorgensen, who's slipping and sliding, but still fighting. He's with Owain Dool now, Mars Pedersen, who we salute, and Victor Kapanarts, all of them warriors. Yeah, every single one of the riders that's going to complete the scores today is a warrior, but they've been the riders early on that uh, animated it. But the best part of two and a half hours still to go, they went on the offensive. And they're certainly paying the price now, but boy, has this been an absolutely thrilling race. You've got to find different ways, you've got to be creative, and you have to admire the bravery and the verve and the, the sheer bloody-mindedness as well of getting out in this race and just trying something different, trying something brave. It, just the adventuring spirit. But ultimately, they have nothing really to offer up in terms of defence when it comes to an absolutely marauding rainbow. 1.52 for Mathieu van der Poel. 15 kilometres to ride. The next kilometre downhill before he takes on the final climb of the race. The short, steep, and often decisive Paterberg. But the decisive hill today has been the Koppenberg. It's been like going back in time in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Here for the podium, though, the fight is on, and things could really shake up. It certainly could. So several riders in that group. The UE team member actually got four riders in that group. And one being Morgado. Yeah, Morgado. Being a young man. Yep, Pollitt. 
uh, Tim Vellens. And also in the mix there as well, it's certainly not uh, Mark Hershey, he's out the back. The crowd's weighed at the bottom. There's that usual corner that kills off all the speed. In other races, they got the gutter of this climb, but it's buried off here. This man today has not needed any of that. He's on the cobbles, he's devouring them. He's got 200 metres to ride up this hill, and then it's all the way to the finish on the flat. He's got a big gap already. And Mathieu von der Poel is looking every little bit like the top world champion he is. Bobby, Funloy, Medix, Bona, Sagan. And unless there is a big surprise, you can add von der Poel to the list of names who are going to win the men's Ronde van Vlaanderen in the rainbow jersey. Yeah, he picked his way through that little corner. He's lost, of, he's lost about seven or eight seconds, but to see that, because of the gap that he's built up, he didn't need to fly into that corner, especially in the wet conditions, regardless of his, his ability, his prowess, his skill on a bike, not taking any chances at all. And he's bought himself that time. Now, even van der Poel starting to suffer on the fearsome slopes of the Paterberg, on the lowest gear that he's got grinding out the last few metres of this horrendous climb, the last few metres now of the last climb of the Ron van Vlaanderen. Mathieu van der Poel and the rest have over 250 kilometres in the legs. This is the 17th and final hellish Hellingen. They scream and cheer. Listen to this, final corner. Around that corner, greeted by the masses and he's done for the day with the climbing here are the two chasers and now fight for the podium is on it's been seven years since a belgium one it's the longest drought ever can dylan turns at least find them a place on the podium he's with betty on now the turns just like he's getting stronger as this race goes on yeah turns looks very good as we get the drone footage uh, joining matthew van der poel in his solo escape well, even he'll be thankful this time he's not going to the Koppenberg. He will be on the hoods here. Can relax a little bit. Stray Walker just there. Again, no point in taking any risk here, but what he can do is just really pile on the power on this flat section. 143. But again, can take this little bit quite conservatively. Not real appreciation there for yeah. the speed. Even in the wet as well. A brief minute we see what he sees as these two start to see red. And behind they start to see them, Michael Matthews eyeing up another monument podium. Squinge is in the fight as well, left hand side. This is Oliver Nasser really rolling back the years. Already a monument podium finisher in San Remo. And Tim Wellens, it's nice to see him back in Flanders, this time with a better news. Betio. It's biting him, isn't it? It is. On, on one hand, Dylan Turns would like to be clear, because I think Betel might be fit, quicker in a sprint, but they could also do with each other uh, so they can relay through, because I tell you what, Michael Matthews out of this group is the way the faster finisher, but right now he's got the quickest legs as well. But look at Narsen looking super, super strong today for Belgium. Oliver Narsen, what a finisher. And that's a sensational ride, by the way, for the man from Arkea. It is. Pollitt as well looking good on the climb here. Next group on the road, led by Kampenaitz, still fighting his person. What a warrior. Madwas, Trentin. And they're going to know they've been in a bike race today. There's nothing like Flanders Finest. Flanders Finest, though, can serve up your worst days on a bike. Here we go. This is Oliver Narsen. Got a bird's eye view, almost quite literally a bird's eye view of a Narsen plummeting down the descent. As you can look, they're just going, uh, descending a little bit quicker than Van der Poel. He had the uh, the luxury or the relative luxury in these sorts of conditions of having to take it. He could take it a little bit easy, and now he's well onto the flat now. One minute and 45 seconds. That's going to play equate to about nearly one and a half kilometres at these sorts of speeds and distance. It's 11 k's to go. And a lot of people watching on, you know, you and I are talking as if this is a done deal, but we must remember, 
this is still competitive sport. Anything can happen. Has he eaten? Has he fueled? Mechanical issues. What's his mindset here? That the, surely there's no sort of letting up and even even thinking he's done it yet. Yeah, I think even with 10k to go now and all the climbs done, even if uh, we're not uh, trying to look and see, the wind has actually dropped ever so slightly. I don't think there's too much wind, but we do think it might be an ever such a slight tailwind to the finish. It's just about um, getting the information from the team car. Um, and they'll be basically telling him he's got this in the bag. But, but again, um, even with a puncture at this point, um, that's going to take 30 seconds to change. He should be well, he should have enough in hand. So it's just about almost like enjoying the moment now. But he'll be carried adrenaline now. He's, he's making history. He's going to win for the first time the Tour of Flanders in the Rainbow Bands. That hasn't been done since 2016 uh, when Peter Sagan won it. Um, he got used to winning, but he's making history as well. And that'll be what's played on in, the, in his mind. That's, be, that's what his director sportif will be telling him. Um, and they'll be getting pretty emotional in the team car as well. No, Ru the Rodolf brothers aren't the most emotional of characters uh, there, but this will mean a lot to them. They're used to success, but just the manner of this victory, massively important. But yeah, just to keep him in, he'll be just pressing on now and just fueled by the, by the sheer joy of what's unfolding as well. Less than 10 k's to go for Fonderpool. Matt Stevens, me, Rob Hatch, sat at the finish line. The cars that have been following the race start to arrive in Aldenarda. The chase for the podium will not stop until they see that finish line. And UA Emirates are chasing it. They are chasing it mightily, aggressively. They've got the gap down now to less than 10 seconds to Turns and Betiol. This here is Mathieu van der Poel. Yep, he's lost a little bit of time, but only about four or five seconds. Most of that would have been lost in the corners where he's just backed off, not taking any risks at all. But even on these long straight stretches of road with 1.45, he's completely out of sight. And these two, he, they want, he wants to know the time gap. Uh, what's the gap behind? I mean, this is a podium top. This is a big, big deal. And, the, the, this and there's accelerations behind yeah. that. This is interesting because we saw them working together a minute ago, but now it's breaking up. This, I guess, could favour the group of two in front if they keep attacking each other. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's still the group. They've got Betiel turns, and then you've got Narsen, Sheffield and Matthews. And then that other group just behind them. Um, there's going to be a lot of momentum, a lot of riders finding something else. The final phase of the race and that final podium spot definitely up for grabs. I think that, that was a nervous look from Dylan Turns. What's the time gap? What's the time gap? There'd been a little chat before then between him and Betiol. I'd imagine that be, would be, look, look. Let's have the podium. Let, let's just get, like, almost as if, like, you'd think that Betiol would beat Dylan Turns in a sprint finish, but let's just fight it out in the last 250 metres. Right, no, don't sit on. Let's continue to relay here because this is a big, big result. Over the River Skelder. Just less than eight kilometres to go for Fodder Pool. Keep your eyes on these groups, they're all over the road here. Just seconds between them. One seven three there on the chase. For it's Bjerg three. still there, plus me. Yeah, wow. Oof. What a reward that would be for hard work if he could be up there. Four rides, Mikel Bjerg, Morgado, Pollitt, and Velens. One seven seven, by the way, just to point you out who they are, at the back here is Pollitt. 173 there is Biel, 171 is Wellens, and 176 is the young Portuguese 20 year old in his debut season, Antonio Mugado. Yeah, in it, terms of numbers, they've turned out to be the team of the race, haven't they? And all that attacking has played into the hands of the two in front. 12 seconds of a gap. Yeah, it's going to be very tight, isn't it? And all, again, the last kilometre. It's just, well, the last kilometre, you can see the finish line. It's just, a, it's literally like a runway. Tish Panut starting to suffer now, laboured out of that corner as Pollitt jumps across to that little group with the, with relative ease. Let's not forget the mud side. Oh, he's got a flat, has he got a flat? No, he hasn't. No, uh, it's not soft. looking good, it's not looking great. I think that, that, is, that is slightly softening, so yeah. that's going to be um, an extra. Well, it's going to be, even if it's not flat, it's just going to be harder to drag that soft back wheel. That's unfortunate for Dish Benut. And it just shows you what can happen. Exactly. There's a minute and a half here for Fonderpool. 
who's still looking good, still looking as comfortable as you can look in this situation with six and a half kilometres to tie the record for the most victories. And even if he was a man at the end of his tether, he can actually afford to just... He doesn't need to go full gas. He can ride just sub-max. He just needs to win this bike race. Even by 30 seconds, that's absolutely fine. He wants to make sure of it and almost make sure that he keeps enough of a gap so he can factor in the worst happening, which would be a puncture or a mechanical at this point, because the road isn't technical enough to, for anything else to happen. So he's got enough time, still around about a kilometre just over in front of the two riders behind, and they've got a slender lead of around 12 seconds according to that time check. And if we look behind, there they are in plain sight, that little group with Michael Matthews. And from this group of riders here, clearly UE Team Emirates had the numerical advantage, but in terms of sheer pace, it's going to be Michael Matthews, I would imagine, or even Mozzato. That would be a turn-up right. for the book if the Italian were to get on the podium. He's one of the quickest in this group. He is, yeah. He is in dreamland here, and Arkea, pretty poor start of the season. He is really pulling them along. So, group three then here. Oh, and danger splitting into two groups, but it's splitting and coming back. The two riders up the front, taking advantage of that. They've got the gap from themselves to find a pull down to 124, but they can't get excited enough to get anywhere near to closing that. And here oh, is the bike change for Bernard. So unfortunate. It just has not gone right at all. Oh, my all. God, it's got Van Baal's bike. Nothing has gone right for Visma Lisa bike. It's, it's taken the to wrong talk. bike. They've taken the wrong bike off the roof of the car. It's Van Baal's bike. I saw it straight away. I mean, ah, no wonder he's angry here. And that is poor from a team that prepares everything to the nth degree, that sends builders up to build kitchens at the top of a volcano. They what can't give the right bike to their man. Oh, that's a shocker. That is just panic stations. Panic stations. Very unfortunate, very unfortunate. Five kilometres for Mathieu van der Poel, who's just reaching for that little bit of food to finish the job. Just wants another gel again. It's still seven minutes of effort. He might actually be on the... Just, I mean, it's going to be... Everybody now, Rob's running on fumes. They're right. If it was a fuel gauge, it would be in the red and it would be, the light would be blinking. So anything that they can get down the neck, maybe even a little bit of a caffeine gel just to give you that spike, just to make sure. I mean, look at the face here of these two. Alberto Betiol labouring on the front. Dylan turns just behind him. He'll relay. They're definitely going to work together to combine forces, but the bunch are coming up, or the remnant, sorry, the next group on the road, certainly not a peloton, but my worry for the two riders in pursuit of Mathieu van der Poel, vying for that final spot in the podium, is the strength in numbers of UAE Team Emirates, who can afford to sacrifice somebody in order to get a podium spot. Now oh, we are on for a fast Tour of Flanders. Yeah. I'll tell you that this is going to be a finish around about the fastest time schedule predicted by the organisers at 44 kilometres per hour. Yeah, very quick, isn't it? 119 turns to 118, and Father Paul's gap continues to disappear, but it's not disappearing fast enough, as we said, for things to change. The kilometres are ticking nicely by for him for now. Behind, the other two are looking good at holding. Yeah, they've actually extended their lead ever so slightly. It was down to 12 seconds. It's now back up to about 14, 15 seconds. Now oh, it's back down to 11 again now, so it's fluctuating. They cannot afford to give up. They need to hit the shortest line round this bend. Betiel on the inside in the black of EF Education, easy post. Dylan Tjerns of Israel Premier Tech latches onto the wheel of the former winner. Well, this is going to be a nail-biter. This is going to go down to the final. Kate, okay, this could be agonisingly close for the final podium spots. But again, they extend it to 15 seconds. Three and a half kilometres to go for Fonda Paul. These two guys on their way to that four kilometre to go sign. And, well, it's a, a retro jersey today for EF Education Easy Post and a retro-looking addition with the filthy weather, the slipping and walking on the Koppenberg and a real digging deep performance from everybody involved who's going to finish this race. I tell you what, that Morgado, you were talking about him earlier on, 20 years of age, by far the youngest rider in this, uh, this league group. Now, Magnus Sheffield is pretty young, but uh, Morgado has impressed. Three Ks to go now as he continues on. Shoulders rocking, but still looks strong, doesn't he? Although he's conceded a little bit of time, he won't be overly worried about that. He doesn't need to. He needs just to ride within himself. Looks composed. He has all day, really. Even when under pressure, he's always looked in control, isn't he? 
Well, whether he wins or not, as we said earlier on, only his debut was off the podium in fourth. He's been Some first, run. second, <laughs> first, second, and it's going to alternate again. He's going to be first for the third time, which will equal the record. A reminder of the riders that he is about to reach. He's going to be right up there. Of course, Cancellara, Bone, Magni, Boys, Museo, all going to be joined by Mathieu van der Poel. Incredible. Slices the road again, taking that short line again from apex to apex. Apex, meanwhile behind, still a slender 11 seconds. Dylan Tierns driving hard on the front, taking a little bit of respite, tucked in the wheel. A man that knows what it's like, uh, well, what it's like to taste victory in the Ronda, but three Ks to go for the chase behind. They can uh, almost reach out and touch them here. Mozarto, Nelson, Sheffield, Scoins, Matthews, Wellens, Björg, Morgado and Pollitt. <sighs> One and a half kilometers for Mathieu Fodderpool as we look at the fight for the podium. At the finish line, where we sit right now, there are hordes of people as the motorbikes from the race start to race past. Many braving the rain and the elements because they're about to salute a special man. He rides on with the objective in sight and soon he'll go through the Flam Rouge. They're stood under umbrellas, they wave flags. They all want to witness history. This is the running. Aldenarde is up ahead. And Mathieu van der Poel is going under the Flam Rouge. It has been quite the performance. 29 years of age, the world champion. Rainbow jersey on his back. He's left us speechless throughout his career, and today, yet again, a look behind, and he won't see anybody else on the road. Mathieu von der Poel with one of the longest solos we've seen in recent years. Today is going to be sequence changing, record setting. It's going to be special. Who else is it going to be but Mathieu van der Poel? He'll take his time and enjoy it now. As many wins as anybody else in the history of this great race. Mathieu van der Poel at the peak of his powers is going to win the Ronde van Vlaanderen in the rainbow jersey. He's just the sixth man to do so. He now shares the record for the most wins. An acknowledgement of what he's just done. Yet another special performance. It's now three for Mathieu von der Poel on his way to becoming a monument among monument winners. It's von der Poel on the line. Von der Poel in a world class of his own. The Dutchman with a strong Belgian triple to win the Ronde van Vlaanderen for the third time in his career. As a world champion, he's now with Bobby, Van Looy, Merckx, Bona and Sagan. And on just his sixth appearance in this special of races and days. He equals the record for the number of wins. Bois, Magni, Lehmann, Museo, Bona and Cancellara. Behind, here's the fight for the podium. Michael Matthews is trying to chase them down. The Flemish flags fly, though, as it's the Fleming who tries to get there. Oh, but Dylan Turns looks like he might have his heart broken. He's trying to hang on. Matthews is there. Pollard's trying to come around him. There's Mozzato as well. It's Matthews all the way to the line. And look at that from Luca Mozzato. That is an exceptional performance and the surprise of the day from the Italian.
all of them warriors. In these conditions, every one of them a Flandrien. We have witnessed a tour of Flanders for the ages, Matt Stevens. What? What a race. What a ride by Matthew van der Poel. He is quite clearly gone so so deep there that's an emotional an emotional performance as well he's absolutely spent every single one of the riders in this field he's an absolute hero today but that was something special the race opened up so so early but he raced with real poise real patience and with ridiculous strength and this is the sprint for the places below feel for Tish Bonot, who had been in the group in front before a mechanical dropped him, but he's going to do his best to try and squeeze up there. By the way, that is a sixth place as well for Antonio Morgado on debut at 20 years of age. Do not forget that. Luca Mozzato's on the podium. <laughs> that's a big... That's got to be, well, one of the races of, of, uh, of the existence of the Arkea team, to be perfectly honest with you. They're going to be very happy with that. Victor Carbonat, as always, will fight for every single place. He'll be fighting with Mars Pitherson, who was one of the great makers of this race. He fights to the last, injured, battered, bruised, but showing his own powers. Beaten in the sprint there for the minor places, but he still races to the death. Pitherson, we salute you. But at the end of the day, the winner will be saluted by the million strong supporters on the side of the road in Flanders. The winner will be Mathieu van der Poel. Four races this year, a 50% win rate, E3, and now Flanders for the first, for the, the third time, should I say. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely amazing riding. Superb ride here as well. That looks like it's Owen Duhl. Owen Duhl and Hargadus. Yep. Well played, Michael Matthews. He was right up there. This is uh, Max Waldscheid who gets the hug. And there is the winner. Wow, he had to work hard for that. Matteo Jorgensen just crossing the line has really, really faded in the, the final part of that race, un un unsurprisingly. Well, here is Mathieu von der Poel speaking to Renat Scotter. Mathieu van der Poel, gefeliciteerd. Drie keer de Ronde van Vlaanderen winnen. En de manier waarop je de koppen werkt, wat maakt het allemaal three times de Ronde van, van Vlaanderen. improviseren. Oh. Was it an improvised move? Het was move? gewoon uh, overleven vandaag. Ah, voor mij it was just surviving today. De zwaarste ronde die ik tot nu toe gereden heb met uh, weersomstandigheden. En, uh, That's the hardest tour of Vlaanderen ever rode. Right. Uh, oh, die laatste 20 kilometer op zich. Met the last 20 k's. Wat een zalige slotkilometer. They were good, but I was so happy was on my own. Te denken over van alles en nog wat nemen kan. Ja, maar ik zat zo kapot. You had time to think about a lot of things, no? Niet heel veel heb nagedacht. I couldn't think. Wedstrijd. I was just so tired. I was an actor. En en ja, vertel eens wat 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 ja, hoe zou je het samenvatten allemaal? How would you recap it? Nou, ik snap denk ik wat er allemaal gebeurd is, maar. I need to think. I can't really take in what happened yet. Die kassaklim is wel lastig. Oh, the, the cobbles was, was, was so hard. Ja, uh, yeah, schuiven en uh, yeah. slippen tot tot boven. It was just slipping and sliding everywhere. Um, ja, boven had ik uh, een mooie een mooie kloof gelijk, maar aan met de On the top, I saw I had quite an advantage. Nemen. Ik heb uh, gereden waar ik kon. Uh, moet zeggen op plaats was uh, het vat echt wel af. Geglibber op de Koppenberg. Wist je the end, dat, dat so de situatie tired. was? Want uh, daarachter, uh, achter What about jou, zijn ze de voet naar boven moeten gaan. Daarachter. Ja, dat verbaast me niet. Het was echt uh, heel moeilijk om daar uh, well, een goede trek te vinden. The rest, the rest of them had to walk on the foot at the end of the quadrum of the, 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 the Koppenberg. That didn't surprise me. Op een moment heb ik gezegd, uh, om vooral tot de Koppenberg te gaan. Op een I just thought, well, go, go, go. Go full. Ik had eigenlijk niet verwacht om daar alleen te komen zitten. I didn't expect to be there on my own. And then on the uh, second time on the Quarmont is when I decided to go for. I didn't have any more, but I was lucky enough to find Mathieu van der Poel, was this the way you wanted to write history today with a third victory after a solo slim in the final? Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my season is already a success now. 
winning Tour of Flanders in World Champion jerseys. Uh, it's a dream come true and uh, uh, I just uh, need a few moments to let it sink in. Thinking about the triple now, you've won E3, you win the Ronde, maybe Roubaix is next? I, I cannot think about Roubaix yet. I'm uh, really, really fucked at the moment. It was uh, one of the hardest races I've, I've ever done. With the weather circumstances, I was I was really completely empty the last 10k to the finish line. Uh, I was just uh, I closed my eyes and uh, just <laughs> tried to get there as soon as possible. Congratulations, you're a co-record holder now in the Tour of Flanders. Enjoy and have a good recovery, Matthew van der Poel. Thank you. Dedication is what you need. He is a record equaler. You know already that questions will start to see if he will be the record breaker next year. The Ronde van Vlaanders, the toughest Tour of Flanders that Mathieu van der Poel has ever won. It's his third win. He beats Luca Mozzato, second, ahead of Michael Matthews. That's Niels Pollitt, Mikko Biel, Antonio Morgado, with Sheffield, Naasen, Turns and Betiol all in a top ten that all deserve their own recognition for quite the story they've written today. Yeah, what a ride by a standout amongst that lot, definitely Luca Mozzato. It's looking through the Italians' results this season. He's been very consistent. You know, top 20 in Gate World again, Duardo was laundering just outside the top 20 in E3, 10th in Classic Brews de Pana, a win at the, the Cockside Classic. It's still a surprising result, um, but one that clearly is, is coming. I mean, this is the, the final moments of Mathieu van der Poel's win. I mean, uh, when I said that he was feathering things, I think he was absolutely exhausted. He was losing time, I think, Rob, because he, he was just tired. I mean, ap and he said it, it was the hardest tour of Flanders he, he ever, he's ever ridden. And it certainly looked like it as well. It looked ridiculously difficult. And again, look at that, real flair. <laughs> look at that, the world champion lifts his bike aloft. Whew. History maker. Not a bad four days of racing, eh? He helped his mate to win in San Remo. He won in Adelbeke. Was beaten by the better rider on the day. Only into second place, mind you, in Wevelkamp. And he's just equaled the record for the most wins in the Tour of Flanders. Matcha for the pool, ladies and gentlemen. I'm surprised he had the strength to lift up the bike. There really is nobody quite like Fodder Paul. Well, proud partner looks on as he does the business. That will mean a lot. Yeah, it certainly will. It's quite emotional, wasn't it? All the pressure was on him today. Everybody was looking his way. He turned up, he performed. And Mathieu van der Poel is the winner of the Ronde van Vlaanderen for the third time. He's absolutely wasted, isn't he? There's the moment again, greeted by his partner, as you were saying. What style, what strength. And also, the critical moment wasn't just the fact he was stronger, he just could handle his bike in, in the most difficult of terrain. It, the Koppenberg was the turning point of this year's race, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I think had it been dry, there might have been another group, but it always looked as if he was the stronger. But it was that combination as we look at the finish again. This, I'm wondering whether there might be a little bit of an inquiry here, I don't know. Mozzato beating Matthews to second. Half a wheel. Pollitt was there, and then the UAE, well, they, they tried to, to lead out, and then they all came over one by one together. Yeah, it's just quite a ragged sprint, wasn't it? Mm. Matthews went from one side of the road to the other. Again, I think he was always moving quicker than Pollitt. There was no remonstration from Pollitt there at all. But, uh, well, just a throw of the bike. But Matthews, yep. Yeah. Back-to-back -back monument podiums for the Australian. Disappointment for Dylan Turns and Alberto Betiol, caught with about 50 metres to go. But uh, Michael Matthews, I tell you what, he's going to be happy with that. They had two men in the move earlier on. So Jaco Alula, another one of the teams of the race for me. He's absolutely spent there, isn't he? But Michael Matthews, a mature rider now. Again, 33 years of age, and clearly no sign of stopping just yet. 
Oh, no. There has been a change in the result, and Michael Matthews seems to have been taken away, declassified. An update. Mathieu Fondepol wins, Luca Mozzato second, and Niels Pollitt finishes on the podium with that declassification. Yeah, I didn't want to... Big fan of Michael Matthews, but I just thought they're not going to ignore that. That deviation right the whole width of the finishing straight. You moved across um, and then shut the door a little bit on Nils Pollitt behind. Well, third place taken by Niels Pollitt, just behind there. Michael Matthews, third on the line. However, declassified. Mozzato second, Pollitt third at the end of the Ronde van Vlaanderen. Yeah, big shame there for Michael Matthews. But again, what riding by UET members have four in that front group. Great riding too by Magnus Sheffield. The American rider, but uh, Matthew van der Poel, absolutely unstoppable. Six hours, five minutes and 17 seconds in the saddle today. But a career best ride for Luca Mozzato as well. And a celebratory day for the Arkea b, &B Hotels team. And they'll be pretty happy that they've got Mozzato for another year on the contract as well, through to the end of 2025. A victory for Matthew van der Poel. Second place to Luca Mozzato and third to Niels Pollitt after Michael Matthews was relegated for an irregular sprinting move. The world champion wins in the men's Ronde van Vlaanderen in the rainbow jersey for just the sixth time in history. And Matthew van der Poel, as well as joining that elite club, is now the coal holder of the record for the most wins in Flanders' finest. And on the day after a tough day, he is the finest. Perhaps one of the best who ever rode a bike. I think I would uh, echo that sentiment, Rob. Sweet as well in the world champions jersey too. As he was uh, saying, I think it's going to take a little while for that to soak in. And Paul Roubaix, although it's only seven days away, right now will be uh, the least, um, well, the least thing from his thoughts. I think. Jani Vermeer as well played his part. Uh, we remember Briggs Cotter. In the future, just like that man, they will remember Mathieu van der Poel. It's a filthy day in the Flemish are then. Everybody across the line, well, they have suffered today. And the women still have 45 k's to go in the women's race. That's quite a quick decision there by the commissaires in relation to mm. Niels Pollitt. But I say, um, they Definitely seemed to be a deviation there, but um, that sport, and quite often in a chaotic sprint like that, well, not, it wasn't exactly a chaotic. Sometimes in a sprint where you're so, so tired, you don't think about what you're doing as much. I don't necessarily think at all, actually, there was any real malice. It's just, I just think, I don't think Michael Matthews was maybe thinking straight a little bit, almost in desperation, was clearly sprinting quickly. But again, very unfortunate, I do feel for him. But it looks like that result, unless it's been appealed. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just wondering standing. why we keep these seeing yeah, these replays exactly. and not hearing the interview. So yeah, exactly. We will see. 
again, it's difficult to judge, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, certainly given how tired everybody is. Yeah. On one hand, you can say rules are rules. On the other, there may well be circumstances. And, well, given the conditions and what we've seen this afternoon, there will yeah. be circumstances to support the other view as well. Yeah. Sleep well tonight, isn't Oh, it's the biggest winning margin since 2013, for over a decade. It's a dominant display, wasn't it? The Koppenberg only went clear. That was with 44.6 Ks to go. Looked for a while as if Matteo Jorgensen might have something held him at about nine or 10 seconds, but once he opened up that gap, to 20, 30 seconds. He almost sensed that the job was done. And they were fighting for the minor placings behind. And the two of the big protagonists, two of the other pre-race favourites. Let's go back to the interview microphones and get some more reaction. Luca Monzato, congratulations. After winning Breda in the Coxeter the Classic, you're runner-up of the Tour of Flanders. Did you expect that this morning? No, honestly, for me, for me, already a good result uh, could be like uh, a top 20, even top 15. I could dream, maybe a top 10, but uh, beyond the podium for me is uh, just crazy. At the end, uh, I think uh, I got maybe the best day of, uh, of my life uh, as a feeling on the bike, and uh, I was also quite lucky because. Uh, uh, especially in the first environment, I was not uh, in, in a super position inside the peloton. And uh, then I, I had to gamble and uh, to hope uh, someone else do the work for uh, close uh, all the gap that uh, I got in front of me. But uh, then I was lucky and uh, probably this bet uh, pay, pay off uh, in the final 30-40k uh, because actually at that moment uh, I felt quite, uh, quite well. But uh, that's it. <laughs> Sometimes uh, you had to be lucky, and uh, I'm super happy to do this. You managed even to beat Michael Matthews in that sprint. Matthews got disqualified. What do you think uh, about that? No, but to me, it didn't uh, look that bad. Uh, in my opinion, was a sprinter, and uh, I didn't know he was uh, he was disqualified, but. Uh, yeah, sometimes uh, you, you change the direction, but I didn't got the feeling that uh, was that bad. Complimenti, lei può fare anche un Parigi Roubaix bene. Can you do a good Paris Roubaix? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, in italiano. Ah, in italiano. <laughs> sì, sicuramente. Yeah, of course. Proverò a far bene. I can try. Il risultato di oggi non cambia niente. But I mean, the result today doesn't really change. Non cambia il tipo di corridore. The type of rider that I am. But for Roubaix, of course, you try and do a good race. We'll try and be at the front. Of course, there's some fantastic riders who will attack. It'll be difficult to follow them, but we'll try and do better. Second at the Flanders, what does it mean for you? Solamente incredibile. Oh, actually, incredible. Oltre ogni più rosa aspettativa. Better than any expectation I ever had. Well, a delighted Luca Mozzato. This was the sprint for second place and third. Luca Mozzato won the sprint. Michael Matthews third, but then relegated. So Niels Pollitt is third in the Ronde van Vlaanderen. The winner's Mathieu van der Poel. Second place to Mozzato with the result of a lifetime. And after a relegation of Michael Matthews, it's Niels Pollitt who finishes third in the Ronde van Vlaanderen.
here. Although he's, he's closing in and moving in a little bit there, there's clearly enough, well, just, hmm. There's a little bit of closing in there, but he's moving a lot quicker than Pollitt. It was the deviation earlier on where Pollitt had to change his line because the wheel was overlapping that I think is the big problem. I think it was the first part of the sprint, not the final part. And it was because it was Mozarta that came actually very late and wasn't involved or didn't really see or experience that big deviation. But I think if there's a bit of a debrief and a forensic analysis, it'll be the initial movement in the sprint where he pretty much moved half the distance of the width of the road. That, would, that was the problem, almost putting Pollitt uh, more near to the barriers anyway, from what, from what I could see. It's raining cats and dogs in Aldenarda. Normally by now these streets are absolutely packed. It looks as though the shelter in the bars is the best place to be. Flemish Arden wet through. Winner at the end of the day, Mathieu van der Poel, after what he described as the hardest tour of Flanders he's ever ridden. Let's go back and see how the race went today with the highlights. What a crazy run of Vlander. Eight riders away after 45 k's of trying to fight to get there. Got to the Quartermont, first time up, and there already moves a little further on. It was just on the second and third hills of the day, over 100 kilometers to go, when Matteo Jorgensen surprised everybody and started to put the pressure on the world champ. Then it was Mars Pearson's turn. And Father Paul knew he had to react. And Philippe would have a dig. They were all coming out to play. Tish Benot was up the road, and for a while, Visma Lisabai had played their cards right. On the Baird and Dries, things began to change. Mathieu Van der Poel showed he had the legs. The first serious acceleration he'd made all day and he got across the group very easily indeed. Then it was Mars Peterson time, again. Injured, battered, bruised, Peterson away with Vermeers as an anchor. They were then caught second time at the Quartermont, and Van der Poel was showing that he was in it to win it. Alone for a brief while at the top. That would break the race, smash the resistance of many. But then small groups would form at the front. Ivan Garcia Cortina took advantage going into the final 50 kilometers. He'd steal a march heading to the Koppenberg. Well, his challenge would then fade, slipping and sliding away as Farner Paul showed the perfect cross skills to power away from everybody. Second best there was Jorgensen, but he too would soon fade. There was a gap that was just over 10 seconds for a while. Over the Stationsberg, more quality was applied. And Van der Poel would have the biggest of gaps. Almost two minutes at one stage. He pulled it home to take the biggest winning margin at the Ronde van Vlaanderen since 2013. Behind him, Dylan Turns and Alberto Betiol have been fighting. But they'd be caught. Van der Poel, in the meantime, he would join the record holders club. Three wins in the Tour of Flanders. And in the final sprint, Luca Mozzato winning it for second place. Matthews then relegated, so Nils Pollitt taking third place as Mathieu van der Poel became just the sixth man ever to win the Ronde van Vlaanderen in the rainbow jersey. He called it the hardest tour of Flanders he'd ever ridden. And his team boss was along to congratulate him. Tour of Flanders finished with Mathieu Fonopol winning, equaling the record and winning 
in the rainbow jersey. Luca Mozzato was second with the result of his career. And after a relegation for Michael Matthews, Nils Pollitt finished third. That means that Biel was fourth, Morgado fifth on debut, Sheffield sixth with Narsen in seventh place. It has been quite the day at the Rana van Vlaanderen, the 108th race, so special. From Matt Stephen to me, Rob Hatch, thanks for joining us today. Wherever you've watched around the world, we will see you soon. From Flanders, after an epic day and with a record equaled, it's goodbye. <laughs>